So story time. When I first started getting uh, started with coding, I was one of those people who thought that JavaScript, well, in order to know JavaScript, you need to learn Java. And this was back in the day where I was learning from an O'Reilly book. I picked up like an HTML book that my data kind of left around. And then so when I saw the JavaScript, I was like, I picked up the Java book instead. And then I got really confused. And then I gave up. And I was discouraged for many, many years. But then when I started getting back into it, then I started learning, oh, OK, so it's different. And I started working with jQuery. And then at around this time, frameworks were starting to become really big. So of course, Angular at this point had really started to uh, get really popular at that point. And then React came on the scene. And so at this point, I'm thinking, OK, how am I going to get my skills up to date? And so I had kind of worked with all of these. And React was the one I'd really been pushing for at one of my old jobs when I really first started getting hands-on experience with frameworks. Because after all, this was at least, as far as the statistics show, the most popular one. And it gave me a lot of opportunity to practice JavaScript, so why not? But what's interesting is that at this company, even though I was pushing for React, I had my team going, well, there's this new kid on the block called Vue. And this is around the time Vue 2 had come out. That we should really check this out. It's supposed to be basically just as performant as React. And it has an, a more approachable way of building apps. And for me, I was like, I want to learn the most popular thing, right? the most cutting edge. So I was incredibly resistant to it. And so part of the reason I tell this story is because I want you to know that this is where I came from, as far as like experience working with all these different frameworks. And then from this context of switching from React, Angular, into the Vue ecosystem. And yeah, so we'll go from here. OK, so just to make sure we clarify the simple definition of what Vue is, I think the simplest way to think about it is it's a JavaScript framework for building web user interfaces. That's basically what it is. It can certainly be used to power other things. You know, Now that we have frameworks that can help you build mobile apps, you can, you can certainly use it underlying. But primarily, it's used to build web interfaces. Now, of course, the big question here is why Vue.js? Why would people consider using Vue? The first thing is that it's designed to be approachable. And what does that mean when we talk about approachable? And so this is taken from the docs in that Vue builds on top of standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with intuitive API and world-class documentation. For those coming from the React world, one of the things you'll know is that because one thing React does is it goes all in on your ability to know JavaScript, right? You have to be able to write basically everything in it, and things have sort of gotten improved since then, but especially in the beginning, you were sort of kept to the conventions of JavaScript when like, you were writing JSX. So you're writing HTML in your JavaScript. So you had to do things like class name instead of just class, because those are like reserved words. And you found yourself basically contorting the entire website into the, what, what made sense in JavaScript. And Vue's approach was that why not take what people already know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and let's just like, basically build on top of that instead. And so as a result, you get a different learning curve. Because I know that when I started with React, I felt like the amount of JavaScript I needed to really get productive was super high um, in terms of like knowing a lot of either functional programming or a lot of the methods in order to like loop between elements. Like there was a lot going on as far as what's happening in React. So there's a decent onboarding curve. But with Vue, I found that within the first couple hours, I was able to get not only onboarded, but I've taught people who have been out of practice for coding for a long time, and they got up and running real quick. And so we'll get to, I'll show you exactly how that goes, and we'll get to experience that yourselves. So this is one of the things to consider when it comes to Vue. Uh, performance is always a big thing, especially with frameworks these days. Um, the big disclaimer I always want to add at first is that vanilla JavaScript and browser APIs have come a long way. And so if you haven't had a chance to check out some of, I think Mark has a post on redo, redoing to do MVC in vanilla JavaScript. And so you, know, you might not need a framework. And I, I say that as a, you know, a core team member. Um, but that said, Vue is designed from the ground up to be a reactive compiler optimized rendering system that rarely requires manual optimization. And so when we come to performance, especially the larger your apps get, a lot of times people are very curious about how we can basically prevent ourselves from creating bottlenecks in our performance because we don't understand maybe some of the core primitives about JavaScript. And that's what frameworks allow for us, right? They abstract some of that performance away. So they say, we'll take care of that. You just write your business logic, and we'll go from there. And so you'll, you might have noticed, too, I'm not putting any sort of charts or numbers as far as sizes go at this moment, because one of the things that Vue and I think a lot of the frameworks are doing right now is that they're always trying to find ways to continue to be smaller. right? And they're learning from each other as we go. So when you're deciding whether or not Vue is like the performant framework for you, 
especially if you're going to like migrate an enterprise level app, you're probably going to want to do some benchmarks of your own because there are going to be different contexts to why you might be making a decision because different bottlenecks exist within different contexts. Okay, the other thing is that Vue is versatile. So what does that mean? So via the docs, it's a rich, incremental, adoptable ecosystem that scales between a library and a full-featured framework. And so for anyone who's gotten into the discussion, usually developers get very heated about the library versus framework argument, right? And that was a big thing for React, too, is React the library. When, when is it a framework? Um, basically, for Vue, what I would tell you is that it can be used basically as a CDN, basically as a drop-in library to your page, which we'll play around with just in a little bit, or it can be blown up to a fully like framework project that you're, you're used to expect or you're ex you've come to get familiar with when it comes to front-end applications. And so that's basically the difference, I would say, between the two, is that one usually requires build tools, the other one does not. And so Vue is really good at doing that. The other thing that drew me to Vue, especially the more I learned about it, is that it is community first. Something that I think is often overlooked when it comes to Vue is that currently it's just basically within the big three of the frameworks, right? We have React, Vue, Angular. And if we think about it, React has Facebook backing it. We have Google backing Angular. Yet Vue is a community-based open source project that's managed to climb to the popularity that it has now. And I think that speaks a lot to the conventions and APIs that were designed when Vue was built and to, as far as its approachability. I know people like to jump on the bandwagon as far as like what big tech companies are doing, but then the fact that Vue is able to do this while basically learning from different frameworks and basically helping to do what's best for the community, I think that's always been a really attractive selling point of Vue is because you know that it's not it's driven by doing what's best for the community rather than what's best for the corporation. And that I've see, it, we've seen trends of that over the community at times, but that's one of the things I really like about it. The other thing about Vue is that it actually, most of the core team is actually made up of volunteers across the world. So I think we have somewhat like 26 different countries of volunteers basically helping to maintain and build the project. And that provides for a kind of international perspective on what's happening in the world as far as like different kind of apps. And so especially when people talk about numbers and like popularity, a lot of things like NPM tend to take statistics from like sort of the Western hemisphere of the world, but a lot of things in Asia might not be included in that. And we do know that like Vue is heavily used in Asia. And so it's really cool to see the different kind of perspectives that come with that. And so with that, we get a really sort of international mindset when it comes to building Vue. Okay. Um, of course, that said, people, when they think about Vue, because it's not backed by Google, it's not backed by Facebook, uh, they want to know that it's enterprise proven. And granted, now that it's Vue 3, we've seen a lot of different apps. So I want to just show a couple for those who might not be familiar with this. But um, Apple actually used Vue to build their uh, introduction to Swift UI. Um, and so the way you know this, by the way, is if you install Vue DevTools, which I'll show you all how to do later, you'll notice in the upper right here, it'll actually detect when Vue is being used and basically flash green. Otherwise, or by flash screen, I mean it'll, be, it'll have that uh, enabled state. Otherwise, it would be grayed out. And so here's another page. Um, here's the Google Careers page where they're also using Vue. And then some of you might have started using Zoom in the pandemic. And so, yep, Zoom also uses Vue. Uh, as far as e-commerce goes, we have REI. So for all the outdoor people out there, when you're using the e-commerce, Vue is powering that. Uh, L'Oreal pa Paris as well. We've had the team actually speak at some of the conferences before. Really fascinating to learn about the different things they're doing when it comes to makeup. So some of the things they were doing were like interactive, uh, basically like imagery where you could change the lipstick and then it would change the image color of like the model and stuff like that. They were doing some really cool stuff as far as reactivity and that kind of thing. And then here's a fun one, Nintendo. Nintendo is powered by Vue as well. So if you're ever logging in, playing around with that, uh, they are also using Vue. And if you didn't know, MediaWiki, which is like the big organization behind like Wikipedia as well as some other properties, they actually did a really long investigation into deciding which framework they would adopt going forward for their basically migration. And basically, they landed on Vue, uh, which was a we were really happy to hear. And so if you're ever looking to see kind of why they did that, there's a whole paper on that. So I just wanted to at least alert you all if you're curious about like a big organization migrating to Vue and their, their reasoning behind it. Um, that is there for you all to read. So the question here is, what do you need to know to really get started with Vue? And so earlier we talked about some prerequisites for the workshop, but this is where I kind of want to start us as far as ground zero goes. 
as long as you have familiarity with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you have familiarity with the code editor, that is all you need. And that might come as a surprise to people because a lot of times when we think about frameworks, we are thinking about it from a build tool perspective. But uh, we are going to go ahead and show you how this approach works and why it's actually a viable approach when it comes to a lot of organizations looking to either progressively migrate their apps um, into a framework. So here's your uh, Morpheus mean uh, from Matrix. What if I told you no build tools were needed? And so again, some of you will be understandably skeptical, but we're going to actually experience this live ourselves and go through what this is like. So with that said, um, has everyone had a chance to basically fork the repo, sort of clone it down to make sure they have that environment ready to go? OK. Great. So the first thing we're going to do, let's, we've talked for a little bit now. Let's dive right into some code and check this out. So inside of here, you'll notice that there's very little going on in here. There's no package.json. There's no dependencies to run. It's basically a readme file here. And we have a couple of HTML files for you to basically work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open up my playground HTML file inside of the browser over here. And so to make sure everything's working, I'm just going to go ahead and do an h1 with hello front end masters. Save, refresh. There we go. OK. Dev environment set up, no build tools required. Great. Now, when we think about building your first view app, I mentioned before, because no build tools are required, what you can do is you can actually just drop view onto a page. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to go ahead and go onto the, the viewjs.org docs. And if we go to the guide, I believe it's under quick start. We'll see. Do, 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 do. Here we go. There's a section here that says using view from the CDN. And all we're going to do is we're going to copy this line right here and drop it into our HTML file. And so all we're going to do here is boom, paste that in. And so to verify that this worked, that something actually happened, we're actually going to go ahead and open up our browser uh, console. And you'll notice here that one, it's already alerting us that we're running a development build of view. So in other words, if we're going to deploy this, there's going to need to use a production deployment because this is um, the size is currently a bit larger. But this is fine because we're learning right now. So the way you can check that also that this is working is if you type view, it'll autocomplete. And you'll notice it'll basically bring up the view object that's ready for you to do stuff with it. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and just show you basically how that kind of works. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a div. And just like you typically would expect, I'm going to call it the div app. That's all we're going to do. And then we're going to say my app in here, save it, and we refresh. There you go. My app is showing up here. And now let's go to actually attach our app, and how do we do that? So what we're going to do now is we're going to open up a script block at the bottom. And we're actually going to go ahead and bring in a function from view called create app. So I'm going to create a constant, and I'm going to destructure it from view. So it's going to look like this. Now, the, I'm, this is an alternative syntax of basically just calling create app like this, um, calling the function directly. Uh, but there will be an advantage to this from like a syntax perspective, so that's why we're destructuring the function out. And all we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and say const app equals create app. And so what that'll do is it'll create a variable called app. And then it'll go ahead and create said app. And all we're going to do now is we're going to mount, because what we got to do, we got to tell view where it is we want to actually put the app. So that is where this mount keyword comes in. And we're going to mount it to the app, the ID of app, which is using the CSS selector here. So that it'll mount it directly into this part. So in three lines of codes, we have dropped the view, or I guess four if you include the CDN, we've loaded view onto the page, and we basically created the app. So if we refresh it, we'll notice nothing's really happening. And that's totally fine, because we haven't had view display anything yet. And so when it comes to frameworks, one of the things that people love about working with frameworks is that it really helps to track your data across different states. So that's called reactive data. So the fact that when something changes, it'll go ahead and make sure that your HTML page is updated as expected. So the way we're going to do this is inside of our create app, we're going to pass it an object. And this object is going to allow us to configure things about our app. So, that's, so think of it as a configuration object. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to pass it a data option. And what we're going to do is this is going to be a function that returns an object. And so if we think about what's going on here, basically we're saying, hey, Vue, we want you to create an app that's going to have a data property. And the reason we're using a function here is because we wanted to actually basically maintain the reactivity in terms of like tracking the latest instance of that object. Because if you were to do something instead, like just data like this, the data becomes stale over time, and there becomes like caching issues. And so it's become kind of best practice um, across frameworks that when you're managing data, you actually have it be a function that returns an object, and then the framework will take care of it from there for you. And so in this, let's go ahead and just add a message here. And this time, I'll just say, hello, it works. OK. So now here, we have our reactive data message. And the question is, how are we going to actually render that inside of our app? Well, the way we're going to do that is we're going to be using the curly brace syntax. So this is specific to, well, actually, this has been a fairly common syntax language. But as far as like the three frameworks are concerned, this one, um, Vue, uses the double curly brace. And all we type is message. That's all it is. And when we refresh it, you'll notice your data is now appearing inside of your page, as you would expect. So just based on this, for those who have been working with web apps for a while, you might already start to realize there's a lot of flexibility with this. Because now, all of a sudden, if you have a backend that's not quite ready to integrate all the build tools and everything you need to get it up and running, you can just on a specific page when you're proposing to start progressively migrating your apps, you can say on this page we're going to drop the CDN and we're going to like add the um, basically interactivity to this page and over time we'll migrate away and then once we have enough pages that consolidate that view, then we can actually invest the time to do the build tools. Because I think a lot of times when we think about migration, a lot of times developers are thinking like code freeze everything, no new features, and we just stop development. And we know that practically speaking that just rarely works for business. And so this is a really great way for us to basically go ahead and migrate um, an enterprise app over to something that might use um, more modern framework technologies. Now that said, we have a message here. Now what if we wanted to, sh let's say, show or hide it uh, based on whether or not the message is even or not? Well, something that Vue is also known for is are their directives. And so for those who have come from Angular, this might look a little bit familiar. So the way that it works is that we basically would have a normal HTML element. So let's say, let's wrap this in a P element. And then this one, we're going to say even. And this one, we're going to say odd. OK? And so the idea here being that what we'd like to do is if the message.length is even, show the even keyword. Otherwise, show the odd keyword. And so one way we can do this is we can use something called view directives. And the way it works is it's basically an attribute you add on an HTML element, and it's prefixed with v dash. So in this case, if I go v dash if equals message.length, and I'll use the modular, modular 2 equals 0 to determine that it's even, and then otherwise v else, it'll display the other thing. So if we refresh this, we'll see, ah, OK, there we go. We'll notice that it is currently odd. And so now if I delete the exclamation mark, that should bring us over to even. And so what we see here is, again, one of the things I talked about when it came to Vue is that it builds on top of what you already know. And so when most people are working with HTML and CSS, there's a lot of value in extending upon people's existing knowledge when it comes to extending APIs. And so in this regard, by basically having the convention of the v dash, and then using the like if else statements. Again, if you know JavaScript, in fact, you don't even need to know JavaScript. People would actually understand this property. Um, or granted, maybe not this part. But when people are navigating the HTML, they would actually understand what's going on here, rather than if you had kind of big if else blocks that have a bunch of functions in it, which again, I think sometimes we find is a little bit tricky with, uh, I think, like sort of React components. Those can be harder to follow, um, especially if you don't have as much experience with JavaScript. But this here keeps a visually a semantic, concise way of telling people what's going on. Now, the other, um, the other directive that I want to talk about is this one. Um, but before we do that, here's a slide to talk about this. And this is from a while ago from Sansa Cohn. And it, what it says here is that 99.7% of software development in one requirement. 
a user should be able to view a list of items. And I still think that's incredibly relevant today, right? That's what we're doing half the time. We're taking a bunch of data, rendering out a list. And I don't know about you all, but when I was doing this in React originally, I realized there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I know that there's more of a best practice now, but that can be confusing for users, especially if they have a function that runs the map, or maybe in this case, they use the for loop. There's a lot of kind, of kind of deciding what to do. And so let's go ahead and show how rendering a list works in Vue. So in this case, I'm just going to do a list of numbers here, just to keep it easy. And so one, two, three, four, five. And we have an array here. And then what we're going to do here is we're just going to do an un, uh, unordered list. And then what are we trying to repeat, right? We're trying to repeat the list item. So what we're going to have is, if you might want to guess, is that we have the v4 directive, right? Using the for loop concept from JavaScript. And what are we looping for? For every number in list of numbers, we're going to go ahead and just put the number. That's it. And if you refresh, there you go. Done. Your list is rendered. It's fantastic. Um, and so what's really nice about this, once again, is that we are trying to extend upon people's base knowledge of JavaScript without getting too much in the weeds. Again, the syntax is written in a way that's approachable for people to sort of like in plain English, really. For number in list of numbers, print number. Great. I understand what that means, even if I don't know JavaScript. The other fun fact about the declarative rendering of the curly braces here is that it's not meant to just print out variables. It actually does evaluate JavaScript statements in there. So if in the case of, let's say we wanted to like, be really excited about, about the fact that it's even, we can actually do two uppercase in here and run it. And then you'll see that it'll actually transform the text. It'll basically run the JavaScript inside of it immediately. So theoretically, you could also do things like, well, let's just multiply like math.random in here. And we refresh this, boom. I mean, clearly, <laughs> we have some interesting numbers up here. But that's something to consider. Now, the thing about this is when people discover this, sometimes they get really carried away. And we're talking like ternary statements and ternary statements. And that, to me, is very, I would say, anti-view ethos in that we're trying to make it easy for people to understand the code base. right? So I would say when it comes to basically inlining your JavaScript inside of these double curly braces, I would say keep it to a minimum and try to abstract that logic as much as humanly possible. So the question we have here is in regard to the differences between the view 2 way and the view 3 way. So the view 3 way, as we see here, is that you can abstract a helper function from view. Or if for those familiar with the view 2 way, we had view, um, it was new view. You would instantiate a new view uh, app this way. And so part of the reason uh, this approach has changed is because Vue 3 has become a lot about becoming modular and performant. In other words, being able to split apart things that you don't need. With this sort of new Vue uh, approach, basically you have everything instantiated with it. And it was a lot harder from like a bundling perspective. Like Think of it from a library maintenance perspective. That was a lot of the motivation behind this new approach, which you'll see a lot more in Vue 3 code bases is that there's a lot of helper functions, which we'll actually see in this workshop, that allow you to basically break apart pieces of Vue that are helpful in certain instances. And otherwise, it'll know to either drop certain things and optimize itself away. I expected that v4 inside the ul instead of an li. So the question here is around the idea of the v4 element being lit, like basically someone having the impression that they thought that they would put it on the ul element. Um, but the reason why this is not the case is because we have to think through what exactly we want the renderer to be looping through, right? What, it, what is the element we're repeating? And in this case, we're, we're repeating the list in this regard and not, uh, not say, like, we don't want the entire unordered list. So for example, if we did this, you'll see, we'll just show the difference. So we can do it like this. And if we refresh it, you'll notice that at first glance, it kind of looks the same. But when we take a look underneath, you'll see that there are individual unordered lists happening in this case. So don't get me wrong. If in the case you have a bunch of, like, OK, let's just actually give that example. If in the case we have different things that were going on in each element, so let's say that, OK, so one, two, three, four, five. So we had like an object here. And let's say like name, um, let me do text pastry one to three. And then uh, ID, let's just do text pastry UUID. Whoop, I need the, that first. Text pastry UUID, boom. OK, save. OK, so here we have a more complex data set, right? Um, 
we have a bunch of objects in each. So if I refresh this now, you might notice that, well, nothing. Uh, did, you, do, did I mess something up syntax wise? Doing some math on that. Oh, I am doing math. OK, that totally makes sense. All right. Um, OK, here we go. So now if I save this. So in this particular case, maybe then inside of here, we then have a, like, a sub list. So I realized I actually didn't even add the other thing I needed. So we could even say inside of here, we had another list inside of here. That was then one, two, three, for example. Then we might say, for example, in this particular list, we want the first item to show the ID. So we say number.id. And then we could then embed a second list. And that's where we would li um, loop through number.list like this. Um, so instead of number, I'm going to say switch this to item, because now this is more accurate. And then number in number list, and then number like this. So then we refresh this. I broke something. Item list. Item list. Item list. Number and number list should be number and item list. Number. Oh, yes. Ha. Good catch. OK, there we go. And so that's an example where you might want to loop possibly, although at that point it might even be a div. It kind of be wondering why you'd want just the one. But basically, consider basically how you want the semantic HTML to be rendered out at the end of the day. And that's the key thing. A uh, quick note before the next question. In case anyone was wondering how I sort of did the data population, that is the text pastry VS Code extension um, that's highly underutilized, but it's really great at generating things on the fly as far as ranges uh, as, and also like custom UUIDs, which is great for uh, random data when you're uh, doing some sand sandbox coding like I did. Next question. Is that data attribute in the create app, is that uh, required or it, you know, can we rename it some to something like state? So the question here is around this particular keyword data here. In this particular context, when you're passing a configuration object to create app, this is a basically a reserved keyword in that it is called data, and that's what it has to be. However, I will tell you right now that if you're more of a fan of calling it state, there is going to be another style of components that we'll be covering that will allow you to basically name things as you see fit. But basically, what you're seeing here is a basically a preview of what is known in Vue 2, or well, Vue 2 and Vue 3, as the options API in that Vue will provide you a set of options to do what you need to do inside of your app. And those configuration and rail guards are actually, in my opinion, very powerful when it comes to people either onboarding to Vue for the first time or when they're looking to set like a standard and consistency across their team. Options API can be incredibly powerful. But we'll show a little bit more about how that works before we get into the other one, which is Composition API, which for the person who asked that question, you might be more interested in when we get to that one. And so what we'll be doing today as far as um, for basically going forward for the rest of the workshop, you can find all the different snapshots of where we start and stop inside of the individual branches. And so basically 01 begin. Let me go ahead and add everything. So let me check, take status. What do we change? We changed the playground. And so the playground was for me. So let me go ahead, kit feature, add um, live coding for essentials. Uh, let's see, reactive data in the playground. OK, so I'm going to push that up. Whoop, git push. I haven't done this yet. Let me do this real quick. Boom. All right, great. And so check out 02, oh wait, 01 exercise, git push origin 01 exercise. OK, so if you go ahead and pull down the latest changes now, you should be able to see all the stuff that I did inside of the playground. Now, of course, I, I saw that some people were coding, coding along, which I was really happy to see. But of course, we're going to actually give you a chance to actually practice that on your own without any guidance. So the way that's going to work is what I want you to do is choose your favorite TV show. Or if you don't watch TV, try movie or basically anything that is personal to you. And basically, use the index.html page that we have in there that's already ready for you to play around with. And I want you to go ahead and replicate what we just did as far as go ahead and create that app, create a view app using the CDN, add some reactive data tracking to track maybe some characters on the show and whatnot. I want you to practice using the vif, v4, so vif to basically track if there are no characters, it should show some sort of text element that says, hey, no characters. And then when it populates it, it swaps it out. And then go ahead and drop in as much reactive data as you want. Again, play, have fun with this, and um, yeah. 
So from my end, I'm going to go ahead and open up index.html as you all did. And for me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do Avatar The Last Airbender. That's the one I'm going to do. And so inside of here, we're going to go ahead and copy over the CDN include that I used earlier. And then from here, we'll go ahead and we'll start setting up the app. So again, the convention here is div ID app. And the reason for this is because typically the frameworks will go ahead and render a bunch of stuff in there. So the div it doesn't have any semantic value um, as far as like from screen readers and that kind of thing. So that's why the convention is usually to use a div. But if for whatever reason you have you want to attach it to something else, by all means, uh, feel empowered to do so. OK, so what do we say? We're going to create some data. So let's say cons create app equals view. Um, and actually, you know what I'm going to do? Just for the sake of showing you the diff the, that they're the equivalent, we can basically do view.createApp like this. And then this can be a data function. Now, I'm going to show you a new syntax that I personally prefer to use, which is that I'll use the arrow function for the basically assigning a function to data. And then I'll wrap the object in the parentheses. So it basically saves a couple lines of code. So just to sp uh, split, show the difference on that real quick. You'll see here, this is the difference, right? Data with the parentheses, then the actual explicit return. This has the implicit return with the arrow, and then we can find our data here. So here, I can do my characters like this, and then I'll go ahead and collapse this now so that we have the single column. OK, so then we'll have four objects. So actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do real quick. This is one, two, three, four. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use the multi cursor select by holding down Command. Uh, might be control for Windows. And then I'll just open up basically an object so that I don't have to do that multiple times. Great. And then let's just save that real quick so it'll auto format. Once again, let's click through and let's add some properties. So we'll have basically the name of the character, and that's basically it. So in this case, we have Aang, we have Zuko, we have Toph, and we have Katara. All right. So first thing first, we're going to do now is let's go ahead and actually render out our empty state. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to do a p element and say there are no characters. And so we'll save this right now. And let's go ahead and actually open this up inside of the browser. So instead of playground, we'll go to index. There we go. There are no characters. And then we'll have the ul here. And just like before, we will practice now um, the v4 element that we had. So for every character in characters, Although, actually, this is surfacing a philosophical point that I like to do when it comes to naming things. Uh, One-off errors are very common in programming, and I find that happens a lot with spelling, too. And so the one S plural has caught me in multiple times. So personally, I usually like to just say that it's a list. It's a little bit longer, but then you just have that visual distinction. So character and character list, and then I can just render out character.name, which is great. Although, hmm, what's happening here? Why isn't it working? This is a common mistake that we often make when we're sort of creating the app this way, is because what we have to remember to do is we need to tell view that we need to mount it. So we're going to go ahead and run the mount command on this. And we're going to mount it to the ID app. And once we do that, uh, save, refresh. Uh-oh, I broke something. Warn selector. Why is that the case? Well. Typos. Didn't I say something about one-off errors right here? This is a w one that'll catch you off guard because in your mind you're thinking CSS selector, but you don't need the extra hashtag symbol. Hey, there we go. Everything's working. So now all we got to do though is complete the exercise by saying if character list dot length is equal to zero, then show that. Otherwise, show this. Okay. As you can see, boom. There we go. It's working. If we go ahead and just go ahead and update that real quick, you'll see there are no characters showing up. Now, something worth noting about the vif directive, though, is that when you use the vif directive, what Vue is actually doing is, if we take a look here, is that the ul that you have here for the else condition does not even exist on the DOM. So basically, the elements are being destroyed and recreated each time you toggle that. So as you can see here now, if we take a look at the app, you'll notice here that the UL is present, that the p tag is gone. And so this is contrary to another 
directive that you will see in view called v-show, which is, I'll say, its less popular cousin. And that's because what v-show does is it toggles the visibility of the element via CSS. And so the reason you want those two different approaches is because there are times where it might be really performant, or like there might be a performance bottleneck of like destroying a list of thousands of items and then having the DOM recreate it every time someone toggles it on and off, and you might just want to show or hide it. So that's where vshow, vhide could be very useful in those regards. So once again, the, uh, the idea here, building on what we know and trying to make it easy for us to do the right performance optimization. So that's a trade-off to consider when using VF. But again, I would say 95% of the time, that is what you want to use. But the moment you start thinking, oh, I'm toggling, uh, users are going to be toggling this a lot, and it might be expensive to destroy it, reach out for a V show. Can you have an else if kind of a, like a you know, V if and then V else, V else if? Yeah, you absolutely can. And so, oh, so the question here is regarding can we extend the if else statement? And absolutely, because when Evan and the team were designing the API for this, their goal it really is to extend upon what you already know. So if you have if and else, why not else if? So in this particular case, let's just go ahead and for sake of, we're going to do the same thing before. And this time, character list.length. And then this time, we'll just make it even just to kind of showcase this. And then otherwise, we'll have a p element v else that's like, there are odd characters, which is a punny joke. Ha, ha, ha. Um, anyways, uh, do, do, do. So it's even right now. So we add this now, and we add another one. Let's do uh, appa, refresh, boom. So it'll run through all the scenarios and end up at the last one. So. Generally speaking, from a performance perspective, you do probably want to optimize for your most common scenario at the very top so you don't have view running through everything. But otherwise, um, yeah, you're else, you can else if as long as you, you, uh, as you see fit. Question I, here. I would reach for namespacing character list under this. Is there any gotchas with that? Namespacing the character list. Each character in this character list? Uh, this in this character. Like down here? Uh, up in the markup. Oh, OK. So you're saying you wanted to namespace this? Yeah, I would put it under this for like, because once you get inside character, is character a local variable or is it on the parent object? So I tend to put like character in this character list, meaning it's on the parent component or parent, in this case, the app. Is there any gotchas inside of that? I see. OK, so I'm, let me try to understand. So you're saying that because of the way it's kind of like spelled out, it's kind of confusing. So you want to be explicit about where character list is being called yeah. on for the parent? Yeah, adding this dot. Oh, this dot. OK. <laughs> we have avoided that up until this point. Something that you'll notice is that we're not actually doing anything special as far as calling the data that's inside of the app, right? We have this character list array. And all we're doing is saying, as, as we can see here, character list, character. We like, we're basically naming things as we go. And it's because Vue is basically trying to do that step of like abstracting away the things that you would normally have to define. So if this were JavaScript, you might have to be like, oh, I have to call the app.data.characterList to be like, I'm calling character list. But Vue knows that like, basically there are conventions in, that, in the way you kind of call things. So rather than having you explicitly define everything, it is trying to basically help abstract that away. Uh, but in the future, for those who want to be more explicit, there are ways to like, kind of namespace that out a little bit more. So we'll get into that uh, later on. Cool. Go so, for it. I mean, you could almost say that character list is like a global, in a sense, or global to the app. Yes, at this point, yeah, especially once we start getting into components, because components obviously is a big part of frameworks these days, that will definitely, character list will become, well, hold up, let me, let me, let me backtrack. So your question here is re regarding whether or not character list becomes global to the entire app. And so it is global to the context in that specific uh, rendering context. So in the case of this page, right, it has the character list, it can show it. When we start getting into components, it will have its own scope. And it will be separate from the, par the parent. So in that regard, you cannot expect character list to just show up in any context. So in Vue, it, is, it tries to basically try to optimize for performance. Um, there's a performance impact when it comes to like, making things global. But more importantly, you have like, namespace polluting that often happens. And so Vue tries to protect you from that by making forcing you to be explicit with what you want to be shared and what you want to be made global. So there are ways to make global variables in Vue, but I would say most of the time you're probably not doing that. 
um, and there are other ways you're trying to share data. So even in the instance of, say, the use case regarding like a user being logged in, that's something that impacts a lot of different components. And so in the past, the first thing you might be like tempted to do is say, well, I'm just gonna make a global variable that says, hey, is a user logged in? Because, I don't know, call it 30% of our code base uses it. But that also means 70% of your code base doesn't use it, and now it has this user logged in state that it has to either worry about or it might conflict for some other reason. And so Vue 3 in particular, especially with the composition API and composables, which I promise we'll cover uh, in this workshop, allows you to then segment that to be very explicit that like, on the 30% that care about user logged in, great, drop it in. Otherwise, you, can, you don't even have to worry about it. And so we'll, we'll definitely be talking about that. But um, does that help to answer your question? OK, solid. Did you have a question? A small thing. On your V4, yeah. you like a first and last equivalent. So you want to do them in a commas, but not on the last person. AngularJS would be first and last when you're looping Oh, those. they have the first. OK. Um, so you're saying like we want to render like the list out as like a string? It's a string with commas, but not on your last guy. Got it. OK. So the, qu the, the question here is around if we wanted to actually list the string of characters instead, <laughs> that actually, I would say, OK, there's a couple ways we could do this. With the information we have now, the V4 actually would probably feel a little bit clunky because, well, and let's show this. So let's go ahead and do this. So with information we have here, if we wanted to have a P element here instead that, say, took a span of every character in character list, uh, list, yep, OK, then I'm going to do the character.name, OK, so this should just like give us a mash of things. Oop, I did not close it. Save. OK, boom, right? But what we need is we need that comma space. But you're probably also thinking, oh, OK, uh, let me refresh this now. OK, that looks better. But to your point, we need the ability to cut off the last part. And so, gosh, I think the way I would do this at first glance would basically be I would probably just actually do a pull. No, I think I would just do another inline. Using only the techniques we have right now, um, I would say we have uh, if character list or OK. So we want to pull out. OK, here's a great example of where we need the index of something. Right? And so I'm going to repeat this a lot because I think this is a core thing I'd like to see other APIs continue as well, is that we build on what you already know. And since we're in a for loop in JavaScript, we can actually pull the index out by just pulling it out as a second argument, because this is the standard JavaScript API. So again, Vue really tries not to like come in and like reinvent things for you. Like Once you learn it, it's a convention we know. Why not use it? So then if we can go index. Uh, is equal to character list dot length minus one. If that is true, empty string, otherwise comma like this. And I did I slightly do that off? Aha, I can't spell. Off by one, once again. And I'm, oh, autocomplete messed me up. Length, length, length. This, 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 this. Great. There we go. So there are ways, though, if let's say that in your app that you want to go ahead and do, like you're constantly stringing stuff together and you want it to always leave off, there are ways you can create custom directives so you could pass it in and it would do something specific. Most of the time, I think what I've seen people do instead is that when we talk about computed properties in a little bit, that's usually something that people use a lot for these sort of like computations, which um, we'll cover uh, then. Does that help to answer your question, though? Yeah. But you're right. I think Angular did have some nice like sugar, syntactic sugar for stuff like that. So I would say that absolutely, that is a great callback. OK, so we've learned how to create an app. We've attached some reactive data. That was fun, hopefully pretty easy to do. And now, of course, we want to talk about how we deal with user input, right? Because that's what a lot of JavaScript's value is, is handling the interactivity of your website. So the first thing we want to talk about is let's open Playground actually in Chrome. So we have that. So let me just. Open a new tab with this, and this will be Playground. OK. So for the sake of Playground demo purposes, let's just use the standard example of the counter app, right? Which is the fact that if we go inside of here, and this time I'm going to have, let's see, let's do that sequentially. So I'll put a horizontal line here, line break, there we go. 
And then here, we'll just do an h1. We'll call it counter. We have a count, and then we have a button where we want to increment count. This should look pretty familiar. 10. OK. So if you scroll down, ooh, I don't like the fact that this is all the way at the bottom. I'm going to actually move this up to the top. Copy that. HR. Great. So we'll do this from most recent to oldest. OK. So here we have our counter. And your question is probably thinking, OK, how do we actually change data? Because after all, it's fun to render some reactive stuff. We want to do more with it. So inside of view, we have our data here. But the question is, we want to actually change it. And so the option that we want to learn about next is the concept of methods. And so if we think about functions in JavaScript, right? typically we would have something like let count equals 0. And then you'd have a function called like increment. And it would say count plus plus, something along this lines. When you think of methods, think of it as functions from JavaScript that are available for your app to call at any time. That's the best way to think about it. So from this perspective, we would actually want to then define a method. We'll just say increment count. And inside of here, this is where, um, this is where a question that we had earlier comes into play. So when you want to refer to something else in the app, so in this case, we want to actually refer to this count property inside of data. Vue is smart about a lot of things, but if we just currently say count plus plus, this is not going to work. And the reason for that is because if we know, as when it comes to JavaScript and programming, scoping is a thing. So it doesn't know basically where to fetch count from. And so this is where the dreaded keyword of this comes into play when it comes to JavaScript. The this keyword is where Vue basically takes the context of the app, and it will basically figure out where count exists. So from Vue 2, you might have noticed it from like this.data.count. This would be an explicit thing you might do. But because Vue knows that oftentimes we're referring to data or compute it, it will, unless you have some really clear name clashes, you can just use this dot whatever property you're looking for. And that goes for basically anything you're defining within this options API. And the benefit of this is that while some people find that this keyword confusing, the point of it, I think at the time when the API was being designed, is around the fact that like, you shouldn't really have to think about what this even means. The point is, is that think of this as the app. And that way, you come in and you refer to this app, and that's it. So when I was teaching other people uh, Vue for the first time, even though they didn't have a lot of JavaScript experience, they got the convention that like, as long as I call this, it refers to my app, and I'm not going to learn about scoping or anything. It just works. And that in itself is an advantage from like, a learning perspective. But just know that like, you don't have to use this so that in the future, if people are actively avoiding it, we can go ahead and do that uh, once we learn about composition API. But while we're in the options API right now, this is how we actually refer to things within this configuration object. OK, so now that we have the this count plus plus, what we're going to do here now is we're going to go ahead and say, how do we actually call the thing? And so what we're going to do is we're going to, just like before, we're going to use a view directive to actually call the thing. And so we're going to use v on. That is the directive that you'll want to learn for this. Because similar to what you know from JavaScript events, on click, on key up, this is the same idea. We're extending on that theory. And so instead of just like on click, though, which you might think that's what I'm probably going to guess, view, because v on itself is the directive, you have the ability to pass it an argument through the colon symbol. So it's v on colon the event that you want to call. And the event you want to call, again, is standard JavaScript events. We haven't made anything up. So key up, anything that you can think of that's standard in the JavaScript um, API, that exists. And so when you click, what do we want to refer to? Well, guess what? We want to refer to our increment count function that we had earlier. The key thing here to remember, though, is that you don't want to actually call the function, because this is something that will be called when the event is triggered. So basically, you're passing a reference to the function inside of your app. And then when it's clicked, it will be called. That's the reason why you don't call it immediately. So if we save that, and let's go ahead and now refresh our page, you can see, boom, things are actually changing. And they're being tracked. So that's fairly straightforward. What about something a little bit more complicated, like what if I wanted to set the amount that the counter is being incremented by? OK, well, in this case, you're going to say, well, let's say we have a label here. Let's say increment amount. And then it'll be increment by. And then you probably have some uh, element here that's a number. 
And then so if we refresh this, theoretically, what you would want is the ability to change the amount that increment count is changing. So how would we actually do that? Well, first of all, what we want to do is we need a reacted data property, because we want to track what the heck is going on. So at this moment, if we go down into our data, we have this count, and we can say we can just have increment amount be a reactive data property. And currently, it's 1. And then what we want to do then is tie it into our increment count down here. Let me actually collapse this. And so rather than just incrementing it by 1, which is the plus plus, we'll do plus equals this dot increment amount. Whoops. Increment amount. Save. And to show that this is working, I'm going to switch this over to 10. And we're going to go ahead and refresh this. And you can see it's jumping, as you would expect, by 10. But we want to be able to change this, right? How do we actually basically connect these two? So let me go ahead and actually wrap this part in the div real quick. Oop, that's not what I wanted at all. Uh, da, 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 div, there we go. OK. That should give it a new line. Perfect. OK. So the first thing first is we need our input to display what it is that value is. So how we do that? Normally, we would say value equals 10. This is standard HTML. But this is static, right? This is something we define ourselves, has nothing to do with our app. How do we connect the two? The way we do that is with another view directive, because what are we doing? We're now extending upon our HTML to give it superpowers to do what? To have some interactivity, to be supercharged with reactive data. And so you do that via vBind, right? You're binding the value to a dynamic property. That's the way to think about it. But here, though, what are we binding it to? We're not binding it to 10. That's not what we're binding by. We're binding it to increment amount. So we can refer directly to the variable that we talked about earlier. And so to show that this changed, this time I'm going to change increment amount to 8. And if I refresh, boom, there we go. We can see that they're now talking to each other. And so now we can see when we increment count, this is great. It's actually changing. But what do we know about this? We know that if we change now to 12, is it going to make a difference? No, it's not. In fact, it's going to reset itself back to 8. What's going on? Well, the reason for this is because you've told Vue, track this thing and make sure that its value is always bound to this increment amount. That's what you've told it. And so this is why even though we've changed it once and we try to like increment the count, it's setting it back because you've, that's what Vue is doing its job that you told it to do. So what do we want to do? We want to actually update increment amount whenever someone actually types inside of the input element. So how might you do that? Well, we're going to actually listen to an event. And so what is that? We learned it is v on, and we're going to listen to the input event. And what we're not going to do, though, is we're not going to inline the function that will change this, because I find that to be very clunky. So we're going to call it change increment amount. And so what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, on the input event for this input element, when we get an input event, I want you to run this function, which we have not created yet, to be clear. So we'll come in here. And we'll go to a method, and we'll say change increment amount, just like that. And here's the difference, though. Now that you're actually listening to an event, you actually get a default event object that's passed to you, once again, just like you would expect from standard JavaScript. So I'm going to call that event. And what we're going to do is, though, we're just going to log the event to prove that this is working. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up, refresh. And if I go ahead and type in here, or anything happening, look, the input event is being fired. So what do we know? Well, we know, um, again, we won't dive into the, the details of it, but event.target.value is what you're looking for. That's usually the convention for when you're playing with form elements. So to show you this works, if I delete this, you can see it's actually showing up inside of my terminal, as you would expect. And so now that we're actually getting the dynamic value of the event, we can then say this.increment amount is equal to event.target.value. Now, to show that this works, we're just going to also, I'm a big fan of like making sure things are actually working correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and inside of here, we're just going to add a quick h1 for the increment amount. So you can see here, we're rendering the increment amount here and here. And if I change this now to 18, you'll see that it is, it is being tracked correctly. It's in here. And now we can increment the count, and then, hmm, it's not working as correctly. Anybody have a guess why? String. It's a string. That's right. So you might think, OK, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come in here. I'm going to wrap this in a number, be done with it. All right, let's refresh. Let's make sure that works. 
Let's do 80 this time. All right, that works. But I'll do you one better. Instead of having to come in here and do it here, which is kind of silly, um, because the increment amount, it already has a target value. And what's a bit odd, too, is that, huh, if we look at our input element, we are already type number. Uh, why is that the case? Well, this is one way to fix it. Here's the thing, though. If we take a look at our inputs, Sam had made the joke that I showed in the tweet earlier that most of the web is rendering a list. Well, I'd say a lot of the web is also filling out forms, right? I mean, that's what a lot of our bread and butter is, too. So Vue was like, OK, this is a lot of work to do every single time you have a form element, right? Like, oh, gosh, what if we could just learn from what Angular did and do two-way binding in this particular context? <laughs> so instead of having to always define and change and track all this stuff, what if we had a directive called vmodel, and we tracked it directly to the data property that we cared about? Once you have this vmodel, all of this I say disappears, but vmodel is syntactic sugar for basically configuring all that underneath the hood, which means that inside of our method down here, we don't need even the, this as well. So I can save that. And now, if we refresh, once again, let's do 800 this time and increment, you'll see that things are changing just as you would expect with this vmodel. And what's even more interesting, if you'll notice, it's not a string anymore. Because, once again, what Vue tries to do is it looks at the developer experience and it goes, hey, I know that I'm looking at an input element. Because here's the thing, vmodel works with other form elements like checkboxes, radio, select. You can do all that. But it also knows what kind of input event to listen for. Because you'll know that, like, especially with select, that one's a tricky one. I always have to look up the docs every time I work with select. Like, I have to like, code it from scratch. But here, it actually knows that we are type number in here. And because of that, the value is actually tracking inside of its app has automatically been converted. Now, if we did string, for example, here, or not string, text, revert, you can see, oh, it actually, it actually is smart enough to even to know what to do. But uh, the one thing I wanted to show, uh, because this used to be a v, uh, view 2 thing, is that you could actually attach arguments or basically like modifiers to your directives. So in this case, it's a v model of number, for example. Um, but I'll look for, uh, there will be other opportunities I'll get to present that later on. I want to cover two questions that came up, the first of which is around the strategy of actually tracking the increment amount. So as we can see here, what we're doing right now is using Vue to track the increment amount using this vmodel directive. So down here, we can see inside of this reactive data, we have it tracked in here. And the question is, why do we even do this? Which is actually a good question, because theoretically, if we go ahead and comment this out, and we go up here, and we don't even attach any view powers to this particular input element, technically the text element knows what it's doing, right? It knows that it has this, uh, I should have chose a smaller number, it's fine. It knows that it has 123 inside already. Why are we using view to also check it? So in other words, like especially before sort of reactive frameworks became really a big thing, a common strategy for this was that every time we wanted to increment, a, um, increment the count, we would basically go and check the DOM to see what the source of truth is, right? And so a completely valid approach and one that we use for many, many years in web development. But as websites and applications have gotten more complex, the problem is that if we were to have some method, again, call it check input for value that's being run right here. Again, this is pseudocode, just in case anyone's afraid to miss anything. The reason this is, ends up becoming a problem is because there ends up being kind of like an inefficient performance bottleneck in the sense that now every time someone's running this increment count, they're going to check the DOM, regardless of the fact that nothing has actually changed. And so that's what a lot of reactivity system has provided for us from like a developer experience convenience and also abstracting some of those performance concerns away is because, again, for this particular example, the performance difference is probably negligible, to be honest, to just check an input element real quick. If it's a number, pass it back and then run it. But we can envision when you have complex data visualizations, when you have a lot of things working with each other, if you have to check the DOM every single time for every single element that has that source of truth, you're going to end up with some conflict. Uh, and then it'll probably be slower because, once again, if those things haven't changed, there's no reason to even check that to begin with. So as a result of that, this is why in sort of the more modern frameworks, we have the ability to cache things and have these reactivity tracking. And that's where the advantage of actually making sure that Vue tracks that reactive data 
makes our lives a lot easier. So great question again for that one. OK, so let's go ahead and reset this part real quick so we don't ruin the code. One, two, three. And then we had the V model here. Increment amount. Let me save that. Make sure this works. This does. Great. OK. Um, in addition, there was a second question here in regards to what happens when you actually want to pass an argument to the method. So in this particular case, what if, for example, uh, in increment count, we wanted to pass it our own variable? So in this case, let's just say 10. And then for whatever reason, again, we're spitballing here. Uh, in increment count, we're going to check if the argument is greater than the, um, what's inside of this, that increment amount. Then we'll basically use the argument instead of the reactive variable. Again, a little bit convoluted, but we're kind of going on the fly here. So in increment count, I mentioned before that uh, typically when something's being run, it's by default pass an event object. So once again, to show that this works, let me just go ahead and log event real quick and then remove the argument. Save, refresh, console. You can see the pointer event is being registered. However, if I add that 10 here and I refresh, you'll see 10 is being passed. And that's because what Vue does is it goes, okay, at this point, I don't know how many arguments you're going to pass. Because you could pass a bunch of different ones if you wanted to. Um, and so rather than try to tra like sort of force you to remember that the event object is there, the default event object that's being passed to you basically gets pushed to the end. So if we still wanted to access the event object in this regard, we would say, for example, now this is not actually new. This is not actually event. It's new amount. And then we also have the event object that's being attached at the end. So once again, just to make sure that this actually works as intended. So when it comes to how Vue handles that default event, because it cannot predict where that default event needs to be brought in, you actually pass it in as this, basically, you explicitly define it. So you can see here, dollar sign $event. That passes the standard JavaScript event to the function. And that way, in case you have any sort of funky things going on, it's very, very clear what you're looking for. The other thing I wanted to show with this as well in the docs is that, I, again, I'm not a huge fan of inline events. Um, but I just want you to know it is possible. You can inline the event directly there and just actually run the thing if you want. Um, but generally speaking, I find that it's a lot cleaner to just have the method there because, again, HTML is meant to be, in my mind, to be readable for users. And then the logic and all that stuff, we should abstract that away as much as humanly possible. Um, because what it does is it lowers the barrier of entry for those who might want to come and contribute, um, particularly like if you have designers on your team who are, have front-end abilities but might, might not be that comfortable with JavaScript. By abstracting that stuff away, it just makes the code a lot more approachable for them. So the dollar sign event is the answer for that. So just to show that inside of the code, actually, so that we have cons or I guess c consistency here. Um, again, this is the event, but it is not passed by default. Do, do, do. We need to go inside of here, and we need to say dollar sign event. Now when we increment, there we go. We have our pointer, and we have our count. All right. Question. So what's the difference between the at click and the von click? At click is that's just an HTML5 attribute, right? Ah, OK. Good question. No, no, no. It actually segues really well. Um, so something you'll notice here is that right now we're doing this v on and v bind. Where's my v bind? Oh, v bind is gone in this particular case. Okay, that's fine. We interact with elements a lot um, as far as like interactivity and events. So rather than forcing you to type v on all the time, there is a shorthand which is the at symbol. And so if you shortcut that, that'll basically do exactly what you expect in terms of the v on. But otherwise, it's a syntactic sugar to basically say you don't have to type those one, two, three, four, five characters anymore. Just do at, which honestly I think is a fairly intuitive shortcut when it comes to saying, ah, yes, at click, do this thing. At key up, do this thing, et cetera. And so I mentioned vbind. And just for the sake of showing that one, I'll just do a data attribute called uh, increment by. Because sometimes you know, you're know you rendering stuff to the server or some other app needs something here. And let's say you want to render increment amount to this p element. And so if we look at this p element right here, you'll notice, uh, did I do the wrong one? It is, no, that should be, oh, I didn't refresh. That's why. OK, you see that the attribute data increment by is there available for you. But 
Once again, we need it to be bound. And I said before that you could do vbind, and that will go ahead and change that to actually say, ah, yes, the increment of i we're looking at is 8. But again, dynamically binding attributes, very, very common. So what can you do instead? You can just delete vbind and just prefix your attribute with the colon, another shorthand. Right or wrong way, there's no right or wrong way. Most people end up eventually getting used to the convention. So you see that a lot in code bases. But otherwise, it's up to you on how you want to write your code. So we're going to go back to your index.html page that you were playing around with with your characters. And this time, under each of your character, I want you to go ahead and add a favorite button to it. And when, you when a user clicks on that favorite button, go ahead and update a separate list that tracks your favorite characters. And as a bonus, if you have some time, um, go ahead and actually create a form that will allow you to add more characters to whatever the preset of data already exists. Cool. So what I'm going to do now for the solution is we're going to go ahead and run through this. Uh, to do two. OK, so inside of my index.html file. All right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a button to each character. Well, we have our list here that we have. And all we're going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to just, for the sake of making it easier, let's make the p element wrapping around that. So we save that. This is good. And then we can then go ahead and add a button. So just do do. And I'm going to add a star here for favorite. There we go. We have a favorite button. Great. Now, what we need to do is actually add a favorite character. So at click, we will say favorite character. We haven't written the method yet. So we'll go down inside of our app here. And so inside of data, we don't need that. So we need it here. So we need methods for favorite character. And this is where the argument actually comes into play. Because at this point, well, there's a couple things. One, we need a favorite list. So I like to try to go alphabetical whenever it makes sense. So favorite list. That's just an array. And so what we want to do is we're going to do this dot favorite list dot push. What are we pushing? We want to push the character that's actually being called. And so the way we detect this is we go inside of our favorite character, and we're in our loop, so we can actually pass character directly to our function, which means character now should be here. And we can go ahead and push that over. And so to show that that works, let's go ahead and add another list right here. This time, we'll just add a uh, h2 of favorite characters. Once again, I see a typo there. I'll check. I'll fix that real quick. V for character in favorite list. And then inside of here, we're just going to render out the character. OK, so as we can see here, actually, nothing's showing up. So actually, this is a good instance where we might actually want to do no, no favorite characters left. So this is where the v if well, works well. So v if favorite characters or favorite lists, that length. Uh, actually, you know what? I usually prefer the greater than 0 as my first one. So we're going to swap this. We're going to go down here and we'll swap the v if for the ul, because that's, that's my preferred default state. And this, this empty state is really a fallback for when it doesn't have it. So there we go. No favorite characters yet. We'll be favorite Toph. There we go. Toph, Zuko, Aang, Katara. Everything's working. Now, of course, you can do deduping and all that fun stuff, but I'll leave you all to play with that. Um, and then there you go, create form. OK, and then let's go ahead and add the characters as well. So what we want to do next is we want to actually then add a new character. How do we do that? Well, at this point, the easiest thing for me to do is let's go ahead and create another h2. And this h2 will be new, char new character. And then what do we have? We have basically one attribute, which is the character name. And so let's say name. And then we'll have the input. And this will be text. That's fine. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do, if we think about the data structure we're probably looking for, eventually characters have more attributes, right? So if we think about the reactive data we're looking for, we can say there's going to be a new character object that we're basically going to be tracking inside of here. So with that, we can then say uh, vModel equals new character. And you know what? We actually know how we kind of want it structured. So we're actually going to go ahead by default uh, go ahead and actually define the name inside of the data so we're clear to future developers that it's not an implicit thing. And then new character.name. 
And so to show that that works, what we're going to do once again is let's go ahead and use the pre element. Uh, and so the pre element is a handy little trick to actually render your reactive data in a way that's actually readable. So here, I'll show you the difference. So if we save here and refresh, you'll see that the name is actually being rendered kind of in its code block form. But if you didn't do a pre element and you just did like the p element, for example, which is what I might do on, by default, you'll see that it basically automatically just renders it as a normal string. And so the pre element, it's not as obvious in this particular case, but when you have like JSON objects that's multiple lists, it's really nice to have it automatically formatted with just using an HTML element without having to do anything special. So there we go. And now if we come in here, hey, there we go. Look, things are actually changing. So once again, if I say APA, right, and then, hmm, nothing's adding yet. Why? Because we haven't actually had a way to actually push the character to it. So how might we do that? Well, for the sake of showing you all something new, right, we talked about V model and all that stuff. And we, ha we know how to do a, some, uh, we can click on the button to add it. But what if instead we did something a little bit more fun? Let's not do a button this time. What if we wanted to do a key up, and then when we hit enter, then we push it? How would that work? Well, we can actually do an at key up event, and then we can say uh, basically add new character. And so if we come in here and we go to methods and we go add new character, at this point, we do know what the new character is. So we don't need to pass any arguments to it because that is already being tracked inside of our reactive data. So what we get to do is we can do this dot character list dot push. What are we pushing? We're pushing the new character. And not just any new character, it's this new character. So we refresh that and do APA. You'll see that's weird. What's happening? Well, any, any, any guesses? Every key up. Every key up is just like firing off. It's like add, 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 add. We don't want that. Um, we really only want to do this when um, we only want to do it when you hit key up enter. And so some of you are probably thinking, OK, so I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the event. I'm going to do event.target. And then I have to figure out what the key code is. And I got it. But I got you all one easier. Yep. So the audience already got it. So what we can do here. I mentioned before about modifiers to the API. On the key up, Vue also knows we have common things we're using all the time. And enter and escape keys, those are common. So all we can do is we do dot enter on this. Refresh. Oppa is fine. Hit enter. And then there you go. The reason it's blinking is because of that odd character. So actually, let me, I think that, that functionality is basically done. So let's do, 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 don't do that. Don't, oh, right, I had that whole list thing. That's fine. OK, so then if I just add it twice, there you go. Now you'll see both of them. And so the final thing, uh, just from like a code cleanup perspective, is probably just once we push the character, just new character equals, you know, just like a, a, a new object. And so just to prove that that works, APA, enter, that's fine. Then we can say like Azula, there we go, APA, Azula. You can see that our name input is being reset um, properly. So the section we're going to be kicking off right now is on watchers and computed properties. We've talked a lot about reactive data, and we saw that it's cool, that it's get tr it tracks. But the next step to reactive data a lot of times comes to the point where it's a question of what happens when things depend on that data, right? So you want something to happen when the reactive data changes. This is actually fairly common. So granted, we're doing a lot of things automatically at this point, right? So for example, when the data updates, Vue will automatically update the HTML. But what do we want to do more fine-grained things? So for example, like we want to say, we want to watch the count up here. And if it's even, we want to go ahead and then say, update the title up here to something else, right? So you can imagine that if we had this to be counter title, for example, and counter title would just put it here. So counter title is going to be just a standard, for example. So you see we refresh. Great, counter standard here. And we want to say we want to watch for if the count goes past 20, then we want to add like long to the text. And so your first instinct for those who come from a framework background is to think, well, we need to be able to watch the thing, right? And so to watch something in view is actually fairly simple. There actually is a watch option, as you would expect. So we have data, we have methods. Here's our opportunity to watch something. 
And when you want to watch something, you basically say, what is, it, it, what is it exactly that we're watching? Well, in this case, we're watching the count. And so when you actually define the count, though, what you want to do is you want to say, you need the value that is basically going to return to you by default, because otherwise you don't have something to refer to inside of that value. Because it's going to basically say, what's your new value, what's your old value? And so by default, you get the new value as the first one. So let me actually just do new value like this. So you'll see now, here we have a simple watch function that's watching count. And then when it changes, we should, autom we should automatically see it log. And so ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo, watch count. Did not refresh. Refreshing would be helpful. There we go. OK, so we can see here, 18, 26. We're getting some logs as well here from increment count. But we see that at least it's being triggered. So your next thing would be like, OK, well, logically speaking, what I would want to do then is I would say, well, if new value is greater than 20, then this dot counter title, ooh, counter title plus equals very long. OK, now refresh. One, two, you can see, boom, it's updated. And so from a mental model perspective, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. And so this is actually a common paradigm in a lot of frameworks when it comes to watching reactive dependencies. That's what it's called. But Vue uh, has a better way for us to do this, uh, especially when it comes to modifying existing data. Because if you think about what we're doing here, what we're doing is we're saying, based on a reactive data property, run a specific computation. and then. But if we think about that from a performance perspective, we really only wanted to do that when all the dependent, like the right dependencies are triggered. And so one of the problems that comes with doing something as like explicitly watching values is sometimes, especially when apps get really large, the watch can end up getting triggered like a lot, like unnecessarily so. And so when you hear things about people accidentally triggering re-renders, that's, that's what they're talking about. It's because at that point, you're, you're manually watching the dependencies. And if you don't know what you're doing or not caching it correctly, all of a sudden, you might be triggering re-rendering of thousands of nodes and whatnot. So Vue, in its Vue fashion, came up with an API that would help to abstract that away. And the way it does that is w through the idea of computed properties. And so the way computer properties worked is, is basically another option on your app. So I'm going to add it um, below data, because, and you'll see shortly why. So computer properties is, think of it as basically performance optimized calculations on reactive data that you have. So in the instance of, for example, the counter title, right? Rather than it be like, OK, well, I'm going to have a watch on this count. If it's 20, then add the thing. Instead, you could be. I'll say uh, display title, for example. And so this will be a function that Vue will basically, um, it will correctly decide when to run it. So we'll see shortly. And in this function, what are we going to do? We're going to say, if uh, this dot count is greater than 20, return counter standard. Otherwise, return, oh wait, in this case, it was counter very long. Otherwise, return counter standard, just like that. And so if we switch this over now to do, 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 display title and refresh, you see nothing changes. And then it's swapped, and then it's good. And basically, even though you might think programmatically this looks very similar to what we just did, this is extremely powerful because what you've just done is now given view the job of figuring out when its dependencies have changed. And so to show you what I mean by that, we could even combine computed properties together. So for example, let's say that we actually wanted to impact the increment amount based on the length of the title. Let's just do that. So we could then say, uh, let's see, let's say call it optimize increment amount. And for whatever reason, we have some algorithm that's dependent on this, the counter title. What we could do is that we can return this dot counter title, or sorry, this dot display title dot length times, and then let's say this dot increment amount. So now we have two dependencies. We're depending on this display title here. We're de dependent on increment amount here. But then once we update here to optimize increment amount, we can see now that things are starting to change actually pretty drastically, right? You're seeing that the, oh, actually, I, I realized you're not actually seeing the optimized amount. So let's show that real quick. 
Uh, where's my increment count? Okay, here we go. Then we can say optimized increment amount. Very good. Uh, so you can see here it's 224 right here. And so it's changing because why? Because we're mo we've modified the title. If we modify this times 10, you see that now it's updating correctly by the increment amount, but the optimized amount is now dependent on two different things. And so what you get with computer properties is basically really efficient tool chaining on reactive dependencies. And this is a concept we're starting to see popularized. I think Svelte has something very similar as well now, in that if you think about an enterprise level app, there is going to be so much that's changing. And when you have manual definitions of what you're watching, oftentimes you'll find that it's, it's actually fairly brittle because one small change will break that entire dependency chain. Whereas here, you can have your source of truth being this data store, and then you can have all your computations run off of that thing. right? And it knows when to trigger, it knows what to do, it knows how to cache it so that in the HTML it doesn't randomly trigger. like All that stuff that like, like our goal is to build cool things and to abstract business logic, deliver value to customers. As much as it's fun to learn about performance optimizations, that's not something we want to be debugging constantly. And so computer properties are incredibly powerful for this. In fact, like if I were to say my single most like favorite feature of Vue, it's the computer property. Because it just takes away all the worry for me about what's happening, and it does so much work for me. Again, really easy. And it's particularly powerful um, if you do any data visualizations. You can imagine, right? You're doing all these SVG calculations based on a set group of data. You don't want to have to write the dependency chain that would update the SVG at this particular point, and then it swaps this way, or how it animates. Like All that can be managed basically with computer properties. And so some of the most elegant stores I've seen have like one source of truth inside of data, and then they compute everything else out. And it just it works really, really well um, because Vue can optimize all those things. I've talked a bit about computer properties and watchers. We're going to have you go ahead and play around with that. So for your exercise, you all have put a bunch of characters inside of your show. So you probably have certain attributes that you can put basically on those characters, right? Whether it's their age, height, whatever you want. But then based on those, like add those attributes to your characters, and then use a computer property to start generating some sort of statistics. So for example, mine is Avatar Last Airbender. I could be like, oh, OK, two of them are waterbenders, three of them are earthbenders, and then I can run computations on like the percentage that might be. Um, so just have a play around with that. It's one of those things where we'll be reusing a lot as we go forward. And so don't worry, you'll get plenty of opportunity to play around with that. Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope that you found that exercise with the computer properties kind of fun to play around with. But again, you'll get plenty of opportunity to practice that because I think it's one of the features we need to use more of and see more of in the ecosystem. So definitely we'll be pushing that. But during the exercise, there was a great question regarding the differences between computed and watch. Earlier in the example I showed, you noticed that the reason why I mentioned that the watch is not a great sort of technique in this particular case is because you're dealing with the reactive data. In other words, you're basically doing a computation that you're manually tracking. This is not to say that watch as a technique is invalid, however. What that really means is that when it comes to computing data, combining those things like we see up here with optimized increment amount, where you have multiple dependencies, computed will do a lot of work for you right out of the gate. And so that's when you want to do that. Anytime you're modifying something, returning it, and you want to be like, oh, I want to display something slightly different, and so actually, the question earlier regarding the strings and combining them, that would be an example where the character list, for example, could be like, let's say, um, comma separated. This is a bad name. But you could do something like this, dot character list, dot split. Like you could do your calculation in here and then just return that in the render thing, and that would already look good. So I will show that later when we're doing it. But to the main point I want to make, though, is that watch is really good for when you want to trigger a side effect on your code base. So in other words, you can imagine if you might want to have a specific API call when your reactive data has hit a certain state. That would be a great example of when computed wouldn't make any sense at all, because computed is about managing data, managing triggering actions, that kind of stuff. Watch is perfect for that kind of stuff. So just know that's the main paradigm difference between the two when it comes to using them. OK. So let's take a look at this example. So I'm going to go to my uh, let's go to my index to do the solution together. 
OK, so here, OK, I got my characters here. And this time, let's add a property. Let's call um, their element. And so I know that ang is air, earth, water, and fire. And we won't get into like SQL stuff for anyone who is an Avatar Last Airbender uh, fan. So we have fire. We won't worry about stuff like lightning and iron, uh, metal bending for now, and water. OK. So here we have all of our stuff here. And then for the sake of consistency, let's just make sure we go and add an element here. That's an empty array. Great. OK. So from here, we could do some, basically some, t some statistics, shall we? So for now, let's go ahead and actually add a h2 here for just characters. So this is consistent. There we go. Characters up top, favorite characters, new character. All right, and then actually, just like I did before, I'm going to go the most recent thing so that it's right at the top, which is easier for people to see. Let's talk about statistics. And so for something like statistics, we want to figure out, for example, like how many, let's talk about how many, uh, so for example, let's say how many earthbenders we have, and then we have how many airbenders, we have waterbenders, and then we have firebenders. OK, a couple ways to do this, but we'll start with the simple approach first which is that let's say we want to track the earthbenders, right? That was one of the ones I'd mentioned. So let me hide data real quick. So we're going to do, we're going to use a computed property because we're basically just computing data off of what we already have. So what we can do is we say earthbenders, uh, let's say earthbender list like that. And so return this dot character list and we're going to filter it uh, based on every character and basically we want to know if, uh, actually, let me do this a long way. If character dot element, and then I realize there are more than one, so maybe it's not name right, but it's fine. Dot element dot, I think contain should do the trick, earth. And then we are just going to actually, we'll do this one more, let's see. Return the filter. Oh, yeah, yep. Okay, we can do it this way if it contains element earth, and then return true. And then we're returning the length of this thing. So this is a little bit convoluted. I want to go ahead and refactor this real quick. So we can basically say that this is contains the earth vendors is what this filter does. It goes through all the characters, checks if they have it, and if they have it, then it returns true. So the easier way to actually write this is to return, since the logic is not complicated, we can actually just do it like this. Uh, one more. Do it. There you go. So there we go. And then do, 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 do. Once we have our earthbenders, we can return earthbenders. Uh, oh, actually, we could just return the list itself. I'm, I'm not actually over, overthinking this. OK, here we go. So to show that this actually does work, I'm going to go ahead and render out the earthbenders first. So earthbender list. Great. If we refrain, oh, something broke. Uh, contains, I miss what that is contains. Okay, that's fine. That contains always kind of throws me off. Greater than negative one. That should be. There we go. Much better. Okay, so we'll see here now is that it's gone ahead and taken our list of characters and it's refined it down to the array with only the characters that have, like the earth element. And so this, again, this is useful because then what we could do is we can say, OK, well, then in this case, we have like dot length. And there we go. We have the number of earthbenders. And so you could basically duplicate this down um, as far as doing each one. So I think, though, for the sake of making this a programmatic exercise, we can just say, um, see, bender statistics. And rather than break it up each time, we'll have, we know the list of elements we want. So we have our elements, which is going to be air, earth, fire, and water. And so what we can do is then actually just do, 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 do. We're going to return an object where each of these are going to contain like the updated value. That way it's easier to display. Uh, do, 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 water, and to fire. Okay. Finally, 
we will loop through every single element. So this dot character list dot for each for every character, and then uh, do, 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 if do, 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 do elements dot for each element. If character dot element do 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 dot index of the naming on this is gonna be a little wonky, and it's greater than negative one. Then we will say uh, const statistics equals this thing. So actually, you know what? I think I can do this one better. We can actually do, 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 do. We can say statistics of the element plus equals one. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes. So then we just need to make sure that is good. Just like that. And then we return Stat statistics. Okay, that should do the trick. I think. No, wait. If this missing a parentheses. Okay, that should do it. Your index of is still off. Index of. Oh, you're totally right. Index of element. That's what was off. Good call. Thank you. Okay. Now let's give this a shot. So if we just render out the statistics now, what do I call Bender statistics? Then we could say, dun, 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 dun. for each is not liking it, because I can't spell. There we go. So we can see here there's one of each. And the reason you get two here is because for those that don't know, Ang has all the different elements. So that's how we get that. And you can see we have those computed, um, that computed property. I see there's a question. Should we use reduce here and pass statistics object as a default parameter? <laughs> reduce is certainly an option. I just went with what was kind of easier to do since I know reduce can be kind of confusing sometimes for those who don't use it a lot. But reduce would be a great option in this point where we could reduce the array and get the numbers that we want. So, um, and for those who haven't used the reduce a lot in JavaScript, reduce can, it's pretty magical in that it can do basically everything that you would want it to do, but in that regard, the API can get a little bit complex sometimes. So that's why I don't, it's not my go-to when teaching these things. So definitely a number of ways to do this. To be clear, this was just like a quick code together of like how you could, you know, cobble together the statistics, but I'm sure there are um, many ways we could optimize for this. But I just wanted to show that here, now that we actually have everything, we can show that we can li and v4 through this bender list. So uh, I'll say st stat in bender statistics. And you'll see something interesting, though, is that in, if we just do this and just render out stat, you'll notice here that it's only rendering out the right side. And that's because, well, guess what? We're in a for loop for an object, and that's JavaScript. So that means that if we want the key as well, we need to actually just open it up because it's value, then key. So I would say type is probably what I would name that. And then that way, we can do type colon space refresh. There we go. We have all our elements, and it's being computed, um, as you would expect. And so as you can imagine, you can even extend on this to be like percentages and all that fun stuff. And you just keep building on your computer properties. And so what's nice about that, because computer properties can be composed, it allows you to approach it in basically kind of like a functional programming way. You code the very small chunk that does this one computation, then depend on another chain on that. And then that way, you have actually a very clean like, sort of uh, setup when it comes to managing those individual calculations. So uh, that said, does anyone have any questions regarding what they just saw? In real world projects, could you um, go through and describe a little bit on when you would use a computer to property versus a watcher. So the question here is around taking a more real world example of why computer properties would be advantageous over watchers. So in the example of a data visualization model, I think that still remains probably one of the better uh, examples of this. 
in that if you were to try and take a look at any sort of SVG animation out there, uh, chart. You'll know that for something like this, there are a lot of pieces that go into the computation of how this is being drawn. Right? It could be as simple as how big the pie chart is being drawn or what the data that goes into whether or not it's being filled, what color it might be. There's a lot that's happening here. And so if you try to watch all your dependencies in, like, individually, what people have found when they worked with sort of these larger code bases is that if they weren't careful with how they track their dependencies, they could trigger re-renders in their code when they didn't expect to. And, if, and we, for those who have had experience working on enterprise apps, there is almost no way you'll own the code base from end to end. So a lot of times you don't even know that someone is depending on the thing that you're talking, like you're writing for. And so, and so computed properties have the advantage of, because the chains are being tracked uh, basically explicitly via like, so, so okay, let me, let me go back. When you use computer properties, not only are you containing the dependencies, which I understand watch does do, like, because if we think about it, when we did watch, you have to actually define the initial value that you're watching. So in this case, what let's, it was character, let's say it was character list. And then on top of that, like, can you imagine what happens if you also, like, if this also had, like, this dot character list is dependent on this dot, let's see, what do I have? Favorite list? Like, once you start adding multiple things, especially when you're receiving data from an API, it becomes really difficult to start tracking where everything is. And so computer properties, because you can basically just throw all your dependencies inside of a single compute function, it has the algorithm that's required for you to automatically like do all the performance optimizations and caching that you would want to do. I think that's the best way I could explain it at this point. And so remember, the key thing here is not that watch is bad, is that watch is good for triggering side effects. And computed, it's, like, it's kind of like when you import Lodash and you do a debounce function on an API call because you're afraid users will click. Like, Imagine computed has like a debounce built in so that things don't automatically trigger, like it knows how to protect you from those things. That's the advantage of computed. And so I know that we've gone through all this and some of you might be thinking, well, who builds web apps this way, right? Because after all, like every sort of modern tech stack you'll see always talks about build tools and that kind of thing. And to be honest, like progressive enhancement is very much a thing that continues to exist to this day, even though it's not talked about a lot, right? Code read writes are very sexy. But the truth is, when you're dealing with enterprise systems, it's just not realistic to stop everything, that we, as we talked about before, and write new features. But dropping in the CDN with Vue, having it progressively enhanced, that all works. Because we, we're not going to cover it at this point, because we're going to move into build tools. But a lot of these things we're seeing here, they can be just abstracted into .js files, right? You can actually modularize your code. You can do a lot, actually, and make a fairly robust app. It doesn't have to all live inside of this single option, like this single object that I've shown you all. That's just a way for us to keep it all as a mental model. But eventually, you can break it out, import JS into here, use it. Like it can still scale pretty darn well. And so this image here, um, which I love, is like the cake. That then you get the frosting. Then you get the candles, right? And so the credit here is to Tiffany Say. Um, this is our blog post on what is progressive enhancement and why should you care. So definitely something that I do think modern web developers need to consider uh, when it comes to the realities of upgrading their code base. And so uh, this is a smashing uh, article magazine by Sarah Drasner, uh, who used to be on the Vue core team. And this is a great one because the title of this is Replacing jQuery with Vue.js, No Build Step Necessary. And this is also a very valid way of using Vue. It's like, if you know that only one page in your entire app, like, because you're statically generating it, so everything's on the server side, but only one could use some interactivity, don't even need jQuery anymore. You could literally just drop Vue, because I believe the CDN side is either roughly the same, if not, if Vue is not slightly lower at this point. But that is actually a viable option now. You don't need to even approach Vue as a framework. It can be just little bits of interactivity that are sprinkled in an app. And finally, again, people are always skeptical. They're like, well, who's actually done it this way? Well, GitLab did it this way. GitLab used to actually be a Ruby on Rails app. It was super, and so if anyone works with Ruby on Rails, you know that, especially back then, integrating node-based tool chains into that was extremely painful. And so, again, and also they needed to ship features, right? And this was before they went public. They, they had customers. They needed to meet the needs. So they couldn't stop everything and go, yeah, Rails is kind of outdated. We really would love to use a framework, so let's stop building stuff. They couldn't do that. 
So what did they do? I can't, I'm trying to remember actually which page it was. Um, I knew someone who was on the team that did this. They actually, I, let's just, for example, they had the sign-in page. And they said on the sign-in page, let's add view as a CDN. And let's just like add interactivity. And once they proved that that worked well, they went, okay, next one. What's like something we can hit that's like fairly low impact performance wise that we can do? And I think the, there was another one that they did. And they basically, that's what they did. They slowly added new features to the customer base while progressively migrating their app to view. And then eventually when they had the, basically the, the tipping point of like, they had so much code in view that it made sense to like, let's take a couple weeks to like refactor our code to actually use the node tooling to like bring it all in. That's when they actually did that, but they proved their case rather than trying to just tell product, hey, just stop, we have this wonderful idea that if anyone has done ever a massive you know, app refactory, you know, it often doesn't go quite as planned and then deadlines get pushed, but they, they were able to realistic do that. And so that's how GitLab is now running on Vue now. And so the reason I wanted to emphasize this method is because it's something that I think is often overlooked when people are thinking about recommending solutions to clients. And it's something that I want people to know about. So whenever you're working for someone or you think that this could be a good approach, you now know that this is here for you. So we've talked about CDNs, we've talked about working with just the index.html, but most projects are not going to be run that way. That's just the reality. Most people have bought in fully to the tool chain system, and so it's time that we did so too. For those who come from the Vue 2 ecosystem, you're probably used to scaffolding your app with Vue CLI. But there's been a new kid on the block in terms of the whole Webpack build tool chain, and if you haven't heard about it, it's called Vite. And one of the great things about Vite, basically what you need to know is that it's a bundler underneath that's helping to push sort of like front end tooling to use more ES modules. Uh, basically it helps to make apps more performant. And it, what's really nice about Vite though as well is that even though um, Evan Yu, the creator of Vue, is um, one of the founders of the Vite technology, it's a multi-framework tooling. And so it's really nice to see a lot of frameworks starting to gather around it. And so for anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff and want to see like helping to create plugins so that other frameworks can leverage that, Vite is doing a very good job as far as bringing the community together. But because of all these performance optimizations though, Vue CLI currently still uses the Webpack and so it basically is being deprecated in favor of the Create View, which is the new basically equivalent of Vue CLI. And for this one, this has Vite powering it underneath. And so this is where the shift is. So going forward, if you're creating a new Vue 3 app and you have the luxury of using Vite underneath, Create View is the basically recommended way going forward. So let's go ahead and create a project and see what that looks like, shall we? To do that, we're going to run the command npm create Vue 3 inside of our project. So I'm going to go ahead and just close some of this off now. And let's go ahead and open this up. Um, npm create view at three. And so one of the things that's really nice about the modern built tool chains these days is that you don't have to install a massive CLI on your computer only to use it a couple times, maybe like a year or something. It's kind of being called on the fly because npm knows, oh, you want to temporarily install something? I'll basically bring down the package, I'll use it, and after that, I won't, it won't be on your machine anymore. So for this one, I'm just going to call mine sandbox right now because I want to show you all what kind of what's inside, and then you all will have an opportunity to create your own building on what we've been doing today. All right, so we, I've named it uh, sandbox. And so at first glance, you see at TypeScript. Your first glance, um, your first impression might be, oh, I'm definitely not using TypeScript, hit no. I'm going to say hit yes. And the short reason for that is because when Vue gives you the option to add the TypeScript, what it's saying is it's not saying you have to use TypeScript. It's saying we're going to configure everything so that if you ever choose to use TypeScript, it's really easy. No configuration needed kind of bit. There'll be one or two lines of code we'll add to make it um, basically like ignore any TypeScript errors. But one of the things that I found that's really painful when it comes to code migrations is that people who want to start sprinkling in TypeScript, usually the build tool chain is what blocks them from doing that. Because they're like, oh, I just want to try types. And then it's like, oh, you have to look at this config file, and then you have to do a TS config. And then by the time they've learned, like that obstacle that's getting started can be super expensive. And so um, if you didn't know, there's a Vue 3 and TypeScript workshop that I did, so you can watch that um, separately. But generally speaking, what, what I'm saying here is that this is great for code bases in the sense that like, you can only have one, if, if one person wants to use types on one file, they can. You don't have to enforce it on across the entire code base. And that's the benefit of having that configured. 
as you can see here, JSX support, this is something I do want to address, especially for those coming from the React background, is that you can use JSX with Vue. You've been seeing us do a lot with native HTML, but just know that if you really love JSX and you don't want to use native HTML, you can still do that. Uh, but personally, I do find it's, it's advantageous to use native HTML, but just know that Vue can totally support that if that's something you prefer. Uh, we're not going to worry about Vue Router right now or Pinia, and we're not doing any end-to-end, -end, but sure, let's add ESLint and Prettier. And so for those who are new to the tools uh, chain space, ESLint is basically, and Prettier are ways to standardize how your code is formatted and how it looks. So things like you know, whether tabs are two spaces, four spaces, or actual tabs, semicolons, those sort of things, that's how you kind of can enforce consistency across your code base. So let's take a look at what's actually in here. So inside of my sandbox directory, you now see a standard view project um, that's scaffolded in Vite. So a couple of things here. One, we have a source directory, which is fairly standard on front-end front -end client framework apps these days. We have a public directory, which is going to be what's served basically to users. So basically, think of the public directory as the build tools will not do anything to it. It will just be bundled with your code when you serve it. So basically, no asset optimization, none of that. And then what we can see here as well is we have an index.html. And this is where you can see actually how your, co your code is basically being built. In the sense that like if you want to drop Google font libraries, it's as simple now as coming into your index.html file and just dropping in your link to your style sheets, whatever you need. And then here we can see we have our div app as well. And then script type module here, main.ts. And this main.ts refers to this file inside of our source directory. And so you can see, this should look actually pretty familiar. We're importing the create app helper method from Vue, and then we're creating an app with that, and then we're mounting it to the div ID right here. And so that's where you see that inside of index. Actually, let me split this window so that we can get them side by side. So there we go. This is where these two are talking to each other. And then you'll notice that we're also importing some CSS as well. And I'll talk more to this in a little bit. OK, so to show you just that everything works, let me go ahead and go inside of the sandbox. And I'm going to install the dependencies by running npm install. OK. So while we're doing that, what I'd like people to do is if you look up view dev tools on your browser, you should uh, basically get a, basically, whether it's Chrome, uh, Firefox should have it as well. You should get an extension that you should be able to install here. So Vue.js dev tools, you'll see it has about 1,800 at the time of this recording. And so you'll want to install this, because this is what's actually showing up here. So if you click on your extensions, um, you can go ahead and pin it if it's, not, if it's hidden right now for you. Because we'll be using that to explore what the Vue DevTools does for us when it comes to looking at a Vue project. OK. So inside of here, we can see everything is running now. So if we look at package.json now, and see what commands do we have available to us. Well, we have the ability to dev, OK? And then there's a bunch of TypeScript stuff. We're not even going to worry about that right now. So npm run dev. All right, great. And let's open that up. There we go. As we can see, this is your Hello World view application. Now, when we take a look now, you'll notice that the dev tools, if you have that installed, will actually go ahead and light up. And so if you open up your console now, and you go into the drop down, or if you have a really wide monitor, you might already see it, but mine's hidden since it's a little bit bigger, and click on view, you'll see that here we go. We have the dev item, basically, our entire app now is able to be inspected inside of here. So what we're seeing here is basically we're starting to introduce the idea of components, right? Components-driven development is really popular in today's um, modern front-end frameworks. And so as you would expect, Vue certainly supports components, and we'll be doing a lot more with that now that we have the build tool chaining uh, supported. So what's cool about this is that you can see as you click on the different components, it'll, it'll actually tell you a little bit about it. And so you can see that, oh, yes, here in the welcome, there's a bunch of stuff being set up. The hello world here has a message. Like, we'll be using this a lot to inspect what's going on underneath the component. So definitely keep this in mind when we start to move forward on other things. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and port over the playground that I had made. And we're going to go ahead and actually use that to create the app so it's kind of show you what's going on. So the main thing to understand here is that inside of the main.ts, you'll see here inside of this app view. And so dot view files are the bread and butter of, of one of the reasons why I think Vue also got really popular. And so these are called single file components. And so they're single file components because, well, they have a lot going on. What you might notice, though, is that none of my syntax highlighting is working. 
And the reason for that is because you need to actually enable a VS Code extension. And the one that I recommend, um, actually it's kind of the standard actually, is uh, Volar, V-O-L-A-R. So if you're using VS Code, go ahead and install that on your, um, on your machine while you're, while you're at it. So I'm going to go ahead and enable mine. And it does a ton of stuff for you. Honestly, there could probably be a half-day lecture just on Volar alone. But know that it helps you out with syntax highlighting and a couple of other things as well. OK. So inside of app.view, you might notice this looks actually pretty, should look pretty familiar to you. In the sense that, OK, we have this, this part here, this template. This is HTML. Um, and this template element, believe it or not, is actually built on a standard in HTML. The template element is actually a built-in thing to HTML. It's not just a view thing. But basically, it says, hey, this is the HTML that I'm managing in this specific file. The script block is what you expect. Here's the JavaScript that I'm managing. And here, we even have a style block, and that's to manage all the CSS. And so as you can see, the reason why it's called single file components is because it basically allows you to scope all the things that you care about into a single file. And that might sound like, oh, what's so special about that? But we have to remember, prior to this, a lot of times what people were doing is they would have an app.html, for example, for the template. They'd have an app.js for the JavaScript. And then they have an app.css for the CSS. And to some extent, like, there's nothing wrong with that architecture. But for a lot of us who, enjoy, like, especially when you're navigating back between files, it's actually really helpful just to have it all in one place. Um, and that's at least that's what I found in my experience. Now, granted, there's nothing stopping you from choosing your own adventure. So these, all these blocks here, they're optional. So I can delete this, and we can just imp we can just have we can only use the template and the script. And the other thing that um, people often misunderstand when it comes to single file components as well is that the script, template, and style blocks are just what's default out of the box. There are, pe there are actually other libraries and plugins that utilize things like a docs plugin. And so it'll use a docs tag wrapper, and then basically whatever you document there will be associated with that specific component. And so really, it's, it's actually an open canvas for people's imaginations when it comes to how they might want to scope how information is being managed across their code base. Do, 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 do. All right. So let's go ahead and migrate some stuff over, shall we? So I'm going to go ahead and open up my playground here. Let's do that and then switch that over here. All right, let me zoom out a little bit. So I think it's a little bit harder to wait. Can I zoom in? Yeah, that's a little bit harder to read. Here we go. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this boilerplate stuff. Uh, you all will understand how this works uh, by the end of the workshop, so don't worry there. But this way, we keep it simple. We have a script block. We have a template block. In other words, our JavaScript and our HTML. So what we can do here is we can basically copy in our HTML here, bum, 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 all the way down to the div. And we're going to go ahead and drop it inside of our template. OK, a lot of things are going to be breaking right now, and that's totally fine. Because what we've got to do, we've got to copy all this data that we have here. So we have a bunch of stuff inside of here, and we're just going to copy all of it. Or in this case, I'm cutting it. The main difference, in tactically speaking, though, is that what we got to do is rather than saying, like, create app here, because the app has already been created, we basically are saying, let's export the object that we're going to be using. So in other words, here is the specific object that will reflect the JavaScript for this file. There we go. OK. So what we see here, we're back to the point where we have our data here. We have all the stuff that we just copy pasted, and we have our template. So we see some stuff yelling at us. Yep, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And so let's see if this actually did anything for us. So you'll notice, whoo, OK, our data is there. It's just super messy. The reason it's super messy is because we have uh, do, 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 inside of our main.ts. You saw earlier we have this main CSS. We're going to wipe that out. Because right now, we just want to work with standard things and make sure everything's just working. And so sure enough, there we go. We have our app, and it's up and running. OK. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to address here is that you'll notice now, before we weren't getting any sort of errors when we did the index.html way, because basically Volar and these sort of extensions allow us to basically identify common problems that people sort of, or mistakes that they make when it comes to this stuff. And so you'll notice here we got these error messages here because it's saying, that whenever we iterate through an element, is expected to have a vbind key directive. And so what does that mean exactly? 
Well, basically, when you're having the frameworks track the elements that they're looping through, it's good to give them some sort of identifier so that they know whether or not something's changed or not. Without that identifier, you basically run the risk of relying solely on the data to like, figure out what's working. And when, especially when it comes to animation, you will, it'll bite you in the butt constantly. And so typically, what people do then is they will do the vbind directive, because the key needs to be a unique key for everything. And so we can also shortcut this as well to just like this, v key. And then we can do something as simple as, for example, I sometimes will just take out the index. And I'll say I will do a eslint string, the, or sorry, the es6 string. And I'll go item dash index, for example. And so this here then basically provides a custom key. Now, most of the time when you're working with databases, hopefully you have UUIDs and that kind of thing to populate it. But for the sake of like sort of demoing this at the moment, this is how we could fulfill this requirement by basically creating our own key. So you'll see here, it notices that this is, um, I think, identical to the other one. But index, oh, it doesn't. So there you go, number, number index, great. What does it not like about it? Oh, it'll format it. OK, there we go. And just like that, we have our app now working inside of the build tool chain. This is the final bit that I was talking about. Remember how I was talking about where we've enabled TypeScript, but you don't have to use it? The main thing here is that you'll notice Volar is basically saying, hey, I thought we were in TypeScript. What's going on? So what you got to do here is go into your tsconfig.json. And under the compiler options, we can allow JS to true. And that will basically prevent it from yelling at us anymore if we don't use TypeScript. But on the other hand, if anyone ever does use TypeScript, it's just going to work magically. Um, and all the configurations already work. Oh, yes, go. Is there, if you have an existing project, would you probably not recommend trying to vitifize it? Uh, so the question here is around if you have an existing project that already works, whether or not to switch it over to Vite. Honestly, I, most of the people who've switched to Toolchain have found very little difference in terms of like, it's not like other build tools where like something usually major breaks. So I guess a lot of it boils down to actually your dependencies. I would take a look at that. If you have a lot of dependencies that rely on some, some sort of Webpack build, then in that case, Vite might be a little premature. But if it's a more evergreen project where it has like standard JavaScript stuff that it's um, JavaScript libraries installing that might already have ESM support for ES modules, then that would be a great case for like, let's just try and see what happens because the performance improvements that people are experiencing on Vite are pretty significant. And so it's Honestly, it's worth, um, it's worth like an hour time box effort just to see if you can improve the DX on that regard. So to kind of review what just happened, because I know um, that was a lot. So we went ahead and scaffolded a brand new project using the create view CLI, which created this entire playground directory. And then the key thing here is that inside of our index.html, we can see here that we are getting our view stuff from this source main.ts. That's how you're going to follow this. And so inside of main.ts, this is where we can see, ah, uh, yes, this is where we're mounting it to the app. And then more importantly, that create app, right? If we look back at our app right here inside of Playground, remember how we passed this object here? This object now has been exported out into its own file. So that's what I was talking about in terms of modularity. So this app now, so then to continue that line of thought, to open it here, this object that we see here that we're exporting, this object is actually what's being dropped in here. So that's how those three things are being connected. And this is also one of the, why, one of the reasons why build tools can be super confusing, because there are a lot of moving pieces to it. And so to just sort of dive right in, get your feet wet, what we're going to do for this exercise is go ahead and create a brand new project with create view inside of our directory that we've already been using. And this time, you're going to rename it to whatever your show name dash forum. So in my case, it'll be like avatar last airbender dash forum. And then we're going to migrate the stuff that we've been doing inside of index.html into app.view. For those that haven't upgraded their node version in a while, if you're on anything less than 16, uh, basically, V doesn't play that well with some of the older versions because some of the modern libraries are actually basically have moved on. And so just so, again, this will probably be outdated by the time, because uh, Node moves very quickly. But the latest stable version is actually 18 at the moment. So it's one of those things where if you feel like the versions are moving quickly, don't worry. It's not just you. But if you're having issues with V, please go ahead to, to upgrade to at least 16. 
Um, if you're having version, because um, I know some people had issues with uh, bit support, like 32-bit, 64-bit support when it comes to 18. So something to consider if you're running into that problem. So let's go ahead and run through that migration once more. And this time, I'll do it with my TV show that I selected. So let's go ahead and do this. So what we're going to do first is we're going to create our new app. So I'm going to do npm create view at 3. And the reason you want the at 3 at the moment is because you can technically do at 2 as well. I think at some point, there probably will be a default version switch so that npm create view will do its thing. But for now, I, it's always safe to just go ahead and add the 3. So for me, um, my TV show is Avatar Last Airbender, but that's a lot to type out. So I'm just going to use the acronym, since most people know it, which is ATLA for Avatar The Last Airbender. And this is the forum app for it. Uh, for now, I'll just disable TypeScript, just because this is mainly for demo purposes. But like I said, when it comes to any sort of app you intend to scale, it's worth spending the time to just configure TypeScript, add that one liner to your TS config to allow for JavaScript. And once you do that, you basically can ignore it until one day you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try types on this one file, and then easy peasy. No JXX. We're not going to worry about view router for now. I know there were some questions regarding like a standard view project. We will be spending time on view router. So typically, you probably would select yes for this in the event you're planning to scale out your app. But in this case, don't want to conflate the pages right now, and it would be kind of confusing. So no. Same thing with Pinio for state management. Not going to worry about testing. And for either of those, and then the main two I would say yes to is ESLint and Prettier. That's it. As you can see here, we have a new directory here. And so if we do ls, we can see there you go, LTA, L, ATLA forum. And then if I go and change directories into it, we'll see now, boom. We have everything that we would expect as far as like your public directory, your source directory that contains uh, your app.view component, and then all the different configuration files and build stuff that you need. So I'm going to go ahead and just npm install for that and let that run. In the meantime, we can go ahead and just migrate. Because the npm install, what it's doing is it's allowing us to set up a local dev server, which I didn't cover earlier, but we'll explain basically where the benefits of it now that we're starting to play around with it. So let me go ahead and close all this real quick. I need this app.view. OK, split. OK. There we go. And then this one, we need to open up my index.html. And there we go. OK. So when it comes to migration, the first thing first we'll notice at the top is we did customize this title piece. And normally, in some other build tools um, and I have experienced in the past, you have to go through a bit of work to change that. But it's actually fairly easy to do. Because inside of our project, you'll notice we also have an index.html here. And guess what? Here is our title. So rather than just being vdat, I'm just going to copy over my avatar last airbender and replace that. And there we go. We've customized that. Next, we have everything that's inside of this app div. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, knowing that I'm going to have a default wrapper that I'll remove. So we'll go ahead and delete all this stuff inside of template, because this is where our HTML is going to live. So if I paste here, you'll see here that everything's looking good. We have some errors that we can deal with later. But we can go ahead and delete that ID app, because we don't need that div anymore. And save that. And then, as you can see, Prettier is automatically re-indenting everything for us, which is super nice. Then we won't worry about yelling at us at the moment. We'll go ahead and clean up the JavaScript, because this stuff, we're not worried about it right now. And then we will also delete all the styles here, because that's not relevant to us either. OK. So finally, the last thing we need to do, though, is we need to copy all this JavaScript that we wrote into our script block. So the way we do that is let's take the entire object here, cut that. And then inside of here, we're going to export this as a default object and just paste that in. Nothing else has changed. We have our entire view app now, logic-wise, inside of here at the top. And then the last thing we need to change here is to add the key. So I'm just going ahead and just do a quick dynamic key. So bender, and then just do a stat. So for objects, it's tricky because you don't get an index. So I usually just end up tagging in all of the things. So you can see here, bender, stat, type. That should prevent it from duplicating. OK. Then let's just quickly do that as well. This will be a character dash index, which we will get by opening up the second argument inside of this for list. 
And then same thing for here. So actually, this is interesting. We have an else if here that's doing even. So for the sake of argument, let's just do even character like that. And then I can copy this. And so inside of here, we, that way we basically guarantee that even though these characters, these things could display, um, at the same time, they will have different keys. So that way, there will be no conflict. And then we need to actually fetch the index from this. So let's actually split that out as well. There we go. Oh, looks like I have a couple more to do. Oh, gosh. There is a lot in here. Let's call this a comma list. And then there we go. And then the else there are odd characters has no adjacent if. What? Oh, I know why. OK, so this is a fun error. So I actually didn't realize this has been broken the whole time. So this is one of the advantages of using build tools is because if we look at this error message, it says v else v else if has no adjacent v if v else if. Because if we actually look here, the next element right next to it, its sibling, is actually just a normal p element. Um, through the course of like me messing around, at some point, I basically moved it way too far from its original check. And so if we look here, this is actually where it belongs. It actually belongs up here. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this out. So again, just like spell check when you're writing papers, with, with build tools so like uh, Volar and extensions, it can make life a lot easier to catching those kind of errors so that you're not like, wait, where did everything go? So these weren't caught before because the plugin just couldn't build it? or um, At the time, I will say I actually had it disabled. So it possible it might have caught it, but at the same time, it can be tricky sometimes because you have to make sure it can detect that the view language is being run. So that I'm less confident that the extension would actually pick up on it inside of an index.html, but something worth trying later on um, just to kind of see if that works. OK, so to make sure this works, um, we're not going to save the changes to this, but this is good. We are going to go ahead and run this, npm run dev. Here we go. And we can see a lot of things are broken, and the reason it's broken is because why? Inside of our main.js, we are importing a main CSS. And we don't want all that styles right now. So there we go. Now it looks exactly as we expect. We can favorite stuff just like we did before. Our statistics show up. This looks good. OK. Does anyone have any questions about the migration overall? I know it's kind of a lot to go from the index.html to this. But uh, it's one of those things where I think once you get used to it, and more importantly, most of the time you won't be in an index.html file and moving over to build, you will basically be starting here. And we'll basically start getting more practice with how we work in this particular environment going forward. And so something else I did want to cover, though, before we move on to the next section, is why do, we, wh why do we go through all this process, right? We talked a lot about builds, optimizations. But one of the things that we have an advantage of when we have a local dev server is what's called hot module reloading. So as we can see here, inside of app.view, I noticed that actually my statistic doesn't have a heading. And so in the past, when we were coding earlier, you might have noticed I would have to add my changes. I'd have to switch, or I'd have to save it inside of VS Code, and then I'd have to update it inside of the browser. Well, you might have noticed that I didn't even switch context, and Vite's already updated the, the browser to have all my latest changes. So that in the event, it was like, oh, stat times two. I can save that. You can see like it's almost, it's super fast to the point where sometimes you might even realize that your code has changed. And that's the kind of thing that Vite has done to help as far as like performance things is because now when you make changes on your code, it's nearly instantaneous as far as seeing the results of that. So that has been pretty cool as far as like a DevX goes. But in case you ever feel like this is why sometimes I make large changes because once again, this times two bit, if you're not paying attention, you won't even realize this updated. So anyhow, that's something to note when it comes to working with this. So if you're not using Vite, you can't use the dot .view way of breaking these things up? Or is that? Oh, you can. Vite is just the bundler underneath. So um, that's why Vue CLI allowed you to, wait, when you say break it up via the view, you mean like via dot .view files? Yeah, they have a dot .view file. Oh, so that's not specific to Vite. Webpack was able to do that too. That's how we were doing it in Vue 2 beforehand. Vite is just like making the dependencies a lot faster to load. That kind of stuff. It actually doesn't have anything to do with view specifically. OK. So the yeah. dot view way of doing it is that's you could do that with any kind of yeah. package. OK. Mm -hmm. And we're about to do more of that in just uh, actually in this section. We've been talking about single file components. And it's really time for us to really start diving into it. Because what we've really done is basically moved our entire app from index.html into app.view 
But this code is, there's a lot going on here, right? Um, especially because there's a lot of logic. And more importantly, things could be scoped kind of differently. So it's time to really dive into component-driven development at this point. OK, so for what I'm going to do here, I'm going to delete all the boilerplate inside of our code base here so that we're not dealing with any boilerplate. And so let me go ahead and refactor that real quick. Factor, delete, boilerplate components. OK. So now let's talk about how we actually create components in Vue. As we mentioned, single file components are basically the way to go. So let's start with something like the, let's start with something simple. Actually, I'm in the wrong directory for this. Let's go back to the playground, because that's the, we'll use the exercise for that. OK. Inside of my playground, let's take a look at this one. So now, now that we're actually in the build tool, though, I need to actually make sure I run the right one. So I'll go back to my playground app and run dev. And so now that we're running it, there we go. We see that it automatically refreshed without me doing anything. So it's great. We have the update. All right. So let's take a look at what's going on inside of our app here. There is a lot. We've played around with different concepts. We talked about lists of numbers. We talked about this increment thing. So basically, let's start with the simplest thing, which is that we have a counter component. That's like the easiest thing that we could split off from this at this point. And so what we can do then is we can say, OK, let's go into the components folder, and let's create a new one called counter.view. OK? So I'm going to go ahead and full screen this so that it's easier to see, since we don't actually need to see the live updates right now. When you're creating a new component, basically we have our basic building blocks, we have our script block, and we have our template block. We don't have any custom styling right now, so I'm not going to add anything. And so let's start moving some stuff over. So what I would do is I would actually start by saying, OK, so inside of my script block, I will export a default object, because this is what I'm configuring. And so inside of my data, what do we have that we want to migrate over? Well, we care about the count, so that looks good. The counter title, yeah, that sounds good too. And we care about the increment amount. This is good. And then that's list of numbers not relevant. OK. Oh, OK, we have some computer properties that's relevant for display title and optimize increment amount. So actually, none of this is related to anything else, right? Because we have the count, which is here. We have the display title, which is here. And the increment amount is here. So meaning we can take this whole block, actually, and just cut that from the app.view. And then we can put it here. And then finally, we have this increment count method that we're using. And we're actually not even using the watch. So we can actually delete this. And we can cut the method's entire block over. And then what you'll see that we end up having here is that we have all of our logic now scoped to the counter, right? Nothing that's irrelevant to it is kept to it. And this is great, right? And to be clear, this is not a view thing. Like React, Angular, we've all been basically thinking this way as far as like keeping our concerns scoped to the same file so that's easier for people to understand. You don't have to jump files as much. Now, of course, we've got to make sure we move all the stuff that's related, though, to the counter app when it comes to this HTML. So we have that here, 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 here. I think I mostly organized it together, so there's not too much mystery there. And so I can cut all that and just drop it over here inside of the template. And so what you get here now is we have our scoped JavaScript and HTML. And so now it's a time where we actually kind of want to see what's going on inside of the app. And so if we take a look, you'll notice our counter app is gone. And that's to be expected, because we've already moved everything. But what we haven't done is we haven't actually called our component. So how does that actually work? Well. Just like standard JavaScript, what we want to do is we want to basically import our component. So we want to import our counter component. Where are we importing it from? Well, we're going to move up a directory, because right now we're in app.view. We're going to move, oh, wait, counter is in the wrong one right now. It needs to move down here. OK, so we have our app.view. And where are we going to imp we're going to import counter. And so this is following the file path directory, where we have the root directory, which is this flat one right here. We're going to go up into components. And then we're going to import counter.view. That's what we're going to do. You'll notice that our extensions are yelling at us, because why is saying, hey, you imported something. You never, ever used it. And so the way we actually register a component inside of Views Option API is, well, there is an aptly called components option where we can basically register our counter, just like that. 
and then uh, your methods is inside of your computed encounter. Computed. Oh yeah, you're totally right. Um, so the observation was pointed out here that my methods, when I copy and pasted, was copy pasted at the wrong point. So we should actually move this out. There you go. Now that looks much better. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh yeah, that's another thing we'll talk about in a, in a second. Okay, there we go. We have counter. This is good. And then now we need to actually use it. How to use it? Well, it's a custom component. So whatever we named it, uh, basically, we'll do the trick. And so there we go. There's our counter component. A uh, couple things that might be new if you haven't really worked with components before is that this is what's called a self-closing tag. So this is the equivalent of doing this. It's just it's a little bit more succinct because you know rather than duplicating it over, um, it's fairly common to just self-enclose like this. In addition, something else that Vue tries to get you to do, though, before we talk more about this, is you'll notice that earlier I had this error, which is from ESLint, in that we really try to recommend that you use multi-word component names. And the reason for that is because you never know when the HTML spec is going to add something. And they basically have, you know, they get first dibs when it comes to one-word components. So rather than basically run the risk of conflicting that, what I, I might do instead is I might go, I might call this like base counter. Right? If this is like the, the counter to rule all um, components. And so you'll notice here, though, that Volar, hey, it says, I noticed you're refactoring some stuff. And then you say, oh, what, are you, what did you notice? And it says, look, I noticed that inside of here, you actually, like, it'll actually track the file path of the things that it's related to, which is pretty cool. So I can go ahead and apply that. And now you'll see that inside of app.view, it's gone ahead and actually renamed it correctly inside of my imports, which is a nice optimization that it does for us. But once again, I really would like to avoid the single word uh, naming. So I'm just going to do that like that. And then you'll see everything still works as expected. But another thing that Vue does for you in terms of extending upon HTML standards is you might not like the Pascal case, which is where you have the multi-word capitalized. And you might say, I would rather just do like the standard kebab case for HTML. And believe it or not, that actually just works. Vue will, out of the box, basically allow you to convert between the two cases because it knows that, basically, it knows how to track the differences. And so to say which one is better uh, depends a lot on the team that you're working with. I would say, in terms of pros and cons, one of the nice things about the Pascal case is that it becomes very evident that this is something very specific to the app, um, that this is like something custom. Granted, if you're using a multi-word component, that also kind of does the, the job as well. So it's just kind of what you're used to um, in that regard. You have a question? Does the inverse of that work? Can you name the file kebab case? Uh, I should be able to. Let's give that a shot. Oh, so the question was, can we name the file kebab case? Like that. And then what did it change? Well, here we go. It noticed that we have applied that. So we can apply that. And then inside of here, we're good. Inside of here, this we can't do anything about because this is the this is like an import. And then I think that actually still works. Yep, that still works. The main thing about that is be consistent. That's the only thing I ask. Doesn't matter which one you choose, just be consistent. Now that we've done that, we have the first component. Uh, Let's go ahead and let you all play around with creating your own components from your app. So the exercise here is to basically go inside of your forum app, so whether it's you know the office or community or whatever, and then look at your index.html file and go, OK, I want to create some components out of this. How will I do it? And to give some preface as well, you will run into a limitation pretty quickly as far as things that you'll want to do with it. But I want to just get you in the practice of creating some .view files. And just know that it won't fun it'll functionally be broken until we get back together. But I just want to get, get you all in the habit of practicing that. Does that sound good? So you basically try scoping, like bringing stuff together. Um, let's see how that goes. OK. Welcome back, everyone. So hopefully you all had some fun creating components. But I was kind of walking around and checking out uh, how people were doing you probably ran into a problem basically as you started migrating stuff because a lot of your code is dependent on one another. And so you might have noticed that when you started moving stuff that it was like being like, wait, where's this thing you referenced to? And like had trouble talking to each other. So let's go ahead and show you what I mean by that. So let me start by opening up my app.view 
for my Avatar Last Airbender. And so, as we can see here, we have a couple sections here that could really make sense. If we see a bunch of H2s, they could make sense as components, to be totally honest. As far as like, these are the characters, this is the character list. And so let's actually try something as simple as that. Let's go ahead and start by, inside of our components, let's create a character list dot view. OK, and I'm going to bring this over. And then we have our script block that we're going to have. And we're going to have our template block. This time, I'm going to flip it a bit. And we're going to start by bringing over all the HTML. So the H2 up until this point is all to do with the characters. OK? So if we save that, a lot of stuff is going to be missing, but that's totally fine. And let's just say placeholder for character list. And then up here, this is where it gets a little bit tricky now. OK, what do we want to do? Well, we know that character list here is relevant. So let's start by exporting a default object, because this is the object that defines our app. And so character list is here. Great. Let's do that. Oh, so, so whoops, I need my data property. And then I can put my character list in here. Awesome. And then let's see. What else do we got? Well, we have that. Yep, length. This looks pretty good. Actually, this looks pretty good. Oh, actually, here. We have a favorite character. OK. How do we do that? Let's see. Let's go here. Ah, uh, yes, we have a method here for favorite character. So I'm just going to copy the whole block knowing that I would delete the add new character. And this is probably what you started doing. And then you're like, oh, yes, there's also the this.favorite list. And then we're like, OK, let's add that to here, favorite list. And then we save. And then you're thinking, OK, great. I'm going to import character list from components.characterList.view. OK, that's that. And then you're like, I'm going to re register my component at character list, just like that. OK. And then, whoops, this needs to be renamed properly. And then you probably came in and was like, OK, I'm going to try to call my character list component inside of here. Now, if we take a look at what's happening here, let me go ahead and close this. And then we're going to go ahead and get out of this, go over to our Atla forum, run that dev. Great. You're probably going to realize very shortly that nothing is working. Anyone have any guesses as to why nothing is working? Because your parent app relies on the character list for the vendor statistics. OK, so um, as we can see here, we actually are relying on inside of app.view. Sorry, let, let's, I technically moved this at this point. We're actually trying to reference this character list property. But you notice it's gone. And this is what I was mentioning earlier. When you have components scoped, the, da the data are scoped to the component. It's not scoped to the entire app. So in other words, this whole character list component, which I made based on impulse, actually, if we think about data flow, it's the wrong way. Because the character list is actually at the pr is basically at the top. That's the thing that serves everything else. So let's rethink that over again. Because what we really want is the ability to have the app pushed down into a child's components, right? Single direction data flow is a very big topic these days because it helps to basically ensure that things are easier to track. I know that was one of the initial blowbacks when it came to two-way binding, is that people were confused about which way data was flowing. But that doesn't make two-way data binding like wrong uh, in and of itself, right? We can see that when it's done in an encapsulated way that's easy to understand, it's great. But when it comes to long data flows, we found as an industry that unidirectional data flow, basically from top down, is like keeping that consistent for the most part has been very helpful for making things maintainable and easier to uh, basically work on. OK, so actually, what I've done here as an exercise is an exercise in futility. So I'm going to go ahead and clear these changes. And we're going to go ahead and take a look how we should be thinking about character, like componentizing our app. So I can go ahead and delete this. And then we can refresh the app now. OK, everything should be working. Oh, I think I made everything crash. OK, refresh. OK, everything's good. OK, 
So the way to think about components is really the component tree. Again, your app.view is at the very top. Everything else goes down from that. So let's pick something smaller to refactor to kind of show you what I mean. The easiest thing for here, it looks like, is actually probably the statistics module that I, we had just built. Because really, it has the one computed property here. And then after that, that's basically it. There's not really any other dependency. So this is a nice, small encapsulated one that we can practice on. So here, I'll sell it bender statistics.view. And this time, I'll blow it up to the side, since we're not worried about how it looks right now. And so what we want to go ahead and do is go ahead and see what that looks like. So first, I'm going to grab the template. Do, do, do. There we go. And the template is this short block. It's just this H2 statistics. And as well, we're going to loop through and find this bender statistics. OK, so now we need that data property. Script. And the data property we're looking for here is bender statistics here. And it looks like this is the only computed property in this entire app. So we can actually just cut the whole thing. And we can export our default object and paste in our computed property, which is great. OK, now this is feeling better. However, as you mentioned before, we still have a block in that if we go ahead and open this up inside of Vite right now, so if I save, you'll notice that one, it's fine, right? The Bender statistic doesn't show up, no errors. And that's to be expected because, well, we're not calling anything. But when we add import, Bender statistics. And so that was an autocomplete, by the way. No magic there. Just um, it's reading it. There we go. We can register it. So components, Bender statistics. And then we can try to call it by rendering it out here. OK, boom. Big error. Why? Because if we look inside of the for each, what is it looking for? It's looking for character list. Doesn't exist. right? So now we've proven both ways that. Data just doesn't magically get scoped out. And that again, this is a good thing, because you want things to inherently be scoped to the context in which they're in. The question is, how do we pass data down to our components? And so this is where we talk about the idea, and it's called props, uh, which is shorthand for properties. And the reason why I like the concept of props a lot is because if you think about it, they're really just data attributes on your HTML element. Like, it sounds really fancy when you say props, but really, it's just you're passing an attribute of value. And then that component can access that attribute. That's really what it is. So I think of props as custom attributes. Well, what do we need? We need the character list. So for now, I'm going to add a prop called characters. And this is going to be passing down our character list. So then I can go ahead and bind it to character list like this. And then does anyone know what I'm missing here? Colon. colon. Yep, because I need to V bind this to make it dynamic. So I'm going to go ahead and just do the shorthand for colon. But that's not good enough, though. Because after all, what we just did was we just passed it in data. But one of the things I really like about Vue when it comes, uh, it's not Vue specific, but I did like, like this when I started learning about it, is that it's really all about trying to document your components and making it easier for people to use. So inside of your options, you have the ability to define what props you're going to get, right? So actually, before I do the object one, the simplest way to define your props is through an array of strings. So I could just be like characters, like that. And then you can see here, yeah, let me save that. OK. What this means now is that if I do this.characters, Vue will know this character's reference refers to this prop up here. And so if I save this now and refresh, you'll notice our statistics suddenly works again. Now the thing is, though, I only show you this because in case you see this in the wild, this is code smell. Because again, characters as a string doesn't tell you very much about what you expect as a prop. If you're interested in enterprise level patterns and that kind of stuff, be sure to check out the production grade view that I recorded before. And so that covers a lot of the different patterns that you'll see in enterprise apps. And so this is a kind of like a snippet of something that I mentioned. OK, so when it comes to props, I recommend defining it via object. Why? Because what we can do is for characters, we can do things like define what kind of type that we're expecting. And again, this is not type in TypeScript perspective. This is more of a runtime check, like Vue helps you out. When you pass something funny down, it'll just kind of highlight, like, hey, you told me you wanted this. Why is it something different? So in this case, I know it's just going to be an array. More importantly, I can say this is a required property. Or I could say I could also define a default property on it as well. But for this particular case, all we need to worry about is the fact that it's a required property, and that's important because 
what you're doing here is basically self-documenting the component so that people in the future can actually use it correctly. And so when I save this here, you see that we're refreshed. This is good. But then when we go back to app.view, let's say I accidentally tried to use Bender statistics without passing the component. Uh, let's see, will it yell at me? Bum, 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 bum. So this time it doesn't yell at me. But there are times where I think, actually, let me do this real quick. If I do uh, characters equals one, two, three, save. Looks like it's not doing any checks for me at the moment. It's being kind of finicky. But anyhow, at the bare minimum, when you're doing this, you can actually see it's easy to read, easy to understand, and then more importantly, makes your app easier to maintain. So once again, we are characterless like this. Oops. OK. And so props really is basically the glue to which we can connect our com parent components into our child components. Um, there's a question, though? Functions as props. <laughs> OK. So this is, a, this is a hotly debated one. OK. So the question here is around the concept of functions as props. So in other words, to set up the example here, let me go into the sandbox one instead, just to show. Uh, OK. So let's say in base counter we had a props. And this is actually something that I think I, I think is more common in React code bases. So in app.view, you saw we saw that we actually actually scoped the increment counter directly to the component, right? Well, theoretically, what you could do is with the, this concept is that you would have your methods at your parent component. So it'd be at this level, right? And you'd have this increment function. And then what you pass down to the component is the actual increment function. So it would look something like this, right? And then in terms of how this would be, how it would look from a component perspective, you would have this increment prop. And it's like type function, right? And then just be like, whoops, required true. <clears throat> There's an example of a props. Personally, I am not a fan of passing functions down as props. The reason for this is because I know that, especially when we are programming, we get caught up in like trying to do like factory functions, right? And with factory components, where it becomes very easy to like genericize everything. And so that's why I think one of the reasons it even got popular to pass functions down is because you're basically saying, as a parent, I'm going to tell the child what to run. But what I found with that a lot of times is that now you're starting to kind of conflate the, like, I feel like the parents start to do too much work in terms of, like, if the scope of the child is meant to increment, I, I found very few times where it didn't make sense for the child to own that from the, from, from the beginning as far as, like, functionality-wise. Um, so I think in this example, <clears throat> yeah. I tend to think about this in the, in the add new uh, airbender. Okay. Form. Yep. Like the the, the parent uh -huh. the app owns the list of Airbenders. Yep. And the form uh -huh. has the what is a new Airbender and yep. how do I modify it? But then when I want to actually add that to that list, yep. Like I could modify the list in the child, but that feels dirtier than having the parent own that function that actually adds it to the list. I love this question. So that is actually a good lead-in after the exercise to exa the. I'll call it what I consider the more standard pattern of dealing with that. And so to recap, in case anyone couldn't hear, is that let's go back to the example brought up was inside of my avatar airbender uh, component. Earlier, you might have heard me say, for example, that the component hit a limit, and there's a reason for that. But for the favorite character list, as was mentioned, if we were to break out favorite character right here into its own component, it's tricky because at this point, Favorite list is also dependent on like there's like the the data exists in the parent, and so you don't necessarily want to pass the data into the child for the child to modify, but at the same time, then it sounds like it would be better to then pass a function to the child to tell it what to do, right? But I'll leave that a little bit on the cliffhanger, but just know that there's a better way than passing functions down as props when it comes to that scenario. So I want to give people first a chance to practice the props approach. And then I'll reset the context in terms of the lead-in into the next technique that I think is really important when it comes to the model of web development and how we look at things. We did get a great question here um, in the chat. And so it's this around the idea of 
when in like a lot of real world apps, a lot of times you're getting large sets of data from your API, right? And so in the case of the question is like user details. And so if you're creating a component like user card, how might you approach this? So again, just for the sake of not just me talking, let's at least scaffold this out a little bit just so there's something visual for us to have. Bum, bum, bum. Let's go to the playground. And then we'll go into our app. OK. There we go. And so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to create a file called usercard-view. And then let me just do this real quick to set up the scaffold, keep it easy, user. All right, so we have a user card component. And then I'll explain what is the question here. User card from components.usercard.view, user card, OK. And then here we have a user card. So let me run up, oh, wait, wrong thing to run dev in. All right, cool. Uh, this is too small, so we're going to bump that, bump that, bump that, close that. OK, so the question here is around this concept of what happens when you get a large data object. So inside of here, let's, for instance, let's just define it here real quick, is that let's say we have a user data object that we end up fetching from the API that has something like name, then you know, preferred framework, View, for example, you know, favorite food, sushi, and then like let's just keep it. Okay, so let's say it's like this level of object, or actually let's go ahead and what's one more thing? Uh, let's just say I don't know favorite numbers. And this can be an array, and that can be like eight, uh, what ten? These are not actually my favorite numbers, but for the sake of the uh, exercise, okay, we have this complex thing, and so the question here is if the user card. For example, let's say on the user card, we only want to display a couple of things. We want to display the name. We want to display the, uh, what else do we got? We got the name. And let's just say favorite food. Let's actually just say two things. And so if we refresh this, very good. Very good. OK. The question here is around data architecture and how do we actually manage this? Because there's one way we can do this, right? Let's talk about the first approach. The, Probably the most straightforward approach is to just say that, hey, inside of this component, I'm going to take this prop called user. And it's going to be a type of object, and I'm going to require it. OK. And then here is where I'll say user.name and user.favoritefood, because that corresponds with this data that we're going to go ahead and pass here directly, user equals user data. OK? So if we take a look at how that looks here, you'll s whoop, did I not save? There we go. You see user Ben appears and Sushi appears. OK, so it's working. But the question here is, as you'll notice, is that we have passed in more data than we actually need. And so I think the question is kind of like, what's the right way? And like a lot of programming things, there is no singular right way. A lot of times what it ends up boiling down to when it comes to managing this stuff is the complexity around maintenance of the component. That's what I would basically say. It's, there's certainly sometimes concerns that like, oh, the data you're passing in is so massive that like it doesn't make sense to pass with that single component. But then I would argue at that point, the bottleneck is not the component architecture, but maybe how data is being fetched and being parsed on like at the higher level. Right? This is why I think stuff like GraphQL has gotten really popular because if the servers are just returning giant blobs of data, that's expensive for the user, right? There's no amount of smart things you can do as far as like, if you're just getting more data than you need from your server, that's a problem that has to be dealt at that end and not necessarily at this level. And so in this case, however, though, let's say this was a lot bigger. Let's just say this was a lot bigger, right? And you're like, I really don't want to pass that. There honestly is nothing wrong just being like, well, that we'll have a name, it'll be string, and this time we'll just say it's a default of, uh, John Doe. And then we'll also have a food prop that is a type string, and we'll default it to cheeseburgers. right? And so what's cool about this now with the default, because this is, I think, the first time I'm demoing this, is that if in the event we don't include anything, 
um, on the app side, you'll see. Uh, what did I break? You used user in your. Um... Oh, I did. You're totally right. Good catch. It's no longer an object. It's just individual properties. There we go. User favorite food. Uh, yes, this is just food. OK, you can see we have John Doe and cheeseburgers. And then, as a result, what you get is now, OK, let's just say Ben's food is favorite food is cheeseburger. Well, then in that case, user data.name can be the only thing that we pass. And you'll notice that Ben, state, ben is good, default prop uh, stays cheeseburger. And then here, you can also then say, you know what? Then also for favorite, uh, so food, then we use your data dot favorite food. And then it still works. And so I, again, it's one of those things I think with experience, you'll come to figure out like one, when is it too many props? Because I will say that is actually a legitimate problem. If you have the point where you're breaking down your object and you're, you have like 10 lines of props, no one's going to want to read that. No one wants to deal with that. But again, feel, feel it out with your team. Figure out like what is your limit. For me, once I start getting past like three to five props, I start wondering if I could maybe manipulate the data just past like a concise object that can then be spread out inside of the component. But again, it's one of those things where you'll have a style uh, as far as how you approach that. Yeah. Would that be where you might use a computed property to pass as a prop? I love it. OK. So the question here is that then with this same concept, right? could we then use a computer property to pass it down instead? And I think that's a great example. So once again, let's take this example. If we wanted to say only pass down the food and the name, we could say, call it refine user data. And this refine user data can basically just be like uh, returns an object where we do, uh, do, 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 what is it, name, and then just this.userdata.name, and then food this dot user data dot favorite food. And that way, you actually get to massage the data a little bit anyways. And then we can revert back to this user now, which can just be passed. And it'll be pass refine user data. And so it means we'll update this now to be user type object required true. And this time, we can then say user dot name. Actually, I could have just done that like that. There we go. What did I break? Cannot read properties defined name. Computed return name. Oh, OK. It did work. I just didn't save app.view. <laughs> OK. Um, so there you go. That's an example of passing down just the data you need into your component so that it doesn't have to deal with the cruft of all the other um, data properties. And so once again, it'll be a stylistic part on as far as like feeling out what makes the most sense uh, in terms of if, is that level of complexity even needed? Because if it's just one or two extra properties, I'd say most of the time it's not worth creating an, an entirely separate property just to refine the data a little bit. Granted, if you have a massive card, right, that has a ton of stuff in it, then that's the point where, once again, whether you're using like, things like serverless functions, for example, those are great ways to like, massage the data so that when they come back from the back end, it's smaller in the way that you want. That's one approach to that as well. Um, because for example here, uh, one, of the Pokemon, uh, one of the APIs we have to play with later in the workshop is if you take a look at something like this, right? this is actually a great example of a really complicated, uh, let me see, copy, paste. This is the entire thing for like the Pokemon Ditto. And there's a lot of stuff in here that you probably don't need. You probably need like one image. You need maybe the number it is, and you maybe need to render. But like this is an example of a lot of raw data that you don't necessarily need. And so once again, there are different approaches to handle this. But um, I hope that answers that question. So thank you for asking that. Cool. All right. Yes. Is when when you do pass properties, is it sort of passing by reference, or is it passing, is is it passing a copy of the object, just because we're talking about like performance and memory? Ah. <laughs> okay. So the question here is that when you pass in this refined user data, is it passing in like a copy of it, or is it passing a reference to that data? And the answer is is that it's passing a reference to that data. And so when it comes to props, that actually does bring up the concept of mutating props. Generally speaking, not a good practice. So what you don't want to do is come in here and then be like, oh, yes, I want, uh, I'm going to create a method 
that's like change name, and it'll be like this dot user dot name equals like Charlie. Like you don't want to do this. But you could. But you could. <laughs> but as you can see though, unexpected mutation of user prompt. It's yelling at you because once again, when you start muddling up the chain of command as far as how data flows, it starts to get really tricky to figure out what's happening now, right? Um, now, again, this leads into the question that we had earlier regarding, well, if that's the case, are you saying that like my child component can't change the data it's happening? No, that's not the case at all. But um, before we move on to that topic, does anyone have any other questions about like the exercise they've worked with in terms of props, that kind of stuff? If the data changes outside the component since it's passed by reference, will it re-render the component then? Yeah, it'll know basically when to what parts of the DOM to update and all the dependencies. So that's that's one of the advantages is that all, basically all the reactivity view tracks and takes care of. We've danced around this topic a lot at this point, and I love to address this. So as a recap on the context of what we're talking about is, at this point, we're talking about children components trying to figure out how the heck to update the parent component. Because we've talked about the fact that, well, we don't want to mutate props. As we can see very clearly here, we're being yelled at. Don't mutate props. On the other hand, we talked about passing functions down, as in like if there was a method on this component that was called change name, and call it this.user data.name equals, let's say there's like an argument for new name, and then just like that, right? And so then you'd be like, OK, well, inside of user, I'm going to pass this method, call it change name, and then it'll take on the reference to that method. And then we have this change name, which is a function. And then you know it's, let's say, required true. And then let's say we have a button here that's like, hey, like change name. That's like most people's instinctual way in how a lot of frameworks approach this problem. Because the parent is telling it what to change, and the child obediently does it. The thing about this mo mental model, though, is that it forgoes the fact that actually, if we think about how the web is designed, when we have child's DOM elements, what do we have it do? We have it bubble up events. That's actually how the web is built natively, if we think about it. It's not actually the parent just telling it what to do, it's saying, when you know that a button that a child has happened, it bubbles up that event. That's where we get these, these concepts, right? That, oh, a click has happened. Therefore, how does this relate to the chain of communication? And so what we're going to talk about right now, basically at this point, is how we can basically emit custom events from our child to tell the parent that something is happening. So let's actually go ahead and just take this user card example. Why not? Why wouldn't we? So let's go ahead and just set this context up a bit. So let me just remove this and how we would do this. Uh, actually, I think I might be able to leave that. We can, for now, let's do this. Change name. OK. So let's make sure everything's at least rendering correctly on our side for the app. OK. So let's start with something simple, which is that if we click a button from the child, it will basically tell the parent that, hey, I want to change the name. And that when that happens, what we want it to do is let's just update it directly to Charlie. So we won't even worry about arguments right now. And so again, right here, just to show that this works, if we add the click and we add change name, change now, you'll see Ben does switch to Charlie as expected. OK, as expected. But this method is existing all the way up here. So how the heck does a user card get access to that? without you passing the prop down as a function. Well, the way we do that is with this concept, it's new to, new th it's new to view three, did not exist in view two, called emits. And emits is the equivalent of props. Props is saying, hey, this is what I'm expecting to send down. Emits is our way of documenting, hey, this is what I'm going to send up. So if you think about it, this is actually following the one-way data chain of like unidirectional data flow, because the data comes down. And then you're basically sending a signal up to say, hey, I want something to change. Then the, the, basically the parent knows, oh, change it, then send that change back down. So in that regard, it follows that traditional web model. And so to show you what that means, we'll say emit, so again, emit the event change name. All right? And so the key thing with the emits is to think of this as custom events. right? We're used to click, key up, 
those are things that are events that are already defined for us. This is a custom event that we're emitting. Okay? And so what we get to do then is once we have our emits defined, what we get to do is we get to call a global method called emit, dollar sign emit. And so if this is your first time using Vue, this probably, you're probably wondering, what is this dollar sign here? It's basically Vue's way of name scoping a global function that is available to Vue specifically. So now that you know you're, this is not just something in JavaScript, this is a Vue thing, we're going to emit what? We're going to emit change name. OK? And this is now where the, um, the dev tools become very handy. Inside the dev tools, there is this tab right here called a timeline. And what it allows you to do is actually notice when different events are happening. So you notice that if I just click on the page here, it actually does gives me a timeline of snapshot of what's happening. It even actually has the coordinates on here, I am noticing. And so you see it actually tells you the actual position of what's happening. And so when it comes to debugging, this is pretty darn useful. And so you notice here now, if I click change name, something happens here. So let me scroll over. Oop. Oof. I think it's losing the scroll. OK, it's right over here. Oop. I think I zoomed out too much. OK. Refresh. OK, there we go. Where is my sidebar view? Reload. Components, timeline. Oh, I hit it. Here we go. Oh my gosh. I was like, where did it go? OK, click change name. And we'll see a couple of things here. One. You see right here, change name event has been emitted. And so it's been emitted by user card. And so you also know that it happened with a click as well, because you see that here, it has the mouse up, mouse down, the click event. And then here is where we get that change name event. And you notice here, it actually tells you a little bit more about the event info, that it's from the component user card, the event is change name. But also, we haven't got into this yet, we can actually pass parameters up. Because sometimes you're going to be customizing stuff at the child level that you need to say, hey, here are some of the customizations I'm sending up to the parent, and this is what I'm going to send. And so when you do this, what happens is on your component, we get the ability to listen to what? Listen to our custom event, which is what? Change name. So this is no different than our at click, at key up. So I'm actually going to go ahead and just do the at, because that's my preferred. And then from here, what are we going to do when this is called? We're going to run the method change name. Okay, there we go. npm run dev. There we go. Yeah, I figured. So this takes some getting used to because I know that again, this is not traditionally how people are thinking of things. But it's funny when we think about the the primitives we're given when building with the web. Event bubbling is a very standard way of building with things, and more importantly, I think it allows for I'll call it like a cleaner way of removing that uh, sort of like strict instructions that you're passing down from the parent when you just pass a function. Because now all of a sudden that function, like I've just seen on code bases when people do that, it just gets hairy in terms of like people, then they start passing in the wrong function. Because then, then you have to make sure the function is doing what you want it to in the child, which means you actually now have to check the parent to make sure that it kind of makes sense. Whereas like when you just emit an event, this child component can be used in a lot of different contexts. And then the parent can do whatever it wants with it. And it makes sense because you're saying, when the child component has this custom event, I'm going to run this function which lives in this file. And so in that regard, it really does help to really encapsulate that single file component mentality while still building on web standards and principles that, uh, that we're actually using on the day-to-day -day, but often overlook. Yeah. If you were to bubble up multiple levels, would you have to catch it Emit, re-emit it. Yep. You can't just say emits, 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 emits the whole way up. You, you cannot. And so that's a great question. Because, OK, so let me reiterate. So the question here is that right now, we just have a single parent, single child, one emit, whatever. What happens when you have like a great, 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 great grandchild wanting to communicate info up? And so emits and props really are designed for a closer relationship, like when you're closer together. Because props actually have that same problem. And so the pattern that actually, the anti-pattern that's resulted from that is called prop drilling. And so we have app.view has this global thing, and then you drill, 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 prop, 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 and like none of the components use it until like this one. But then the problem with prop drilling is that the moment you remove one in the middle, the whole thing just falls apart immediately. The answer to this is basically using composables and state management in a way that, because at that point I would argue 
if you have data that is shared across components at that depth, it probably makes sense for it to be encapsulated in a module that can just be shared across both files. The props is really, in my mind, designed when there's a tight coupling between the two components, and you want it to behave a certain way. Otherwise, what we'll see here um, later on is around other flexible APIs that allow it to do more than just uh, sort of like these sort of rigid instructions between components. Does that help to answer your question? Um, is there an emit equivalent in Vue 2? OK, so um, good question. In regards to Vue 2, the dollar sign emit actually does exist as a function. So it's not that you custom events are not new to Vue 3. What is new to Vue 3 is the fact that you can basically document them inside of your options. Because the problem, and this was a misstep on, I guess, on our part, we didn't think about it, is that when you don't have this emits property, it seems like a small thing. But if you start emitting multiple events, it starts getting really hairy to track in a big component of like, wait, what events are happening? Where is it? I mean, that's, a, that's why we have prop definitions too, actually, is to let you know, hey, what am I expecting to receive? The emits does the opposite for us, where what kind of events are you expecting to emit so that people don't just randomly create their own? And so to be clear, and just to kind of wrap that up, if you don't like emitting directly here, we can actually just uh, do something like uh, tell parent change name. And this can just be a method, tell parent change name. And we can do this dot dollar sign emit. This would be the same exact thing. It's up to you whether you want to call it here or you just want to call it inline. Um, once again, I think that's more of a stylistic thing uh, because some people would be like, well, if it's just this one event and I'm not tracking that much, I'm just going to inline it because it's not really being reused. On the other hand, if you have this being called a bunch of places, you might not really want to define that everywhere. You might want to change, change it in one place. So now that you have this equipped or this new knowledge, the exercise now is to kind of continue on your component exploration journey. And now you have basically the opportunity to architect your components kind of however you see fit. Do you want to go ahead and just have these display components that receive data from the parent? And then if it makes changes, emit that upwards? Or do you want to just keep everything at the top? Like you can figure out how you want to play around with that and see what works well for you. All right, and we're back. So uh, one of the questions that came up during the exercise is like people were playing around, and what they notice is, is that if you mutate the prop, everything does seem to work. So in other words, if we're in here, for example, and we said uh, this dot user dot name, right, equals, uh, let's do Dominique, OK? Again, it will technically work. The principle I kind of want to kind of stress here it's not so much that a question of whether or not it works or not, but more so that when it comes to best practices for ar like architecting apps, you want to keep it as easy as possible to debug what's wrong. This is why I'm also a big fan of like when you have error reporting, or for example, like we'll talk about styling later. But when we go to the goes too far in terms of our optimizations of like, well, it's easier to just do this, right? It can make it tricky to track where things are happening. And so when it comes to UI, a lot of it ends up boiling down to where's your source of truth. And the, when you allow your code base to start like, sort of messing with that source of truth in different places, all of a sudden it becomes a lot trickier to figure out why and when something happened. Whereas if you follow this pattern of emitting for ch children to parent, you'll always know that if in the future the user has a bug where this list, for example, is broken, you'll know that basically you probably should be looking at the parent and. Basically, you'll probably be able to solve it just that off that alone. But if you allow the mutation of props elsewhere, all of a sudden that guarantee becomes far less likely. It's because you just don't know what's happening. So, I always err on the side of keeping it easy when it comes to uh, when it comes to maintenance and debugging. Okay, so let's take a look at this exercise, shall we? Okay. That's not what I wanted at all. OK, perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my ATLA forum. Actually, let me just, good, OK. So ATLA forum, great, fresh, cool. OK, so a good component f to kind of illustrate this is going to be the favoriting button. 
because we can see here that inside of app.view, we're actually managing our favorite lists here at the very top. And so let's go ahead and create that favorite list component. So favorite list, great. Actually, you know what? I think favorite characters is actually a bit more accurate. Favorite characters, great. And then I realized, though, actually, wait, I mis misspoke. Rather than the favorite characters, we actually want to create individual character cards. That's what we want. So let me rename this now to character card. And so what we have here now, um, what I did earlier in case when people see that, uh, this is just a VS Code uh, extension. So, or not an extension. It's one of the shorthands. So it's a short code that I customized so that when I type SFC for single file component, it would automatically spit out my building blocks for me. OK. So what we have here is we have this HTML that we basically want to refactor, which is what we're looping through right here. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and actually just copy this as a, should I do it as a list item? Let's just do it as a div, actually, just to be cleaner so that it doesn't have to be in the list. So we'll have a div, and the div will contain all this stuff. Now we need to move some functionality over, though. So here's our placeholder. We need to move the favorite character functionality. Okay. And I think we need a prop because we need to actually know what character we're rendering. So the character, this case, again, will be a type object. And I, so I'm not going to actually break down the individual properties. And then that way we can get character.name. And then for now, let's not worry about this function, because this will break. And then that's it. OK, so to prove that this works, we're going to go ahead and import our character card. And then drop that here. And then we're going to use it inside of our placeholder. And we'll pass in the character as a prop. So this is reusing all the stuff that we did earlier. OK, everything is appearing as expected. Now, the difference here, though, is that this favorite character functionality doesn't work because guess what? This card does not care about, like, it, it, its responsibility is not to track the favorite list. So to the point of what I was talking about earlier, you can, you can theoretically pass favorite list as a prop to this component. And then you could have, theoretically, the component update favorite list. But again, that starts to convolute the scope of the data and how it's being owned. That's not its goal. Its goal is to say, hey, I'm going to show a card of my characters. And by the way, when someone clicks the favorite event, I will go ahead and tell the parent of whatever context I'm in that the user decided they wanted to favorite this card. Whatever you do with that, that's up to you. So what we got to do here is we'll define our emits call. And we'll just call it, we'll keep it simple, actually, because emits are scoped to the specific component. We'll just call it a favorite event. That's just what's happening. So now that we have the favorite event, we can say, OK, well, when this happens, this dot emit, this dot emit, what event are we emitting? It's called favorite. But more importantly, actually, what we can do is we can actually pass in an argument to our emitted function, which is this dot character. So we can save that. And then this time now, we can click favorite character. OK, great. Now that we have this, we can come over here. And then we can say, ah, yes. So on the character card, we have this favorite event that's going to happen. And when it does, we can say add, uh, let's see, add favorite character. And so if we take a look now, uh, let's, switch the, let's update this method. It's called add favorite character. And what you end up getting, because you're passing it as an argument, is a payload, basically. You can rename it, whatever you want. But generally speaking, we call it a payload because this is coming from the event. So again, the way this is connected to show this side by side, this dot emit emits this as the event name. And this here, the second argument, will basically be the payload. So it's generally frowned upon, for example, to just keep adding to this. If you're like, oh, I want to add like a custom ID, like one, two, three, you wouldn't do this. You would actually instead just pass a single object that's like, this is the character, and this is the ID. So payloads are typically done in a single argument. Try not to spread them out beyond that. 
And like I said, if you need more nesting, then by all means, use an object. But we don't need to do that. So let's go ahead and actually just emit the character directly. And then with that payload, we can actually just push that over. So let's go ahead and verify that this works. Refresh, boom. And Izuko, bang, bam. And there you have it. That is a way that you can implement the props in a way that lets you render exactly what you need. But then when, you, when it's time to actually do something, the child can tell the parent that, hey, it's, there's this thing that I'm requesting. Please do what you will with it. Does anyone have any questions regarding what uh, the solution that we just went over? If you wanted to have your favorite, yeah, separate, like a favorite module, and so Ooh. you, you want to call that function in another module, a child module, okay, from the template code there or something. So let me make sure I understand the question correctly. So let's say in the event you're mentioning that the favorite functionality is something that's shared amongst different UI components. How would we share that amongst the different components? Yeah, or I mean, specifically, you have a button with an at click that says favorite character. And yep. let's say that function is actually in a different module. OK, so with this button, you're yeah. saying that this is in a different module? Yeah. So, OK. So you're saying that in this example, you'd have like, let's say we'd have a utilities folder that has a favorite.js, for example. And so is that what you're kind of referring to, where there's like a function that like will? Well, like I was thinking have a component that displays the favorites and then have the add favorite function also inside there. Oh, I see. OK, got it. So the scope here is you're saying that having the favorite list scoped with the component directly. Um, so actually, so not this scenario. The idea here actually being that instead, let's, let's go ahead and create that favorite list, uh, characters.view. And so in this case, are you referring to the fact that like we would be rendering out the list here then? Yeah. So got it. So here, OK, SFC. So in, inside of here, this is we're doing another refactoring here. We have our data being the actual favorite list that's being tracked here. And then this is where we're actually rendering the favorite list, which is going to be this block right here. And apparently we have an if else condition, so that is that whole thing. And then drop that in here. OK, so that should be good. Favorite list is good. That's good. OK, now the question here is we need to import favorite characters. So let's do that real quick favorite characters, and drop that as well. And then once we have that, you said that you want to render it here, favorite characters, like this. OK. And I guess you tell me where you'd put the function uh, to add favorites, but, but the variable is inside that module. Is that Correct. Component? So how would you go about it? OK. And then variables in here. And then I think something's missing, though. So it must be fail to resolve component, because I think I misspelled it. What'd you say? Favorite characters. <laughs> See, the one <laughs> off the S gets me. This is why I generally do list. Anyhow, um, OK, no favorite characters yet. OK, so are you saying that in this particular context, you're saying we clearly have the favorite functionality inside of the card here. And you're saying that what if we had like another section that also had like a favorite button to add characters? I guess I'm just, just as is. Yep. How would you get the data over into the favorite list variable, which is inside the favorite characters component? Yeah, this is where it gets tricky. So at least with the tools that we have now, you would basically have to do, OK, so if you admitted this, you would admit this. I'm not sure it actually makes sense because, so the thing about we have to remember when it comes to emits and props is that it's a top-down relationship. And the, the problem we're trying to solve here is a sibling relationship because character card contains data that Bender statistics, or no, not Bender statistics, uh, favorite characters and character card are trying to talk to each other basically at this point. 
And so usually what happens at that point is where you want some sort of alternative state management solution where you have like basically as a preview is you would have stores and we probably would have like a favorite store. And the favorite store becomes a file that becomes basically a JavaScript module that's shared between the two components that care about that. And that way, the, the updating becomes cleaner. And in fact, what's kind of interesting, though, is that once you start doing these stores, sometimes the emit goes away, actually, because now you're actually not thinking about emitting to a parent. You're just updating the store. And so that can do a lot in terms of like cleaning up code and that kind of stuff. But I wanted to at least start with the fundamentals of like if you're dealing with two components, parent, child, this is like kind of like best practice for how we approach things. But then with tomorrow, once we talk about storm module and that kind of stuff, it's going to be all sorts of fun. So. so the situation you have here, this is where that generic list component could be useful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Where you're passing as a prop the list of characters into one list mm -hmm. and the list of favorites into the others, and then yep. using functions to update those separate lists. Exactly. Yep. Great. We've talked a lot about props. We talked about emits. And so something you might be thinking, though, is that, well, OK, this is like, makes sense, right? I can pass data down to my components. But at some point, this might get kind of cumbersome. And so I want to kind of give you like a micro version of the button exercise that I give in the production grade view uh, workshop. So if you want to check that out for this. But let's, for a second, think of a component. Let's go ahead and depict this out real quick as a base button. And so for this base button, you probably are thinking, well, it's a button component. And what kind of props would I want to pass to it? Well, if we think about it, we can say, well, usually you need to have some text on your, on your button. So OK, let's, let's call that a text prop. And then I'll just call, I'll just, uh, I'll do the shorthand typing right now. Um, so this is an alternative, by the way, for props where if you don't want to do the required and default, you just pass the type directly like this. But again, generally speaking, I think it's the best practice to define whether it's required or if it's not required and has a default, basically do your due diligence on that. It helps your team in the long run. OK, so you're like, OK, well, there might be some text here. And then what happens if your product manager is like, you know what, I think I want to use the icons on the left-hand side. Then you're like, oh, OK. Maybe like icon left string. Or maybe just icon, right? Because you're like, oh, OK, it has an icon. It has an icon. It's going to the left. And then they go, well, actually, it depends, because the icon might be on the left or the right. And then you might start getting the hint of where I'm going with this. Then you're like, OK, well, icon right. And for now, I'm just keeping it simple, just keeping things strings. So it's like, OK, string. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, I also need this to replace a loading spinner in case it's like fetching an API call. And all of a sudden, what you got here is this massive list of props for your what is really just a button component, right? Especially for something like this text here. Can you imagine how complicated the v if else if is going to be when it's like if loading, if loading shows this, but else this, but then also if there's an icon, then do this. Like this button will become very, very troublesome to manage. And so, of course, Vue has an answer for this. And the answer for this is around the idea of slots. And so slots are an interesting concept in that we have been using them this whole time when it comes to HTML. So how does a slot work? Well, let's go ahead and just show you how. Let's just refactor this real quick. So icon, let's do this, icon text. So I just want to have something that will render on the page. And then we'll say, OK, so let's go. Actually, since this is a playground, let me move the base button to playground so that this can be consistent. Base button is going to source, going to components. There we go. Perfect. And then to keep that consistent, we'll just do base button and kebab case. We'll hide that. And then now let's make sure I'm running the playground app so we don't run the wrong one. Because nothing's more infuriating than thinking being in the wrong environment and thinking your code's not changing. Um, okay, so we have a base button here, app.view. So import base button, base button from here, base and button. And then this is supposed to be base counter. 
Okay. How does base button work at the moment? Is it is base button, and we can give it a text of hi, and the icon of arrow. Okay. So what happened? Oh, I think I did not close it. There we go. Okay, we see it here, right? It says arrow and hi. Great. What we want to avoid when it comes to props is being overly descriptive with how something is supposed to be used. It's useful for guidance. It's useful as a guardrail. But when it comes to something like what text belongs in a button, it doesn't often make sense to do something like that with a prop. So instead, what do we do? Well, there is a built-in element called slot. And so it's globally available to your app at all times because this is a view component. And slot, if we think about it, it actually functions just as you would expect when it comes to HTML. You just didn't realize it. So rather than being like, oh, I wanted to say arrow and then dash high, this is a base button. And we call it like a normal component. And we say arrow left and high. And if you're looking at this going like, isn't that HTML? I'd say, exactly. It's just like HTML. Why complicate things beyond that, right? There are times where you just want to let people just define whatever they want inside of your component. Now, granted, eventually you could do some fancy things regarding maybe some props. Maybe there is an, an, a point where you have some base icon here, for example. But slots are one of the most powerful features of Vue in the sense that it allows for flexibility. It's almost like, in that regard, the complete opposite of props, where props you're being very prescriptive. Do this with this type. This is required. But do it in this place. Slots is saying, all right, I'm open. Like, work, you can basically work with me here. And so the cool thing about slots, too, is that slots are more intelligent than like a standard HTML element in that you can actually provide it a default content. So what we can do is we can say, uh, yeah, so we'll just call it submit by default. And so when you do that, this means that when I go ahead and delete what's inside, you'll notice it automatically falls back to that content, which, again, can be very nice for just sort of providing some conventions, especially when people start having design systems and that sort of thing. It's like, OK, most of our buttons are submit. We can go ahead and say, OK, all base buttons have a default of submit. But otherwise, the moment someone needs to override it, easy peasy. This is no longer submit. This is now cancel. As you can see, updates, just as you would expect. And you can bind that, obviously, to your data or? Yep, exactly. So the question here is around, can we do more than this? Yeah, because we should treat this just like any other uh, HTML element. So in here, we can do something like user data dot name. And there you go. It just works. That's one of the things that always excites me when I look at how Vue's API is designed is extensibility on what people already understand and then just leveraging the heck out of it. Why not? Why not sprinkle on some syntactic sugar, some superpowers that make it even easier, right? Because again, slots inherently already work from like an HTML perspective, but now you can provide like default content. We can actually do if conditions for slots too. So if you had something like called direction, and let's say direction's here, and we can say v if left, we could do slot for v else. And then, so let's say the default is actually this submit. But otherwise, if it has a configured prop of left, it might be like icon left, uh, whatever, cancel. And so what you get here is I've already, I'm already overriding it. But if you come in here, save, you'll see that submit is falling back as we would expect. But if we have, whoop, I think my v if direction doesn't make sense. Actually, I can just do left. It's fine. So I do left is a Boolean, and the default is false. So like that, you see submit does come up. And then we can say left is true. Icon left, cancel. So that's pretty cool. But what else can we do? There's even more, because if we think of slots like a mailbox slot, we might want to have multiple slots on a component, not just one. And so what if we were to do something like layouts? Well, if you had a layout component, let's say let me do base layout.view. 
what you're probably going to end up having is you probably have some sort of div that is your class wrapper, right? Assuming you have like a design system. But then you might want to start figuring out where things are being slotted. So for example, you might have an aside here that is class like sidebar. And then you probably have somewhere where you want to render out your main content. And then you probably have like your footer content. And so again, if you do this by traditional props and that kind of stuff, it gets really painful because how do you pass components into props? Like that's just a whole messy matter. But what we can do is we can give our slots names. So this can be the sidebar slot. This can be the main slot. And this can be the footer slot. And so the way this would work is, if we're inside of our app.view, we can go ahead and import base, uh, let's see, let me duplicate this one. And then, bum bum, base layout from base layout. We organize that to be alphabetical, great. Okay, then we get our base layout. What we can do now is we can now define specific snippets of HTML to go in specific places. How do we define HTML? We have our template element. And so I know it's like, whoa, there's a template in a template. But again, if you look at MDN, template is an actual HTML element. It's a content template element. Like this is a thing. I think a lot of people at one point was like, oh, that looks like a view thing. No, this, this, is, in, this is in the MDN docs. This is fairly standard. And so what we can do is we can say, look, this is the aside. And how do we tell it the template that we want to go there? Well, we do the v slot directive, and we tell it the, um, I believe this is a side like this. And so if this renders correctly, base layout. Uh, oh, wait, I did not. Oh, I called it sidebar. So of course, there's nowhere to go, so I misnamed it sidebar, aside. There we go. And so let's give this just a little bit of styling just so that we can see the difference. So let's go ahead and give the sidebar uh, border 2px solid red. And then we'll go ahead and do the same for each one. So we'll have main, and then we'll have footer. And so we'll make this green, we'll make this blue. And so you can see right now, because nothing's being passed to the slot for main or footer, nothing's being rendered, just the aside. And so all we got to do now is we can go ahead and add like things like template, the slot main, and then I can even do things like actually render the user card. Actually, I could even just take this component right here, the, let's, let's take the user card here, and just drop it directly inside of main. And so you can see here that it's actually being rendered inside, although where did my borders go? Main class. Oh, I didn't give it a class. Class main, there we go. Did you have a question? I was wondering if the components that are not the slots render in the DOM when you bring that template in. So you're saying that if I don't... If, so currently you have nothing in the footer slot. Yep. Is there a footer element? Ah, good question. Uh, and the answer is <clears throat> yes, it is there. Because as far as view is concerned, what you're saying is this is the scaffold yeah. expected to render. Um, there's nothing, well, yeah, I guess it would be a little bit tricky to, as far as like checking make sure the slot, like whether the slot is empty or not. So th at that point though, I'm saying that, I would say that if you're starting to get conditional about what content is showing inside, at that point it would make more sense to make a slot name of a slot of footer, for example, and then maybe by de like maybe the default is to have like some content in here, but then otherwise let someone completely override it. And then that way, if there is no slot, nothing gets shows up at all. Um, that's probably the way I would approach it in that particular case. Um, so here we go. We have that. Whoops. What did I forget? Here we go. Boom. So we can see now the footer actually is rendering. And so all I got to do now is do the template v slot footer inside of here, and then let's drop the base counter in there. Boom. And so slots become really powerful because if you've ever worked with like a backend CMS where users are defining layouts, now you have the ability to like when you're fetching data to actually drop things where they're supposed to go as opposed to like having to 
configure like, oh, this is my two column layout. This is my three column layout. This is my two column with one. Like, there comes a point where like that becomes very tedious to maintain. And slots do a lot in terms of opening up a lot of reusability and composability when it comes to that. What's cool about this too is that because it's programmatic in terms of assigning its property, there's no like it doesn't have to appear in a certain order. So for example, I'll just swap these to show that. You'll see that even though technically inside of here we've ordered it as like a side, main, whatever, it's totally being controlled at this level. Um, and so as a result, you can again, it just allows for more composability and flexibility when it comes to that. And the other thing I want to leave you off with before we dive into exercises and other questions is that if you're looking at some other code bases, not everyone writes out the vslot uh, directive. And this is a convention within Vue 3 in that you can shorthand it to just the hashtag symbol. The way to think about it is like the idea of the slot that you want to put the template stuff in. To be honest, I find it a little bit confusing because if someone doesn't know what this is and tries to Google this, sometimes they might end up with CSS stuff. Some, like this shorthand, I like personally, I don't tend to use it. Again, it is in code bases, which is why I'm telling you all this exists. So if that's your team's convention, I would say roll with it. Personally, though, I don't mind actually being explicit about slot sidebar. I think this, to me, is expressive. Um, and I get, yeah, personally, that's what I prefer. So if you pull down 08 exercise, you'll be able to see all the code that we I just did. I want you to go ahead on your own app, create your own base layout, play around with slots, see how you might want to rearrange things, uh, see how that feels when you have one slot versus having multiple slots with name slots. All right, how did everyone feel about playing around with slots? Good, fairly straightforward. That is great to hear. OK, so what I'm going to do is just basically I'm going to take a look at the ATL LLA forum on my end. And we'll just do a quick one as far as that goes. So let me go ahead and check out a branch. Wait, solution. CD Atla. Great. Run dev. Everything should be running as expected. Yep, perfect. OK. So when I'm looking at Atla, I'm thinking, OK, well, base component, what does a base layout look like? So I'm going to go ahead, create my base layout, dot view. Inside of here, let's keep it simple. So we're just going to have the template, and all that it manages is where things are placed. So we'll actually just create uh, basically our, let's do how many things do we have, four things. All right, so let's do a div, and then we'll have here, so we'll call this class grid, and then we'll say uh, do 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 do. It would this, actually this time we'll open a style block, and for grid we'll display grid and grid template columns two. Uh, repeat two one fr. Basically, this will repeat two columns inside of this, so div and div, and then for now. Let's just go ahead and drop this to make this a slot. And then we'll say the name for this slot is 1. So this will be the, the first one. And then we'll copy this and then just drop it in here for 2. <laughs> Autocomplete. Just slot. Thank you for catching that. OK, inside of our app, we're going to go ahead, grab that, and then this will be base layout. Go ahead and copy that, base layout. And then we'll actually call it here. And this time in base layout, we'll go ahead and let's take our new character down here. I think that's all of this stuff. And then let's just drop that in the first slot to start. So where are we here? OK, so we'll have the template here, dropping in the new character. And the V slot we're looking for is 1. So if we save that, you'll see that we're actually, I guess let me show this so that it's a little bit clearer. PyPX solid green. Actually, what's the fun? Papaya whip. Love that one. Let's do it. OK, not very accessible, though. I like the name. OK, so we can see here that that is showing up on the left-hand side. And then all we need to do, if we want to swap it, for example, is just do V slot 2. And you can see it jumps from left to right. And so that's just like a simple implementation of a possible grid. And you can imagine when you start combining this with CSS, 
slotting stuff, stuff around, you get some pretty powerful stuff when it comes to responsive design as well. So let's go ahead and jump back into the code. As we can see here, we have a lot going on right now. And since we're talking about kind of a new concept in regards to fetching async data, let's go ahead and clean this up a bit, right? So I'm going to migrate this over into a separate scratch pad. And so inside of components, I'm going to just create a scratch pad.view file. And we're just going to migrate everything from app.view over. And that way, you have that as reference uh, for later on if you want to see exactly what happened. So we'll clean this up and keep this a standard. Uh, new, basically a news app. Great. And I'll go ahead and commit that to the branch. Let's see, get refactor, move code, uh, scratch, move code to scratch pad. All right, great. All right, so the question here is the data we've been working with so far, like if we take a look at scratch pad, Everything is something that we've defined ourselves. And we're assuming, basically, that we always have full control of the data. And if that were really the case for front-end development, I think our lives would be a lot easier. But the reality is we have to fetch data from the back end a lot of times, and we got to figure out how to deal with that. So if we take the tools that we have right now and think about how we might do that, let's go ahead and use the Poke API, uh, which is one of my favorites when it comes to working with sample data, uh, because I think Pokemon was a fun thing for me growing up as a kid. And so basically, this is a pretty impressive database in terms of being able to fetch things about individual Pokemon, fetch it by region. Uh, it's, it's darn impressive. So the URL we're going to be using, I'm going to go ahead and add a comment up here, is this pokeapi.com. And you'll notice the main thing is that it just fetches the Pokemon, and it limits it to the first 151. So in other words, the original 151 Pokemon. So our first goal here is to say, OK, how do we fetch that data down from the back end and actually render it onto our page? Well, first thing first, let's go and set up our app real quick. We'll export default and object. And for our reactive data property, let's go ahead and just have a Pokedex array. And then again, let me actually add some items in here so we can actually see it when we show it on the page. Let's go ahead and show that real quick to make sure everything's wired up correctly. And there you go, our array is showing up. The next thing we want to do is add some sort of method, right? Because we need to actually call this thing. So you might think, OK, so we have a method called fetch Pokemon. And it will use the fetch API. And then we'll go ahead and grab this URL up here. Whoops. There we go. And then what we need to do, though, is that oftentimes when you fetch data from the back end, you need to actually JSONify it. In other words, you need to like r convert it to JSON so you can actually parse it correctly on the front end. And so the way you do that is you take the response that you're given, and you do response.json. And so what we want to do, though, is we don't, we, we don't only want to fetch this. We want to actually assign this to our Pokedex, right? So we're going to do this top Pokedex equals fetch. But we're not quite done, because what? Fetch is an async operation. And right now, everything we're writing is in a synchronous operation. So in other words here, what we got to do is we got to say, hey, we have to wait for fetch to finish before we do this thing. And since we need to await the thing, we need to actually make sure we tell view, hey, by the way, this is an async function. This is going to happen um, asynchronously. Great, we have our method. And so, all right, we want to fetch the thing, right? So let's say, OK, so we have a button. And when we click the button, this is when we want to run that fetch Pokemon. So fetch Pokemon like that. Great, let's see what happens now. If we click, hey, everything's there just as we expect. This is exciting. But if we think about the real world scenario, while there are cases where you'll be running async functions on specific user interactions, the reality is a lot of times when someone's loading a page, that's probably when you're actually going to be wanting to fetch that data. And more importantly, you want to fetch it at a specific time frame. And so this is where the concept of lifecycle hooks comes into play when we're talking about front end frameworks. And I think most of them do have them. So let's take a look at the diagram for lifecycle hooks for Vue. And we're going to take a look at the one directly on the docs, because I want you all to be able to kind of get familiar with the docs, because Vue has an entire team dedicated to trying to make sure that the docs are as top notch as they can. And that basically, this information is free and available to you whenever you, it's time for you to dive into these problems. And so if we take a look at here, here we can see an actual diagram of how the life cycle works. And so you can see that view, what it starts to do is the renderer kicks it off, and then it runs a setup life cycle hook, which again, we'll talk more about later. But you can see that what it's doing is it's going through and at each of these steps where you see the rounded, outlined rectangle. So we have setup, before create, created, before mount. All of these are different points inside of the life cycle of a component. And what that means is you can actually basically interject different, point, uh, different code depending on where you need it to run. 
So for example, you see here that what is it doing? First, it, rent, it starts to encounter the component. It starts to initialize the options API. And then it starts to do some checks, basically, right? And then it starts to render the component. It'll actually mount the thing to the actual window. Basically, you're starting to actually see the thing. And then finally, if you're deleting something, it will unmount the thing from the DOM. And so to be clear, I do not expect any of you to understand like, the full like, effect of what's happening here. But suffice to know that you can refer to this at any point in the future when you're starting to get a little bit more nuance about where you want your code to run. For the purposes of our exercise, though, we have to think about it like this. When the component, if we wait for the component to mount before we actually start running the code to fetch, we know that asynchronous calls can take a while. And what we want to do is try to improve our user experience by ensuring that users get that data as quickly as possible, which means what? We want to actually try to initiate that fetch before the component even renders to the screen. That way, you call it, we try to time it so that by the time the component hits the screen, you're hoping that the async data basically has hopefully finished by then. And so if we take a look at where that is, basically the way to think of it in your head at this point is mounted is the point when the mounted lifecycle hook is when it's basically showing up on the screen. That's the way to think about it. And so in other words, you have the ability to say before mount. There's one right here. But then there's also a, a couple of steps happening before before mount. So actually, we even have the created lifecycle hook and the before create. But there's a key thing that you'll notice here, though, is that with before create, this is happening before the options API. And so what does that mean? I think it'll be easier if I show you this inside of the code. So let me go ahead and bump this over. OK. So if we take a look at this right now, we mentioned yesterday that passing an object in order to define how our component is working is called the options API. Because we see here, there are data, there are methods. And so similarly, we have the ability to call lifecycle hooks on it. So we have, what do we see earlier? Before create was one of them. And so before create can be a function that we run. And so all I'm going to do here is I'm going to log before create. And then we're going to log, we're going to try to log this.pokedex. And then we're going to log the created lifecycle hook. So basically, this is how you basically, this is basically how you're going to call the individual lifecycle hooks is by basically the name right here that we see here. This is a little small right now because of the mobile responsive. And then just basically calling it as a function. That's how you actually reference it. And so when created now, now we'll do a log create. And then this time, this is when it's been created. And this time, we'll log this.pokedex. OK, what's going to happen here? Well, if we take a look inside of our dev tools, you'll notice something here. Is that before create gets logged, but then this.pokedex does not exist. However, then once created does, you'll see that pokedex does exist. And inside of this proxy here, you'll see that inside of the target, which you want to open up, that's where you'll see the actual value of what's happening. And so if we think about it in another way, if we rearrange this for our mental model, before create is actually happening, all this stuff below here even exists. And so if that's the case, that means that when you're using the options API, before create is probably not actually the best place to be running an asynchronous function, because at this point, nothing exists. So what we want to make sure we do then is to basically say, when it's been created. Remember, created is not the same as mounted. There's a bunch of stuff happening before it's actually mounted to the page. Once it's been created, this is where we're going to say, let's kick off our function. So what we can do is we can then go this.fetch Pokemon. Now we save this, though. You'll see, boom. All of a sudden, without clicking anything, it did exactly what we wanted to, which is the user hit the page, the view did its thing to go fetch the data, it immediately showed up on the screen. OK. How do people feel about those concepts? Does that make sense? Question. Are those hooks promise aware if you were to return the, the, the promise that this fetch Pokemon? Would it pause continuation until it returned? So your question here is around whether the lifecycle hooks are aware. Oh, can you actually just return a promise yeah, instead? Yeah, like, would, would the created not continue until the promise resolves if you wanted to, like, for some reason, not yeah. mount, but until until the promise fully resolved. Before you actually move on to the next hook, basically. Yeah. So in this regard, like you don't want so run it. I don't see, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. Um, View usually has ways for you to break those things apart so that you can basically stop it. Um, and so this would be to to be clear. This is a little bit beyond the scope of the intro. So if this goes a little beyond what your current knowledge, don't worry. But basically, if you've heard of things like next tick, 
inside of code bases, that's where people are like manually like initi initiating different stages to ensure that like either different frames are being skipped or moved on. And so just know that if you're trying to intentionally stop it at the lifecycle hook, into the, into the you probably have to dig into it just to figure out how that will work. Because normally, if you try, as you can see, it tries to optimize it. Because normally you might even expect at this point, um, let me go back to the code. Oh, let me close that. This stuff that's Pokemon is an asynchronous function. And so, if you, so here's the thing. If we were to call the fetch directly here, and we did an await, uh, okay, so let me do this real quick, and then let's just const response equals this, and let's just log response. Okay. So, all right. You'll see already that view is yelling at me. Because if you call any sort of, uh, if you actually manually define it in a wait keyword inside of a lifecycle hook, it will ask that you actually define the async on that directly. However, since we're not doing that, since we actually have the async already defined on the function, this is why this code still works. But otherwise, to your question, yeah, I would just dive further in into how to get it to pause. But otherwise, you should be able to do what you want. So when it comes to lifecycle hooks, basically, I would say the ones to really know about are created, because that's usually where you're going to be running your async functions. And then if you really have something that you really want to happen like right when the component is mounted, then I've seen a lot of before mount or mounted used uh, for those scenarios where you might want to time either some sort of animation or that kind of thing. But otherwise, just know that create is kind of going to be your bread and butter when using the options API for doing asynchronous calls. OK. And so the other thing that I want to cover too, let's go ahead and actually commit this real quick. Pick status feature. Add Pokedex fetch API call rate. OK. So if we're taking a look at the code that we have right now, you'll notice that if you checked out the 09-begin branch, you'll notice there's a new project in here called C'est la Vue. And so for those not familiar with the French, C'est la Vue just means that it's life. This is life, and so this is Vue. Uh, and so inside of here, we actually do have a little bit happening here. So I do want to walk through this with you because Going forward for the rest of the day, I will try to sort of centralize the exercises around Say Love You in order to just provide like some context and basically give you the experience of walking into a project that either has already had some, call it legacy code, and that way you feel like you're working with stuff. But that said, I want to emphasize, if you feel more comfortable just working with your TV show forum app to apply these concepts, please feel free to do so. I just wanted to provide different context to allow you that practice of seeing what it's like uh, when working with code bases. So let's go and switch over in here real quick into Say Love You. And let's go ahead and run that. npm run dev. Great. And now if we open up here. Oh, it's on 7.4 now. Oh, that's right, because the other one's running. Makes sense. OK. Here we go. We have Say Love You. It's a very pr fairly simple app, but it has a little bit of styling this time, so not just raw HTML and whatever the browser provides. And we have a home and login page, or at least what appears to be. If we take a look at our app.view, you'll notice that there are, some, there are two components that are already pre-built for you. There's a home page and a login page. You'll notice, though, that at this point, there still is no, actually, you wouldn't notice. OK, actually, I can show you how you wouldn't notice this. If you look inside a package.json, you'll see there still is no router library. So there's no like paths being changed or anything right now. What we're doing here is that traditional single page application model, which is like every JavaScript trying to manage everything. Um, and so it's just routed there. And so what's actually happening here is you have this reactive data that's tracking which uh, the state of the current page, quote unquote. And so here we have two methods that assign the current page to home or login. And then down here, we have the ability to say, OK, well, if the current page is home, show this component. If it's the login page, show, or if, it's, if current page is login, or actually, in this case, it's an else. But as you can see, that's like your basic check to see what we're swapping between. So if we're taking a look at the code that we have right now, you'll notice that if you checked out the 09-begin branch, you'll notice there's a new project in here called Say La Vue. And so for those not familiar with the French, Say La Vue just means that it's life. This is life, and so this is Vue. Uh, and so inside of here, we actually do have a little bit happening here. So I do want to walk through this with you, because I will try to sort of centralize the exercises around Say La Vue in order to just provide like some context and basically give you the experience of walking into a project that either has already had some, call it legacy code, and that way you feel like you're working with stuff. But that said, I want to 
emphasize, if you feel more comfortable just working with your TV show forum app to apply these concepts, please feel free to do so. I just wanted to provide different context to allow you that practice of seeing what it's like uh, when working with code bases. So let's go and switch over in here real quick into Say Love You. And let's go ahead and run that. npm run dev. Great. And now if we open up here. Oh, it's on 7.4 now. Oh, that's right, because the other one's running. Makes sense. OK. Here we go. We have Say Love You. It's a very pr fairly simple app, but it has a little bit of styling this time, so not just raw HTML and whatever the browser provides. And we have a home and login page, or at least what appears to be. If we take a look at our app.view, you'll notice that there are, some, there are two components that are already pre-built for you. There's a home page and a login page. If you look inside a package.json, you'll see there still is no router library. So there's no like paths being changed or anything right now. What we're doing here is that traditional single page application model, which is like every JavaScript trying to manage everything. Um, and so it's just routed there. And so what's actually happening here is you have this reactive data that's tracking which uh, the state of the current page, quote unquote. And so here we have two methods that assign the current page to home or login. And then down here, we have the ability to say, OK, well, if the current page is home, show this component. If it's the login page, show, or if, it's, if current page is login, or actually in this case, it's an else. But as you can see, that's like your basic check to see what we're swapping between. Now here's the cool thing. This right here is great, but you can imagine that that list gets long. And again, for routing, eventually we're going to get into the library that allows to teach you how to switch routes. But if you have a list of components that you might need to swap in and out and make it dynamic, it's kind of hard to have that all managed out inside of your templates, right? Either the conditionals will get complicated. How would that actually work? So when it comes to dynamically swapping out components, Vue has a native component aptly called component. Because what you're doing is you're basically defining a generic component that JavaScript will basically help to define. So in the case of our app, for example, what we do is we pass it a prop called is. And this is a specially designed prop for the com native component. And so if we just do it manually ourselves, we can say, basically we can say, oh, we're going to the home page. And so in this particular case, you'll notice that home is basically being bound to a just like a plain string. And there's nothing special going on. And so if we think about it, this is really no different than just declaring your home page directly as a component, like rendering out on the screen. But what we'd like to do is actually make it something that is managed via JavaScript. And so what we could do in this particular case is we can say, you know what, let's do this. Let's create a computed property. And we'll call it, and this time, this one is called current page. And then we'll say render page. And the way render page will work, we'll say is uh, actually, yes, this is how it'll work. Return this.current page plus whatever. So basically, we're looking at the naming of the component here. In this case, it's home page. And so we can see now that because, whoops, let me go back. Okay. We can see now because we're only basically having the current page defined via the first part of it, via home and login, this means that we can basically tag it onto page. And if we save that now, do, do, yep, that's totally fine. And then bind this to render page. That's good. There you go. That's swapping in and out now. And so what's really cool about this now is that you basically get the ability to do some pretty complex logic things. And then more importantly, you can actually start then when it comes to really making your application dynamic and like having the back end define maybe which components your users prefer because you're managing a CMS site that might render out certain widgets. You might actually then do a loop through your V4 or there's like a bunch of things that you end up being able to do with this. But it's something I just wanted to expose to you all because as we go through, this concept is actually going to show up again uh, as we go through things like routing. OK, so for the exercise, we're actually going to be using a, one of my new favorite APIs called JSON Placeholder. If you haven't heard about it, it's pretty great. Because what it does is it basically provides a bunch of static data that requires no authentication key or anything. And what it allows you to do is it has a bunch of different uh, data sets that allow you to relate between them. So basically, we'll see here, we take a look at users, for example. Users has an ID. It has all this data ready for you. But then if you take a look at something like to-dos, you'll notice that it even has user ID, and it relates back to those users. 
And so what you basically have is rather than having like a dynamic database that oftentimes goes like either unmaintained or eventually goes out of service, this is really buzz this is really just a bunch of static JSON, but we get to request it as if it were from the back end. And so this is the J this is the um, this is the API that I recommend you all use uh, going forward when it comes to our exercises. And so for our exercise, you're going to be using the Sela View app. And this time, your product manager has come to you and says, we need a user page component. right? So we're going to give you some practice as far as basically go ahead and create that user page inside the component folder. And then inside of that component, go ahead and use that created lifecycle to go ahead and fetch all the users from that JSON placeholder API using what we just showed you. And then go ahead and render that however you see fit. And then go ahead and make sure you update app.view so that if you want to use that dynamic component, that it actually swaps it out correctly when you're using the navigation. Welcome back, everybody. How was the exercise? All right, yeah, it looks like people were successful. So no worries. In case you find that a little bit complicated, we're going to walk through the solution right now. So let's go ahead and do this. So oh, let me close that, bring that over here. Actually, you know what I do? I do want this as a reference. I'm going to bring this as a new tab. OK. All right. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to work in the Sela view. Uh, remember that if you are working in your TV forum app, you can go ahead and use whatever I'm doing in Sela view as like a, an example for how the solution should look in your app. OK. So I'm going to go ahead and check out the 09 branch uh, solution. So that's where this will live. OK. So first thing first, what do we want to do? We want to create a user page. All right. So what we're going to do inside of our components folder, user page dot view. And then I'm going to go ahead and let's set up the script block. And let's set up the style block. And so taking a look at what we have here, we have some basic styles. And so for now, I'm just going to kind of keep it straightforward in the sense that like, Let's just go ahead and pull what we already have. So I'm going to actually grab, I think, I think the login page is fine for me. So I'm going to go ahead and actually, you know what? Let's see, do, 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 do. Yeah, I'll just grab the login page. So I'll grab the login page, copy it over into our user page for now. And I'm going to actually delete these, or I'll leave them, because it'll actually be a great discussion point for later. And for now, we'll just call this users. We'll delete this stuff, and we'll just save. So now, if we go back, we are on the home page. We won't be able to see this yet. Why? Because we actually need to update the where we need to update our app.view so that we actually show that page. And so for now, we're just going to make it easy, and we're just going to say, okay, well by default, we're just going to show the user page. But we want to show the user page. What do we got to do? We got to import it because we're actually going to call that component. So that way, we call it, we register it. That way, it can actually be called later on. So we save that and refresh. Nothing's working. Why is that? Well, we need local dev running. Um, let me close that one. Great. There we go. OK. So we have our user page up and running, looking good. And so what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and fetch our users from this API right here. So following our best practices, we'll do the export default object. And inside of our created, we're actually going to go ahead and run a function. What we want to run? Ideally, we want something like this.fetch users. But we haven't written that. So let's go ahead and write that. So we'll create a methods here. And the methods option will contain fetch users. Inside of here, this is where we're going to go ahead and run our request. So we might have a this.user list equals what? We're going to fetch this API. And then we're going to take that response. And then we're going to JSONify it by running response.json. Now again, this is an asynchronous request. So we need the await keyword, and we need to tell it that it's async. Not quite done yet, though, because why? We have this, this user list. It hasn't been created yet. This is our reactive data. So we can go and go ahead and create that. And so we have our user list, and that'll be an array. And then we can save. All right, everything formats. It looks good. The code editor is not yelling, us, yelling at us anymore. And so we, ha we aren't seeing anything yet, and that's totally fine, because why? We haven't actually rendered it to the screen. So user list, there we go. We save, and we refresh. OK, now that we do it, great. We can actually see all our users here. But we're going to go ahead and pretty that up a little bit, because that is pretty hard to read. So I'm just going to do an unordered list. And for every one of these users, so user in user list, 
we're going to make sure, because we're using a v4 loop, we're going to assign it a unique key. And that key can be just be the ID, actually, that we have up here. So I'm actually going to say, uh, do, 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 I'm going to use an ES, the ES6 templating, though, to say user, user.id. And the reason for this is because this data set is on the simpler side as far as keeping the IDs just numbers. And so I do know in advance that there will be other elements that also have very simplistic IDs. And so prevent that from colliding, because when it does, Vue will tell you inside of the console log, hey, by the way, I'm seeing duplicate keys for elements. And that will create all sorts of havoc for you. So try to keep them unique whenever you can. Um, again, normally these will be UUIDs, and you don't have to worry about it. And then we can basically render out the user.name. And then let's go ahead and just, uh, then let's just do the, what would be fun to do? Let's do their website then. And then we have user.website, save. There we go. And we can see now, if we refresh, OK, we got a lot going on. Now, for a second here, I panicked because I was like, why are we seeing double? The reason we're seeing double is because we have the pre-element still there. So we save that now and refresh. There you go, much better. And now we have all our users being rendered on the page. And is there a way with the uh, dev tools to see the unique IDs of those items? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we take a look at what the context here is, is that this dynamic key that we're assigning, in this case, user-1 and so forth, the question here is around the idea of if there's any way to expose that. And so honestly, off the top of my head, we can see here that if we're looking at the browser dev tools, there's nothing actually indicating what the keys are. And if we take a look at view dev tools, uh, we can see here that one of the nice things about DevTools is that it makes it very clear how you can expose the different properties of it. But it does look like at first glance, there's nothing obvious kind of indicating its individual keys. Like we can inspect the elements in here and all the data in here, so in case you're ever debugging anything. And what's a nice little bonus about this too, actually, is that the DevTools allow you to modify it directly. So if we come in here and just call, like add like Selena as a middle name, you'll see that it'll actually update it directly. So it allows for a kind of a quicker feedback loop in case you're wondering like if your data set is doing something specific with your code. You can just play around with it right there rather than like call it going back to your component and faking the data set. Like the, the DevTools allows you to kind of do that in a centralized way. I wonder, can I do key equals render page like that? Oh, OK, great. So we did discover this at the bare minimum through this exercise. If you provide keys to your components, these are showing up in your dev tools. So there's something to be said where if you're at the point where you're probably debugging keys, at least for your components, it probably is helpful to, I mean, to be honest, if we're thinking about like a real world scenario, the user page would be displaying probably a user card component. And then those should show those. And so. Um, for the sake of actually demoing that, because this is actually something that does occur in uh, apps. So let's do a user card real quick. And then I'm just going to go ahead and drop that. We're going to drop this li. We're going to keep it simple. We're just going to assume all user cards are always list elements. And then I'm not going to worry about that piece. <clears throat> and then we're going to go ahead and quickly just define a prop. Default props. And they'll get a user type of object. And required is true. Save. And then inside of user page now, we can actually import said user card. And then there we go. Just use the autocomplete for that. And then the components. There we go. And then again, drop a user card in here. And then we can then say user card is what we're going to use here. We're going to worry, not worry about that. And then we're just going to make sure we pass user um, inside of here, like that. That should self-close, save, OK. That should do the trick. It looks like everything's working. And to validate this real quick, what we're going to do is we're going to add a quick CSS class called user card. And I'm just going to say user card has border 2px solid. Uh, let's just keep it simple. Let's just do like a black, and then just like a padding of 10 pixels. There we go. OK, so our cards are rendering. We have our user page here rendering our list of cards, which looks good. And now, if we go ahead and now open the dev tools, we should see, which I think I saw a glimpse of that a second ago. There we go. 
the keys are showing up in this case. So it does look like if you want to inspect the DOM element one, that remains to be a little bit elusive. But that said, it's still a worthy question worth investigating into. On the topic of keys, are those keys, um, do they need to be unique on a globally all items rendered on page, or is it kind of scoped to the component? So if your component renders one list, is it safe to just use key one, two, three, four? Yep. Oh, sorry. The, the yep was acknowledging the question. OK. So to the question here is around the scoping of keys, right? Because we talked about scoping of data, right? Data is scoped to the components, and we have to be very explicit about how it's shared. Keys, however, are different because it has to do with whatever's on the page. So there's no scoping in regards to keys. And this is very important in particular when it comes to animation and transitions, is because if you want Vue to start managing some of those pieces, those keys do really need to be unique. Otherwise, you'll start seeing weird glitches of like Vue trying to calculate how to move things around and like two or three things at once. And so, yeah, I would treat keys as a universal thing. This is why knowing the data set that I have, um, let me close this. Knowing the data set that I have, that is why I prefixed it with user, so that later we can have like photos or comments or whatever we, whatever we decide to extend upon. So good question, though. Cool. So we have the ability to go back here to home and login, but we don't have a user link. So let's actually just make sure we wrap that up properly. So for now, we're just going to keep it simple here. You might notice, though, when you're inspecting the nav that I'm doing something a little bit hacky. One is that this is technically an anchor link, but the anchor link doesn't go anywhere. It technically goes to the top of the page. But on the click event, you'll notice that I'm adding this modifier dot prevent. If you're not familiar with this, think of it like a form. Form is the one where I, I typically show off the prevent. And so what happens a lot of times when you have forms on an HTML page? You want to actually stop the event from submitting and then do some stuff before you submit it. And so typically, what do you have to do? If you had a submit form that was like submit you know, registration, Inside of your submit registration function, you'd have to run what? You'd have to get the event. You have to run event.prevent default. Well, Vue was like, wait, we do this so often. Why is that code polluting really logic that's separate from it? That's really just basically a logistical implementation. So by adding dot prevent to your submit, it automatically basically executes on that prevent default event so that your code can be cleaner and you don't have to worry about. Basically, it's easier to modularize things. Because otherwise, your functions have always this context of being attached to an event, which might not always be true. So uh, this is a, a kind of uh, some, some tactic sugar that's useful uh, that's being used. And so in this case, I'm using click.prevent to prevent it from actually doing the navigation. Again, to be very clear, this is hacky, because right, we are going to get into official routing, and so we can change URLs and those sort of things. But for the sake of practice right now, this is why we have it. All right, that said, we have an href. Again, following just the same model, click.prevent. And this time, we're going to show user page. User, that looks good. And then here, show user page. This dot current page equals user. OK. OK, that looks good. Before we move on, though, what I do want to cover, there was a question in the chat, uh, which is actually a great one, regarding how do you actually generate unique keys on the front end? And so to be clear, so the thing that I've shown you uh, over this workshop, let's see, if we take a look at here, OK, line 32. As you can see, this is something that I've cobbled together myself, right? I'm using ES6 template literal to say, I'm going to guess at a unique data type, which is user, and then I'm just going to attach the ID to it, even though I know the ID is kind of not as unique. And so this works, I think, when you're just prototyping and working on things. But obviously, on an enterprise grade application, that becomes a very different matter, right? Because user, like, you're all of a sudden contingent on the fact that someone made the right choice to scope the name correctly. And that's not something we ever want to rely on in terms of like reducing human error. So when it comes to actually generating unique IDs, granted, ideally, your backend is doing that for you. But in the event you're not actually getting that information, um, the NPM module I really highly recommend is the UUID module. And so basically, how it works is you'll install UUID on your project. And you basically, as you can see here, you import it at the top of your file. And then as part of like creating the new form, so actually, this does happen a lot if you're creating like on the front end side especially, creating new data that you might be sending to the back end. So you might actually have a case where I'm going to just pseudocode this. We're not going to install it, because that would just add to the load. But for the sake of demoing this, 
uh, let me just go ahead and at the top here. So you can imagine that we, what we would do is we would say, we would copy this line, to say, okay, we, we're gonna use the UUID library. And then again, assuming we had a new method called like add, oh, why is that doing that? Okay, add new user. You could then say this.userList.push, and when you create that new object, this is where you're gonna go, the ID is going to be uh, do, 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 um, UUID v4, run like this. And then typically you probably would have some new user object that you have in your reactive data that contains like name, again, let's say Ben. And so what I typically do is I just spread out everything from this.newUser, and then I basically override, in, in case there's any IDs that are attached to it, this ensures that it's being generated on the fly, and then that's basically how I would approach generating a unique ID on the front end. All right, we're here. Took us a little while, but we're here at Composition API, and it's time to talk about the brand new thing that is with Vue 3. The first thing I want to caveat when it comes to the Composition API is that even though it was introduced in Vue 3, there actually are ways to use it on Vue 2. So that is one of the things that the team has tried to work really hard on, is that even though there are certain performance optimizations and uh, sort of like TypeScript enhancements that have come with Vue 3, as a whole, when it comes to feature parity, the team has actually worked really hard to try to keep it as basically cross-compatible as humanly possible because they know a lot of times people, when they're working on enterprise apps, as much as developers would love to be on the cutting edge tool, the reality is, is that most of the time there's just no time to do that. And so rather than have developers be kind of feeling left out of the fact that they might want to rewrite their components using comp Composition API, we basically have plugins that allow you to plug in the Composition API into Vue 2. So again, while this is a Vue 3 feature, just know that you can use this in Vue 2, you just need to look into the plugin. All right, so Composition API, let's talk about it. So remember this lifecycle uh, diagram that we talked about earlier? Up here, you'll notice in blue, there's a very special lifecycle hook that's called setup. And so setup has a very special meaning for us in Vue because why? Anytime you basically see the setup keyword, the lifecycle hook, you are basically ensured that you're using Composition API. As in, and I think that's one reason why the diagram here actually has it in parentheses. It's because, as we can see here, prior to the setup function, there is nothing else. And so this is what's interesting about the Composition API is that it happens before the Options API. So what does that really mean? So we take a look at our code. I'm gonna hop into the playground so that we can just kind of code some stuff without messing up, say, la view. So go into the playground, and then we'll npm run dev. Boom, okay, we have our Pokedex act, app, and it's running. All right, so let's go ahead and see what is going on here. Um, oh, for whatever reason, it did not open it, the actual folder. There we go. Okay. So close this, close this. We're in Playground right now. If we take a look at our app.view, you'll notice here that we're running a fetch and we're doing all this stuff inside of created. Now, I mentioned that the setup function actually happens before init. So actually, if you think about asynchronous functions, they really should be run in the setup function because that's its earliest point of starting uh, sort of like the component lifecycle. So how that might look is that we actually would have a setup function that's up here at the top. And the reason I think it's important to organize your code this way and putting setup at the top is because everything else below it does not exist. And it's useful to kind of think of it this way. Is that, ah yes, this is what I'm doing inside of here. Now, the thing that makes the Composition API particularly unique when it comes to Vue is that it, everything inside of here is truly vanilla JavaScript. So in other words, there's, so what we can't just go like, oh, data, function, return, you know, like Pokedex, like all this stuff is gone, because why? Composition API is about, let's say, I guess we'll call it freedom and flexibility. One of the advantages of Options API is that it provides a very consistent way for you to add stuff. Here's where my data goes, here's where my methods go, here's where my computer properties go. But over time, as people have scaled their applications and components, there are times where people found that they wanted to actually group things uh, according to their concerns and maybe find ways to organize their codes in different ways. And Composition API lets you do that. But what that means, though, is that it's a free-for-all in that you have to organize everything yourself. So in the instance of setup, Let's say we want to create a, let's have a reactive name variable in this case for the region of Pokemon that this is tracking. So the first thing is to remember, this is vanilla JavaScript. So we actually have to declare the variables manually now. 
So const, uh, let's see, region name equals Kanto. Great. Now here's the thing, though. When we actually look at this, let's look inside of DevTools and look at our app, we'll see here that nothing exists right now. Only the Pokedex is showing up. And the reason for that is because once you're inside of setup, Vue is not doing any magic for you. You have to actually start being very explicit about what's happening. So the thing about the composition API is that inside of here, Vue is not doing any magic for you. So unlike when we're inside of data and methods where you can just call the this context and it knows to like, like this that Pokedex and knows to go inside of data to go get the Pokedex, like inside of here, everything is like, OK, you want a freedom? Here's freedom. And so what does that mean? That means that at the end of setup, we actually have to manually return anything we want to expose. And at first, that might sound a little bit redundant, right? You're like, wait, why would I want to do that? Well, because what you see now inside of the DevTools is that, check it out, the region name is appearing. And the reason for that is because when you're writing the JavaScript up here, you probably don't want everything being exposed to your component. There are times certain things might be, call it private, and there are things where like, you're running calculations that aren't relevant to the template, to the rest of the component. And so that you can keep all up here. And what you're doing here is then you're returning it. And so when you return it, now it's actually something that you can actually access. So let's say inside of this created method, now it can be like log this dot region name. And so we'll see now inside of here, there you go. The created lifecycle hook now has access to the data that we set up inside of setup. Didn't mean to do that, but that's how it worked out. OK. So the question here is, all right, well, I kind of want, I want to run the, I want the ability to run an async function at this point, right? And so your first instinct might be like, well, okay, this makes sense. What we're going to do here is we're going to create a const of Pokedex, and we'll just copy over this await function, and then we'll just make sure that setup is async, because this is an await. And then we'll return the Pokedex here. And let's keep that actually alphabetical. And then you might, OK, and then since we're returning it anyways, you don't need to define the data twice. So there we go. And then we actually don't even need this method anymore, right? Because we just refactored it. And then, well, we're not even, we're running this inside of here. So actually, now that I think about it, we could just say uh, we just need to delete this. And then ideally, we could then just say this.pokedex. So we just see the region name and the Pokedex show up. But you're going to see Vue yelling at you in a pretty big way. And I wanted to show this error because most of the time, this is not going to be something you run into. But especially when you're getting started um, and you see this error, it's probably going to be a bit confusing. Because you're going to look at this, and if we read it, it says that the setup function returned a promise, but no suspense boundary has been defined. And that's a lot of words, right? You're like, what the heck is going on? Well, so just to let you know, what is suspense? So we look inside of the docs. Suspense is another built-in component that is experimental currently with Vue. And the idea behind this is that it's trying to help us better offload performance when it comes to asynchronous options. Um, so in the sense of like when you're loading something asynchronously, you can have a fallback. So the way that code works, as you can see here, is that do do do. You can see here. So you would load a, you would drop in your suspense component. And you say, okay, this is my dashboard that I'm loading a bunch of async stuff happening. But in case that fails, or frankly, it's not ready for me yet, I'm going to go ahead and fall back to this template. This syntax should look familiar to you because earlier we talked about slots. And so here is that v slot fallback, and this is just this is already defined on the suspense component. And so what you'll see, what you'll end up seeing on the page is you'll see loading first, and whenever it's ready, v will automatically switch it over to the dashboard. And so this is actually really useful. But the key thing here, though, to understand, though, uh, especially at this point in the recording, is that it is experimental. So this is why, at this moment, we're not going to go into depth regarding how to use it and that kind of thing. Keep an eye on the docs if you want to play around with it. But know that this will probably be a pretty key part of a lot of framework approaches going forward, as a lot of frameworks are trying to figure out better ways of server-side rendering different things and how to improve performance when it comes to loading JavaScript on a page and so forth. Now, when it comes to our error, though, the reason this is a problem at this particular point in time is because if we think about it from the, like the, dot, the tree itself, the app.view is the root component of everything. 
So you can't really suspend your root component in a state of nothingness. That doesn't work. And so what you actually have to do that, in the case that you really do need to do asynchronous operations in Composition API, this is where you need to put it into a component. Because the app.view basically needs to be in a stable state that's like, OK, I know where everything is. And then this component over here is going to do some stuff. I'm going to hang on to it and give it a backup. And then I can do other stuff over here. But if we spend app.view, the whole thing basically, like, because of how asynchronous operations work, it just runs the risk of corrupting it. right? So this is why we don't run async setup at the root level at app.view. So to show how this works, then, is we're going to go ahead and create a component called Pokedex. And this is where we're going to go ahead, and then we'll have our script tag. And we'll have our template. If it would autocomplete, sometime Emmet is uncooperative with me. OK, great. So let's go ahead and blow this up into two columns so that's easier to follow. We'll go ahead and bring over this asynchronous request right here. Actually, we can bring over the whole script block. What am I talking about? Bring over the whole thing, which is great. And then this means that this script block is actually no longer needed on this app. Although, actually, we do need a script block because why? We need to actually import our Pokedex. So Pokedex from uh, components, Pokedex.view. And then we can register it on the components. And then we have Pokedex, like that. We get a case mix-up in the Do we have a case mix-up? Oh, we do. I did that again. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Um, this is the sometimes the trouble with the context switch. OK, so inside of here, we'll have our template here for the pre-fetch. We don't even need this anymore, this button. So all this is going to do is render that as a pre-block. I mean, we can take this here, and then we get the Pokedex like this. OK, so let's take a look and see if this worked out the way we wanted it to. OK, so first thing first, we'll see that when we're taking a look at this right now, it's still yelling at us. But we actually are seeing something rendered, at, unlike before. And it's because in this particular case, it's true. We still need to actually suspend uh, um, component at this point. And so like I said, we're just going to cover a high level usage of it. We're not going to dive deep into suspense as a component. Because again, if we think about it from a view, the view perspective, is that view is saying, I don't know what to do with this yet. So please give me some sort of fallback so that in case this thing completely crashes, we don't have this hanging component that's not going to do anything. So we bring in our suspense component, and we say, OK, this is what I want you to render. But in case things don't work, here's the fallback, where we'll say loading Pokedex data, just like that. Um, boom. Suspense, suspense, suspense. Yep. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, yes, I already know that. OK. So why is, let's restart the server real quick, just to make sure that's not anything weird getting botched. You don't have to import suspense? No, import. It's kind of like the global um, component. It's just a global component that's registered. Now, what's weird? Oh, I forgot. Yep. OK. So inside of here, you're thinking, ah, I did the suspense right, right? I did it inside of my component because I gave it a fallback. But this approach doesn't work because if we think about it another way, it's happening at the child level. And if we look at the error matches again, it actually says that the suspense boundary needs to be found at the parent tree. Because if we think about it another way, remember how we used to do the vif? This is the same kind of concept, where you want the vif actually happening at the top for something like suspense, because it knows what to handle. So if I go ahead and delete this stuff again, this time we can actually say, we'll have a suspense component here that will then render out the Pokedex component when it's ready, Otherwise, fall back to this text. That's actually what's happening here. And once we do that, there we go. Now everything is working as expected. And so again, the API for suspense is experimental. But this mental model now of having the ability to suspend your component and then have it switch out with um, some sort of fallback is something that is growing to be more popular with frameworks, not just Vue. And so something that I wanted you all to keep in mind when it came to that. So here's the thing. We have a region name. We have the Pokedex. This all looks pretty good. Except if we take a look at this, actually, and let's say we wanted to change the region name. This is actually pretty common. So let's say we want to say, let's do an H2, and this is the region name. 
There we go. We see Kanto here. And actually, let me, there you go. Now it's not being clicked. Okay. So if you want to change this, you might be thinking, well, OK, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to say inside of, we'll create a method here, just to make things very uh, clear, that says change region name. And then this dot region name is going to be equal to Hoen after this. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a button. Uh, actually, no, that's going to be at the bottom of a very long list. Equals change region name. And then change region name. Save. OK. So, so far, again, just to recap, we want to be able to change the region name. So we created a button that, that runs this function that should, as we've been practicing already, just change Kanto to Hoen. So we say that and click. You'll, you'll notice that nothing is happening. And this might feel weird, because after all, isn't this what we've been doing this entire time? The secret to this lies in the fact that what we talked about when we covered setup, which is that everything in here is vanilla JavaScript. So what you're returning here, while Vue will go ahead and register it to the rest of the component, there's no reactivity attached to it right now. Because why? It's a plain JavaScript const. It's a constant. And the same thing is happening with Pokedex. In other words, all the stuff that we were talking about regarding reactive data, computer properties, that will not work with this. Because at this point, it's not reactive. So how do we bring some reactivity? Well, the way we do that is actually by using view helper methods. And so we mentioned that earlier, where a really popular thing now with view 3 is the ability to parse out different functions to kind of help people use it in different contexts. Well, there is a helper method for turning something into a reactive reference. And the way we do that is we import from view, and we destructure out this method called ref. As again, if you think of ref, think of reactive reference. And so how does that work? Well, what we do is we actually just wrap the value that we want to be reactive inside of this helper method. That's what we do. And so now if I refresh this, and we change it, you'll notice it's now actually being tracked by view. And so this ref and a lot of the concepts we'll be talking about is actually really critical because going forward, whenever you're working inside of Composition API, you have to be very explicit about when you want view to introduce magic. And so this is actually one of the things I do think that's beneficial to the Composition API is because now you know exactly where view is coming in to do things. Whereas in the Options API, you could argue that the this context could be confusing for JavaScript developers. And what if they wanted to come in and change some stuff, right? Composition API is your ability to get at the primitives and say, OK, this is the stuff I want to do. And then view, do your magic for this, this kind of stuff. And so for example, right, if we wanted to say, let's actually have ability to have like an all caps region name. Well, the way we could easily do that is we can have a computer property. That's how I would approach this. So we'll say region all caps. And actually, I'll just be more specific, region name, all caps. And what do we need, How We need a computed property. And guess what? The helper method is computed. So we have a computed property. But what we need to do inside of our computed property is we need to run a function. Because if we look back at our other apps that use computed, so let's go back into another component that uses it, you'll see that all of our computed properties actually are functions, which makes sense because they need to run a computation on the things that are the dependencies. So we have an arrow function in here. And what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and we're going to return, just like we did before, we're going to turn the region name to uppercase. This is probably our first instinct as far as how we would make this work. And so to make sure this works, we got to make sure we return this to region name all caps, just like that. And then let's go ahead and expose that here as an h3. Region name all caps, just like that. And we'll save. And you might notice that, well, something's broken. What's going on? Well, it's saying region name by two uppercase is not a function. You might be thinking, oh, this is weird. But region name is a string, right? It's not. Yeah, it's not a string anymore. It is now a reactive reference, which actually some of you have noticed when you're doing the inspecting the element. Let's go ahead and actually log region name at this point and see what we get. If I refresh that, that's fine. We get a, a massive error. And you'll see things like uh, the ref implementation. You also might have seen as well in your when you're doing the options API, you saw proxies show up when you would log out a value. 
And I know that was confusing at first to some people because they're expecting to just see what the value actually is. But one of the big rewrites of Vue 3 when it came to the reactivity engine is that it's using pro the JavaScript proxies underneath in order to manage how all the dependencies are being tracked. And so again, you don't need to understand how proxies work um, for you to be familiar with uh, or basically to work with Vue. But in case you, that's something you're interested in, I just wanted to give you sort of like a little bit of a preview of that so that you can always dive into that if you want to learn more about that. But you'll notice here that once again, region name is not a string. What is it? It's a ref implementation because it's a reactive reference, meaning the way we actually get to the value of it is actually to basically think of it as an object now. It's an object that has abilities to update it, its dependencies. And so when we actually want to access the raw value of a reference, we have to actually unpack the thing. And the way we do that is by saying dot value. And you'll notice, once you do that, everything works. Now, this might feel a little bit odd after using the options API for a little while, because after all, in the past, or actually not even in the past, if we wanted to, we could have theoretically com created a computed property at this level. And just for the sake of having comparison, this would be a region name lowercase. And so what we would do here is return this dot region name dot to lowercase. Just like that. And then we'll just add another h3 for region name all. OK. Oh, no, no. It looks like it's just, just lowercase. Yeah. OK, save. OK. So. Oh, that happens to work. Let me let me see, let me have a differentiate the differentiator here. There we go. Okay, sentence case, all case. Okay. So you might be thinking, well, this is way nicer, right? Like, why do I want dot value? And I'll say, when I first was exposed to this, I would agree. <laughs> it definitely feels odd, but there is something to understand about the reason why this is actually helpful is because we do have to remember that. When you're working in vanilla JavaScript, it is important to be able to tell when something is view, when something is not. And so if we think about const region name, the fact that you actually have to unpack the value does signify to people that when they're working with this particular value that it's already attached to the view reactivity. That said, I wanted to give you the pros of how people see that, because a lot of people do like ref. But in the event you're like, Oof, I really don't like ref, what you can do instead is you can do this helper method called reactive. And so what reactive is, is basically think of the data option from the options API packaged in a nice little helper function. Because earlier, there was a question regarding around the fact that, what if I don't like the name data? What if I want to call it state? Well, we can. In this case, state, it's a reactive object. And inside of here, let's just say, uh, I'll just do like region two and I actually don't know a third region. It's fine. OK, I'll, I'll just do element type, and let's say lightning. OK. So when you're doing the state, first of all, I'll go ahead and log out state. What you end up getting is something that looks like a lot more of what people are probably expecting when they're actually in, uh, expecting element, which is the proxy. This is what we've seen earlier when we actually inspected the options API element in that you have to look at the target in order to get underneath it. But what's nice about this now is that, again, this is going to be misplaced. But if we do state dot element type dot to uppercase and run it, you'll see it actually just works. And so the way to think of reactive is it's like a, a nicely packaged way of collecting your refs together and that you don't have to unpackage it with dot value. And so there are plenty of code bases I've seen that people never touch ref. They like state. Or sorry, they like reactive. Because reactive feels like composition, or sorry, it feels like options API, but you're in the composition API uh, setting. And so is there a right or wrong way to do this? Absolutely not. Um, so for the sake of having this example also be here, I'm just going to say element type all caps. And then we'll make sure to return this here, make it alphabetical. And then I'll just make sure it's here. And then we should be good. OK. So there we have it. This is the fundamentals around Composition API. As far as the highlights to consider for this, once again, is that you're now in freeform JavaScript land. So this is where I would say comparing Options API to Composition API is that Options API, you don't need as much JavaScript to get up and running, I would argue. 
And I've seen that before with people who have just enough to understand the syntax where because of the this syntax, they were able to just kind of get in there, make some changes, make some swaps. And the templating was easy enough that people without a lot of JavaScript experience could actually be productive on a code base. With something like this, however, when it comes to the composition API, as you can see, there's a lot more going on. You need to understand helper functions. You need to know about modules. You need to go ahead and make sure you know if you're using ref that it's a dot value. The, the skill cap jumps considerably when it comes to the amount of JavaScript you need to know in order to be um, productive with composition API. What I want you to try to do is you're going to go ahead and take that users page that you were working on again. And this time, see what you can do on that component to actually use the setup function to refactor at the bare minimum the fetch data. And then if you have the time, feel free to go ahead and practice using the ref, reactive, computed, or whatever you prefer. All right, how did that feel for everyone? I know that we did some pairing here uh, in the room, but people online kind of let me know how, how that experience went if you have questions. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and start walking through the solution to see how I would approach this. OK, so let's go ahead and dive into the code. As we can see here, what we want to do is we want to migrate the stuff we've been doing, especially as far as the fetch stuff, into our setup function. So let's go ahead and start doing that. First thing first, again, I always like to put my setup before data as a reminder to myself that this is not going to actually uh, be able to access anything below it, right? It can, go top, it can go top down, but there's nothing going bottom up. So let's do a couple things. Let's see. Uh, all right. So this method here, async functions, let's start actually by moving the data. The data here, I'm going to go ahead and use the reactive, since that's something that at least feels a little bit more familiar to people, um, I think, when they're first getting um, when we're first getting started with Composition API. So we'll import reactive from view, and we'll create that state, which is going to be a reactive object. And inside of there, I'm going to have this thing called user list, and user list will then be this array. And so this allows me to then get rid of this data property. The only thing we need to do now is actually return the state here. And then to show that this works, what we can do is you can say this.state.userList. And then if everything should still work, the only thing we need to change is here, state.userList. When we save that, let's go and see. We refresh. Oh, it's down because why? Because there's no local dev running. OK. There we go. You can see everything's still working. All right, so refactored, step one, good to go. Next thing we need to do, the main thing we want to do is this function of methods. And so some of you caught on because you might be thinking, wait, is there like a methods thing that I need to import from view? And the answer is no. Because when we, we introduced methods earlier, remember what I said. Methods are really just JavaScript functions that view has access to. So in other words, there's nothing special about them because they're JavaScript functions. So what we can do is we can take this, and we can copy this here, and basically say this is an async function called fetch users. Now, before we move on, though, there's a couple things that's going to break. One, we know for a fact that this does not work anymore. Because why? We're not in Options API. We're in Composition API. So we have this state here that's deleted. And then this is currently state.userList. We we'll equal that. And we have the async here. And so what we need to do is let's go ahead and also do, we also don't have, or actually, wait, there's the function there. That's fine. And then let's go ahead and start by returning it. We'll slowly refactor this so we can see it step by step, piece by piece. Bum, 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 bum. There's that. Now we save this, though. You'll notice everything seems to still be working. Um, and so we'll see that hello, hello. And so the, here's the thing, though, is that right now, fetch users has a very like, implicit tie to our state right now. In other words, if we wanted to fetch users in another context, we would then need to create another function, theoretically. But this is JavaScript, this is programming. We don't want that. That's something that wouldn't make a lot of sense. And so what you'd probably want to do is actually separate the state assignment here from the function itself. So in other words, what we'd like to do is actually say state.userList out here is equal to what happens when we run fetch users. That's actually what we'd like to do. And so what we'd really want is to basically kind of return the response that comes from this. So when you're looking at this and you're looking at the return, you might think, OK, I'm just going to return the promise. Now, 
apparently when it comes to returning promises inside of you, uh, it gets a little bit tricky because then you have to manage like resolving the promise and that kind of stuff. And so at least for me, what I try to do actually is I will actually just create the response that's being awaited. So basically this const response. And what I do is return the response directly. And that's what's being returned rather than returning the entire promise itself. And that's what should allow this thing to assign itself to this. But before we finish, though, remember that fetch users is an async function, which means what? We need the await keyword here. And if we need the await keyword here, what does that mean? We also need the async key all the way up here inside of setup. And if we save that, we get our predictable yelling at us message. And the reason for that is because why? Because the parent is like, whoa, 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 you have this thing that's doing async function. It might be broken. Give me something to fall back on. So let's go and fix that. If we go inside of app.view, inside of Cela view, we have this component here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it in a suspense component. And then we'll have our template with the v slot of fallback. And then what we'll do here is then go uh, data is loading, save. And if you actually saw the small blink, it actually does do the data is loading because view actually is waiting for something. So granted, again, for your production level apps, you probably will want some sort of nice loading page um, and whatnot for that. But for now, we're just doing it with simple text. But now, if we take a look, it looks like everything is working as expected. Now, the thing is, though, we're actually doing a double call here, um, if you realize it, in that we're returning this fetch users method, but it's actually already being called inside of your setup method. So really, we don't even need this here. So we can actually delete our entire created lifecycle hook. And what you have now here is basically your entire user page using the composition API within the options API. And everything is working as expected, thankfully. So we're on to our next section regarding composition API with script setup. All right, so let's context set a bit here. When we take a look at this user page, you'll notice that, well, most of our component is actually in Composition API. Like minus the component, the components registration right here, everything else is Composition API. And so Vue was certainly, when we were looking, thinking about the developer experience of working with Composition API, it was a bit like, well, OK, this is cool, right? We can break stuff up. We can go ahead and write our JavaScript in a way that's kind of more natural for us. We can group it the way we want. But then like, the fact that we have to constantly write our returns gets a little bit tedious, especially when you have a lot of things to return. That's now something you have to manage in two different places, right? You have to define what you're going to do, then you're going to return it. Couldn't Vue be a little bit smarter about this somehow? And so this is where things like build tools are really great. Because with Vue 3.2, we introduced a compiler optimization uh, where it allows us to actually fully buy into the composition API while saving us uh, some code space, and more importantly, allowing us to be more succinct and concise. And so let me show you what I mean by that. So let me go ahead and go over to the playground, and let's go into the Pokedex. All right. So the Pokedex, similar to what we had earlier, is basically mostly bought into the composition API. In fact, there's only a couple of things we need to do to fully change it. And so for now, uh, let's see, computed. In fact, this was a made up thing. So we're going to go ahead and delete computed from here, because we don't need this region name lowercase. And then methods change region name, again, was something we decided to do uh, just to sort of change things. So we'll go ahead and migrate that, because what are methods? Methods are JavaScript functions. So const change region name equals a function, where we say region name. And region name, in this particular case, is a ref, which means we need to unpack it. And it's going to be Hoenn. Once we have that, we can return that to our template. And then there we go. And then we don't need to log any of this. So now we should be back in a similar state to what we had earlier when we had the user page. OK, so let me go ahead and actually check out branch 11 begin. There we go. And then we'll check out branch 11 exercise. And let's commit this change real quick. Feature update uh, Pokedex to be full, almost fully composition API. OK. So what is script setup? Well, script setup is exactly as it sounds in that what you do is you add an attribute to your script block called setup. And what that does is it tells Vue this entire block is going to be composition API. 
Like, no options will exist in here. So what does that mean? Well, first thing first, there's no more object, because that's what options, options API is all about, it's about defining this object. So export default disappears. Then we can save that. But that's still going to break, which is totally fine, because you know why? We already know that it's in setup. So this line 5, this async setup here, also not necessary. Delete. Save. Better, but here's the other thing. Um, because we're now in a compiler optimization, meaning Vue can now do a lot more static analysis and those sort of things, we don't even need to return anything either. And believe it or not, this block of code here, in fact, let me just delete the console logs here. This is whole thing just works. You just sold me. <laughs> I was super skeptical until this moment. Um, yeah, this is the mic drop moment for those who are thinking about composition API. This is, this makes a lot of people excited, especially for those users who are heavier on the JavaScript side. Or more importantly, if you're even thinking about TypeScript, Composition API works with TypeScript like naturally in terms of like annotating types and all that stuff. We don't have time to talk about this today, but there's a Vue 3 and TypeScript workshop that just actually released recently. So if you want to check that out to learn more about how that might work together, you can totally check that out. So, um, but there you go. This is how you get a component to fully opt into Composition API while not having to worry about any of the eight. Like, uh, one of the things actually that you might be thinking though is that we had an async earlier, right, on our setup. But when you're in the script setup, basically Vue hoists and does all the async stuff for you so that you don't have to manually uh, assign it here. It'll automatically detect the async stuff and do what it needs to do. And so just like that, we have now have a component that's fully opted into Composition API, no options anywhere. The only thing I will add is because this is probably wouldn't be the most intuitive, is that let's say we wanted to add our base button inside of this layout. All we do is you do base button, we import it. Uh, let me do this base button. And believe it or not, just by importing it, you've already registered it. So I can come down in here now and just go base button like that. And you can see there's our base button. So, a little bit of show and tell. Does anyone have any questions about what they've seen so far? I have to imagine that in practice, this really forces you to make concise components because it's going to be a mess if your component does <laughs> And you bring up an excellent point. So, as we can see here, right now the code is fairly short, easy to follow, but you can imagine it's very easy for a team to get carried away with this and spaghetti code can become very problematic very quickly. Again, one of the things I want to emphasize is that there are trade-offs when you go the options route versus the composition API route. And understanding those trade-offs are, if we think about it, are what make us experience as engineers. And so knowing that, you just have to realize that composition API means there's flexibility and freedom. And so your team has to then design the conventions it's going to use in order to make sure that your code is still maintainable and readable. As much as Options API was a little bit rigid as far as telling you where to put stuff, it did mean everyone knew where everything was at any point, and anyone could basically jump in. But here, this is just the beginning, because what we're going to do next, after you all practice doing this yourselves, is we're going to talk about how you can extract these into modules that can then be basically tossed around different components. There is one more thing I need to cover before we cover the exercise. We've done all this stuff regarding doing functionality, data, computed, and we've talked about components. We did not talk about props. We did not talk about mitts. So if you remember, if we look at our user card that I had earlier, we see that in the options it's very easy. You just have a props, you have your mitts, you just define it as you see fit. It's actually not that much harder when it comes to composition API. It's just, what do you think you need? You need a helper function. And so they are aptly named define props, and they are define emits. These are the two helper methods that you need to know about. And so the way it works is basically if this Pokedex wanted to say take a region of props, uh, sorry, a region of Kanto, for example, of like which region it was looking for, you would say define props is a function that takes an object where we can then can say the region is going to be of type string, and I can say like the default is going to be like Kanto, for example. As you can see, the syntax is actually very similar to what we learned already. The main difference being that one is being called by a function. But the second part, which is actually really important, is that if you wanted to actually use the prop in your computation, say, for instance, inside of this computed, right? we wanted to actually say we want it to be uppercase and we want to add the prop to it too. How do we do that? 
Well, define props as it stands right here. It's just a function that's being initiated. What we need to do then, because it's vanilla JavaScript, is say const props. Or to be honest, you can name it whatever you want. It's JavaScript, but I would recommend just naming it props. Because then you can say props.region. And then when you do that, we can see at least, oh, it looks like the default is giving me some problems. So I'm going to ignore that for now. But uh, we can see here, if I go to app.view, where is a oh, wrong app.view? App.view in the playground. Give it a region of, let's just switch it up to Hoenn this time. There we go. I'll need to figure out what the default thing is later. But at the bare minimum, you can see that's how you define props. And then similarly, if you're doing emit, you basically const emit, define the emit. And then here, same thing, we can say change region, for example. And then everything still works exactly as we learned in this workshop. How in flux is this API? Define props and define emits is. I mean, the whole. Oh. The whole section you just showed. Got it. OK, so the question here is around how stable the script setup um, is. It's fully stable at this point, production ready. Um, ever since 3.2, so I've, like, that's like the big caveat here. If you're using anything less than view 3.2, you won't have script setup. The compiler optimizations aren't there. But going forward, honestly, I have seen a lot of code bases. A lot of people just opt into this fully from the get go. So um, yeah, consider it stable on that end. For things like define props, define emits, they're still playing around a little bit sometimes with how they can optimize the DX of, like, as you saw, default was acting a little bit funky. I don't, I'll have to look into that why. But um, those are things that are still kind of being refined. But if you can be guaranteed of anything, it's that Vue tried to do its best to be progressive about how it makes its changes so that uh, as long as it's not marked as experimental, you can count on your stuff working in production. And then, sure, we might introduce another syntax that would make it even easier for you, just like we saw with script setup. Because we got feedback on composition API, right? Like, people liked it, kind of verbose, kind of, you know, people felt, had, had their feelings about it. And we, when we saw, I think, inspired by things like Svelte was doing with compiler optimizations, we said, why not? These are things that we can also do for our users. And so script setup, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe was also inspired from what we saw with Svelte. Cool. So actually, we're not calling emits right now, so I'm just going to, actually, I can just make a, an example for people right in here. Do, 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 do. We could say emits. What does it emit? It emits the change region. That's your example right there. OK, cool. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go ahead and refactor the user's page that we just started, we've been working on. And this time, you're going to use script setup to kind of trim down some of that code. And then if you have any props or emits you want to practice with, uh, go ahead and do that. And otherwise, keep on moving stuff in, playing around, seeing how you feel. Welcome back, everyone. How was the exercise? Uh, if anyone had any questions about how that went, please feel free to drop that inside of the chat. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and run through that solution. All right, so switching back to say la view. Then run dev, great, great. All right, so we don't need to see what's happening right now. So we're just going to actually just full screen this so that people can go all in as far as what's going on. So what are we doing here? We are going to go open up our users page. And let's see what we got. Well, everything's already been migrated in that everything is inside of async setup. So this is good. So let's start by adding that setup attribute. That's the first step to do. Once you do that, you'll realize, oh, OK, this is interesting. Now we got to start uh, deleting some stuff. So let's start deleting that export because we don't need that anymore. Boom, gone. Well, we mentioned before that all components are automatically registered once they're imported. So that's gone too. So we can delete that. And then finally, we already said that the script should be set up. So we can delete this block too. And once we do that, you'll notice that the reactive, which was graying out earlier because it said it wasn't being used, uh, it just basically it detected the scope of the object and was like, I don't see it within the scope of the module. But you're fine now because we've deleted all those exports. If we save that, oh, we got one more bit actually. We can delete the return. And so now we can verify that everything is working. And just to make sure, we can just do a one, two, three. There you go. Did update. Fantastic. Now, the only other thing, too, is that we just want to practice really quick using the define uh, props and emits. The way that would work is let's go ahead and then say const props equals define props. 
and we could say thing, something like title, for example, and type string. And then we can do a default of users. And so to show that this works, we'll come inside of here. And let's start by saying this is a test. So we test, great. And we can swap this out now for uh, t title. Refresh. There we go. Okay. Now, something was brought up, though, regarding, wait a second, how did you call define props without importing it? And more importantly, uh, let me fix this part first. You'll notice that because we're not actually calling props anywhere, there's no actually need to do that. So you can actually just leave it off like this right now. Um, so, but the question here around define props, why is it not yelling at us that we don't know where this is looking for? So the reason this is the case is because when you're inside of script setup, basically the compiler knows that these specific functions are going to exist. So in other words, define props and define emits, which I actually didn't clarify earlier, is only specific to script setup. If you try using define emits to find props inside of an options API, that'll just break. Because, because why would you? you? If you're in options API leveraging the setup, then you should already be using the other options. And so in other words, the compiler knows that it's technically already a global. So treat it like a global import for this. That said, though, I personally am typically a fan, especially if this is a newer code base, to just leave the import explicit. That way, no one new is like, wait, what's going on? There's no assumed knowledge here. We're good. So why is reactive not like that? Why is reactive not like that? So we delete that and save. The reason for that is because reactive cannot be assumed in this concept that it, in this context that it will be imported. So in other words, to think of it another way is that when this code is built and like compiled, define props basically just reverts back to its normal self. Like there's, if if it's not detected, it will get taken out basically. So there's some kind of optimization happening. I can't explain the details of it. But there's a reason why define props is OK, but then other helper methods like ref, reactive, view cannot intelligently guess those things. So as a result, it forces you to be very explicit that you want to use these helper methods. So yeah, they're called, I think, compiler-specific function, helper functions. But anyways. And then the other thing we got in practice is define emits. And that we can just say, once again, we can say like something like update user list. And so you can imagine how would that work if a user clicked a button that update user list, it would send it to the parent. Maybe it has to send some new data down. That's how that basically might be working. OK, no, I think we're good. Oh, that's the thing. Um, in the event anyone here is coming from Vue 2, and if you're using uh, Vitor as your VS Code extension, just a reminder to go ahead and basically disable and install that uh, when you're working on Vue 3 projects going forward, because Volar and Vitor will basically collide. So just wanted to make that note. Oh, here we go. By the way, you see this? So this is just like a small, like, lets you know, define props as a compiler macro no longer needs to be imported. Again, it's not really going to matter at the end of the day, because you see that it's not actually yelling at you inside of your code editor. But it is trying to let you know that it is technically a global, global import. So we've talked about Composition API. We've talked about script setup. Now we need to talk about something called Composables. This is the new kid on the block when it comes to Vue, because it's basically a Vue-specific terminology around a type of reusable JavaScript utility that uses the Composition API, hence why it's called Composable. And so for those coming from a React background, you might be, you might be familiar with like the hook, React hooks where they prefix everything with use, like you know, use mouse position, that kind of thing. That pattern has also carried over into Vue in that we will basically, I'm going to be demoing this shortly, but we'll be able to create some helper basically utility functions using the Composition API. And then this is the elusive, how do we share some stuff between components without polluting and rewriting the same thing? Composables are your answer for that. OK, so let's load up the counter real quick. So I'm going to go inside of my app.view. And we're, this time, we're going to practice this. I'm actually just going to, going to import my base counter. And this is from base counter here. We're going to delete that. And then we're just going to render out our base counter. Just like that. OK. So there you go. Also, script setup in the flesh right there. OK, we have the ability to increment. That's fine. But what if we wanted the ability to count in other places? This, this is basically like an encapsulated functionality that, that we don't want to. So when we're looking at this functionality, again, this is a simplistic example, but for the sake of understanding composables, Imagine if we wanted the count to be managed from multiple places. In other words, at base counter, it's nice that it has it here, 
But what if we want the base, uh, let's say, inside of user card? What if user card wanted the ability to also increment the count? At the moment, you'd have to duplicate that. It's kind of tricky. You would have to probably do some props to have your app manage that. But count is something that really, if we think about it, it really does belong in base counter as a state. But and it really doesn't make sense to put it at the app level because the app it usually cares about a bunch of other things. So what do we have? We have composables. How does that work? Well, let's start by creating a folder called composables, which is what you'll see a lot in code bases uh, these days for Vue 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to create inside of that composables, I'm going to create something called a count. I'll just call it a count store because that's what I wanted to do. I want to basically store what's going on with count. So I'll split this over with two columns so you can see what's going on. And so here, what we really want to do is we want this piece of data. Let's start simple. Let's make that shared so that we can show that in multiple places. The way you do that is we're going to import a ref. Well, actually, no. We're going to, do it, we're going to, we're going to reverse engineer that a little bit easier. For those who are new to JavaScript modules, this might seem a little bit intimidating, but we're going to basically build it up from scratch. When you have a JavaScript file that you want to import into a um, into another file, the main thing you need to do is have something to export, right? So normally you would have an export like count of 10, like this. Okay? Actually, so let's make it 100, like this. And then what we could do is you could then say import a count store, or actually import, we'll destructure this part, from composables slash count store. And what are we con we're taking out of that? We're taking the count out of this. And actually, let's make this new count so that visually it's easier for you all to see what's going on here. And then what we can do here is inside of our setup method, we could say, ah, yes, we're going to go ahead and say uh, return new count. OK. So to show you what just happened here, we just wrote a standard JavaScript. Uh, whoop, what's going on? Uh, do, 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 fail to resolve import. Composables count store. You got a backup one level. Oh, backup one level. Yep, file name, that's it. Great call. And then to show that this works, we're going to render this on the page. H2, new count. You can see we successfully wrote a little piece of JavaScript that's now reused in two places. Now, again, to prove that this works, again, let's continue proving this out, is that we will then import the same new count on user card. Similarly, we'll use the setup method in here. I'm not going to spend the time to convert everything right now, just to kind of make the process a little bit easier. But we're going to return a new count here. And then we can actually then, as an H2, also do new count. So inside of the user card, what we're going to do now is also display new count, so we can actually prove that this was successfully imported in two places. But we need this to actually render on the page. So we need to go to app.view. And let's go ahead and bring in our user card. Although I'm actually saying, oh yeah, user card is correct. There we go, perfect. So user card here. But I believe user card had some props, though. Did it require some props? It did. Object for name and food. That's fine. We can do that real quick. This will be um, a user with a name of Ben. And we'll just stick food. This time we'll do cheeseburger. Although I did do that earlier. So for the sake of doing something new, we're just going to do ramen. Save. Boom. OK. So you can see now 100 appears here in the count. 100 appears here at the bottom. So we can uh, verify that once more by going to count store, changing this to 200. And if we, you can see and refresh, you'll see that it's updating. But again, this is a constant. It's, it's kind of weird. All right. So this is cool, but once again, we want, the we want the ability to be able to change it. So let's go inside of our base counter. And this time, we can, well, what, we, what, you, what might you do instinctively? We might go, well, instead of this, we'll say this dot new count. And when we click on it, we want new count to also get incremented as well. And we'll increment it by 10. So we'll save that. We'll refresh. We'll hit it. And you'll notice, oh, it's kind of working. This is kind of weird. But then you'll notice that it's working in this context, but it's not working in this context. And this is a little bit of a preview of the kind of UI bugs that we had to deal with over time as developers were dealing with reactive state changes. And this is what a lot of the frameworks do well for us. So 
here's the deal. What we want to do is, what do we want to do? We want to make this a reactive reference that view will contract. So what do we do? Import ref from view. Wrap this in a ref. Save. Fresh. Everything's connected. And just like that, you have this little JavaScript file with just the one variable you care about shared across two different components at different levels. And everything's updating as you would expect. And so this pattern here that we're seeing regarding like the combination of a setup with importing whatever you're dropping in is one that I would say is probably going to be seen more in Options API. And that's why we spend so much time in Composition API in that I would say going forward as architectures continue to evolve, Composition API will become more and more popular in Vue apps. This is not to say that it is like the one true right way and that you have to write your apps this way. It's just it's a very effective technique. And to try to ignore it for the sake of ignoring it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So for those of us who still love Options API, just sprinkle it in just like this. And then you get the benefits of composing together different pieces of functionality that you can reuse in your options. But then you can still get the benefits of options. For those of us who want to use Composition API fully, then it really is just as simple as importing the thing and then using it. Question here in the chat. How do, life, how do life cycle hooks like before destroy or destroy work inside the composition API? Yeah, this is a great question. So if we look inside of our life cycle hooks, oh, do I have it up already? The way to think about it is that composition API doesn't actually, as much as we're talking about it as like a separate way of architecting your apps, it doesn't break away from how the component works. So the question here regarding like, before unmount, so basically destroy instead of destroy, think of it as unmounted. All that stuff still happens at the end. The only thing that's different about the composition API is that it just happens at the very beginning. It's still all that other stuff you expect when it comes to destroying stuff, that still factors into composition API. In fact, composition API will continue to hit all these other lifecycle hooks. So just to, to answer this question a little bit more fully, let me go to the Pokedex here that has the script set up. So if in the event, right, you're saying, oh, well, this component, right, let's say, let me put this side by side so we can actually see this together. And then let me reduce that so it's easier to read. OK. So if you're trying to say that, like, OK, I have this thing where, like, when the, right before the component unmounts, I want it to do something. Sometimes that's a thing, right, before it's destroyed. The way you would do that is you need a helper method. And so we have, just as you would expect it to be called, it's not called before unmount because what we realized with conventions is that this is really a lifecycle event. So really, all of our stuff are prefixed with on, like you would expect for other events, on click, on key up. Well, since this is a helper method for an event for lifecycle hooks, on before mount is what we would import. And then we uh, sorry, on before unmount, because that, that's particularly what we were talking about. So we would say on before unmount. There we go. And then I usually like to keep my lifecycle hooks towards the bottom, usually. Um, but especially with Composition API, that goes out the window depending on how complex the code is. So be very clear, that is not at all a best practice, just kind of what I used. I'm used to doing from the, uh, the Options API. So what we do is we would call on before unmount, and then it's a function that takes a callback function of what we want to do. So in this particular case, we might be like, do this thing. And then that's it. You've done essentially what you would do in an Options API. You just define it at the setup level. So the key thing, again, to remember is that Composition API does not take you out of the flow. You're absolutely bought into the whole thing. It's just now you can literally set everything up right here at this one step and then let, let it run from there. Whereas as we saw with Options API, there is kind of a little bit more intricacy regarding do your setup, then pass that into your options, and then options can do stuff from there. So it's, it's a style thing. You'll figure out what works best for you. But I've, what I've done. Uh, in this workshop is try to present you with the different styles so that you can get a feel for it and figure out what you want uh, for your apps. Hopefully that, hopefully that helps answer that question. Question. The composables, are they singletons that are around for the life cycle of the app? Or if they're not being actively used by components on screen, are they tossed away and then reinstantiated Fresh next time Ooh, they're used. This is a good question. All right. So to context set, the question here, 
let me go to the uh, base counter, is around the idea of these composables and whether they're singletons and basically how permanent are they in, in, in regards to the entire instance. So because we're not getting into composables, this means you are starting to get into scoping concerns when it when you're talking about JavaScript, which is why I was talking about like the learning curve for compo composition API starts to increment a little bit when you start to think about this stuff. So to give you an example of this, let's go back to that count store. Okay, so like any normal JavaScript, what you can also do is we can also instead create something called something like use count that is a function. And so when you do this though, okay, and let's say we have const local count equals a ref of let's say 50, and then we return new count, or though let me let me actually let me name this a little bit better. Global count and return local count. Okay, there we have that. I think I did all this right. Perfect. Okay. So the other thing I need to do is actually not have this. This is more of like that sort of factory approach to composables, where what you're doing is you're running a function that then has basically uh, well, we're about to see shortly what it looks like. It's easier to show than than to explain this in its raw form. Okay, so rather than use count anymore, we get this function called use count. And so what we can do now is we can say, uh, inside of the function, we're going to get the fact that we can do a const, okay, actually, I did not like the way I minimized this. There we go. Count store, ah, okay, there, we're good. Use count, and then this is log count store to start. Let's not even return anything just yet. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. If we take a look at our console and refresh, uh, do, 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 cannot, uh, oh, right. Okay, sorry, it's still looking for new count in here. So let me go ahead and comment that out. And then where's new count? Oh, new count also exists here inside of user card. Let me disable that as well. Uh, not that user card, this user card. Yep, yep. And then this should be hidden too. Okay, now we're good. Okay. So what we see here is that global count gets two different refs. There's a local and a global one. And so inside of here, if we return count store to like to expose it out basically once again, and then what we can do here is let's do two different buttons now. We're going to have the ability to, oh right, it's being referenced here. So we're gonna say new counter here. I'm just gonna add the HR here so that's easier to see. And then let me not clip the browser. Okay, so then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say global count. And that's going to be a count store dot global count and then local count count store dot local count okay <clears throat> so this what we're seeing here matches up to what we have here inside of count store right so the difference here being that let's go ahead and add some functionality here where if we want to go ahead and increment stuff what does that look like so we're gonna add a button here real quick and we're just gonna write some inline JavaScript just to make life a little bit easier. Where global count will be incremented by 80. So I'll just call that global. And then we'll do local count by 100. Although let's make this just more jarring so that it's easier, 10 and 100. Local, great. So what we have here, we have the references to it, but we're trying to mutate the count specifically. And so one of the things we can do instead is because of the way they're scoped, we could do the increment local count here, for example. And here is where we can say local count dot value plus equals 80. <coughs> Expose increment local count like this. And then, since we have that functionality shared, now what we can do is we can say do 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 count store dot increment local count, like that, save, fresh. You see our local is now changing. The reason this is different is if we go back to our user card, and let's do the same thing where we import our use count here, 
And so then we say uh, const, oh, whoop, const count store equals use count. And then we turn count store. And this time we'll copy this exact snippet over here. So it's very obvious. Save. OK. <coughs> You'll see a couple things here. One, because of the way the function instantiates, as you would expect, the local count, like the component for the, the base counter actually is holding its own version of that local count. While over here, we can see that the user card is, has its own version of local count. On the other hand, if we have a function here that allows us to increment global count, and then let's just, once again, global count dot value plus equals, let's just do 1,000. Then we'll go ahead and do increment global count. Great. Now, when we go ahead and switch this out, Do, 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 global, that's good. And then we have this right here, save, refresh. We have global changing, and we have, oh, sorry, we have local changing in the top, global changing both sides. And so I know this was a bit of a long-winded answer, but it goes to show that it basically comes down to your ability to scope your JavaScript as you normally would as far as generating yeah, those. Yeah, that was quite clear what I was asking. So let's say you hit a button that, that rendered different components. Yep. So both the counter and the user card are off screen. Mm -hmm. And then you reinstantiate those two components. Does global count start over, or is that state held by the app in some way? In that particular case, if the app, if the component is unmounted and view is already tracking the global state, I would imagine the global state would stay, but the local state would get reinstantiated. Okay. That's so what you, you should expect. A, you can use it as a singleton for yep. the lifetime of the app. Mm -hmm. There might be some gotchas in certain situations, but that, again, if you run into that, let me know. We can always take a look at that, but that probably would go beyond the scope of this. Cool. OK, so I know I th there is a lot going on here, but I wanted to kind of provide the full landscape for those who aren't used to writing their own JavaScript modules and to actually show you some of the differences behind what happens when you use a function to invoke it versus just exporting a constant and just give you some different options there. So what I'd like you to do is to actually give this a shot, practice around using the idea of a composable in your directory. So basically, I kind of wanted to outline it a bit. You'll create a composables folder inside of your source directory. Look inside of your app. See what opportunities there might be to share some state or functionality. Or if you don't have it, obviously, like I did earlier, just go and do so to practice it. Practice sharing those things. And so here, I said create a file called use state or use function. Basically, I know in my case, I call it count store, which is a lead-in for something else in the future. But generally speaking, when you're naming your composables, you do prefix it with that use. So in that case, I should have probably named it like use count store, for example. Um, and then otherwise, just try stuff out. All right. So how that feel with the composables? Is that kind of a bit weird to do? I see a lot of people still typing, so probably still tinkering away. Um, people in the chat, if you had any sort of issues with those composables, please let me know. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and kind of walk through a simple example for the solution and kind of talk through some the theoretical things while we're at it. So let's go ahead and switch over to C'est la View. And so if we look at C'est la View, what do we have? Well, we have a couple things going on. We have a user card here. That's fine. User page. Okay. We have some async stuff happening. All right, well, this is in the script setup. So this actually might be a good one. So let's say, for instance, then, that we want the ability to display the users in more than one place. Because the user page is a great place to list it. But on the other hand, there might be reasons to actually display it on like the home page, for instance. So let's just abstract that away into a composable. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder here for composables. And then we're going to create one. And following the syntax now, we're going to call it useUserStore.js. And all we're going to do here is we're going to do a import uh, reactive from view. And then we're going to export a const called userList. Although, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to do 
because we're actually just exporting the single array, I prefer usually to use ref when it's not an object. So reactive is usually when I think of like a more complex object. That's personally kind of where I lean towards. So user list is a ref of an array. That's all this is. And so now that we have this here, we can go inside of user page, and we can change this up basically to say, OK, so I'm going to import from, from what? We're going to from go up one level, go to composables, go to use user store. And then what we're looking for inside of here is the user list, which is auto-completed right there. So now we can technically delete this. And then this means we can delete the reactive up here. And then wherever user list is being called, we will remove the state. And then because we're in script setup, remember that it's a ref, so we need to unpack it with dot value. And again, it's nice because the tooling has updated now so that it'll actually tell you that it's expected the dot value. There was a time where the tooling hadn't caught up, and so it was really easy to miss that on your own if you weren't paying attention. So there we go. User list is now available. We can save, and everything should still look good. Yeah, it looks good to me. If we go to home now, let's actually show that we can do something similar. So we'll go now over to the home page. So home page. And I'll just use the script setup again up here. And let me just actually copy that snippet over from up here. So import, there we go, user list from that. Import user list right here. And again, once we've imported it, the mental model shift that you have to think about here is that it is already available. So we can go ahead and just do an li in this case, and then v4 user in user list. And then user.name, I think that should work. There we go. It's looking good. And then to show you why this is incredibly powerful is that maybe in this specific context, this is where I want to actually only show the first five. And so I don't need this to pollute the entire file. What I can do is I can just import the computed property from view and just say const uh, short user list is a computer property that returns uh, user list dot value uh, do, 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 what was it Spl uh, splice uh, let's see yeah splice zero five I think I think that returns it great and then we can do short user list here you'll notice there we go now we have this global piece of data that is shared in two files. But we also have some very specific context on how we might want to manipulate that data for that one component. And that in and of itself is, I think, the power of uh, the idea of the composition API in that you can really start to compose things the way that makes sense to you. And so the other thing about Vue 3, which you're not going to cover at all, but I did want to make a mention to it because those coming from Vue 2 or those looking at Vue 3 docs might notice that mixins are a thing that also were particularly popular during the Vue 2 days. And mix is what they basically allow you to do. It was a way for you to share functionality and state using the options API. Nowadays, I would say the fact that you have these composables and reusable pieces of state and function that's easily injectable in a very concise way, these are basically superior to mixins in every way, shape, and form. Um, it's really actually hard to argue for using mixins over the composables. So it is valuable to spend the time to get familiar with it, try it out, and start figuring out where it uh, kind of lands in your comfort zone. But as you can see here, there's something really nice about being able to say, oh, OK, yeah, I'm getting what? The user list from where? This use user store. And then like, you just know where everything is. Everything's named correctly. Or if you need to update it because there's some name clashes, everything is very declarative and explicit. So, um, so yeah, so these are composables in a nutshell. And that kind of puts a wrap on the composition API section of all the things we're talking about. We're going to take a bit of a mental break. <laughs> because we've been doing a lot of JavaScript, doing a lot of the heavy lifting stuff, let's talk about styling your app. Because let's face it, as web developers, styling your app is a real thing. Managing CSS, a lot of us might not love it. I happen to love CSS. But I wanted to show you what's possible with Vue so that those ideas can get flowing when it comes to time to style the app. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the playground, run dev, and we good. OK. Let's take a look at our base counter, since this is what we have showing up on the screen right now. OK. So when we, we talked a lot about templates. We talked about, a lot about script. Let's talk about style. So actually, I take that back. I'm going back to Playground because 
this is a simpler file to read right now. New uh, base counter has a lot of stuff going on. So the style block here, what exactly is going on here? Well, let's start do by doing something pretty simple. Let's go ahead and just ta let's tag the entire page and just give it a background color of, say, uh, let's do the background color, papaya whip. And I can't spell. All right, that should do it. OK, this is great. Now, what's going on here, actually? What's going on is that when Vue, when you just have a standard style tag, what Vue is doing is injecting the style basically across the entire app. So in other words, you see these buttons right here? If I go ahead and did button border red, or let's see, 10 px solid red, like that, you'll see that it impacts everything. And it might, you might be thinking, oh, is it because it's app.view? It's no, because the styles are being injected globally. So any app, that, any component that comes on this, uh, on this page is going to get impacted by this. And so this is a double-edged sword like anything else. There are times that you want CSS to cascade and do its thing. And a lot of times, actually, though, you don't want it to do its thing. You want your styles to be encapsulated to the components you're using. So for instance, if we're looking at the user card in this case, you might want it, you might want the buttons here to have a very specific style. In this case, let's say we wanted the buttons to be border 10px solid green. You'll notice that if we just use a standard tile tag, as, you, as, it, as it happens to be, it'll happen to override. And while you might w try to think of a way to reason why this is happening, Trust me, when you have hundreds and thousands of components injecting global styles, you do not want to debug that. So that brings us to, so this is like the first style of styling your app, which is you can just drop CSS, it will render everywhere. The one that's the most popular is something called scope styles. And if you've never heard of scope styles before, they're basically a way to do exactly as the naming convention sounds, to scope your styles to a specific area. And so what is actually happening underneath the hood, right? Because I talked a lot about Vue building on what already exists in the ecosystem. Well, Scope CSS, what it's actually doing, if we take a look here, is it's actually taking a look at the elements that are relevant to this particular component, and it's, a, a, and it's appending a unique data attribute. So you see here this data-v-b600. That is what's basically being appended to the HTML. And then what's cool about this is if you look at the, not the console, where's my CSS? Oh, it's down here. I hit it. Look at this style. It's button using the attribute selector to then go ahead and apply those styles specifically within that context. And that actually works pretty well, assuming that the rest of your global CSS isn't written in a highly specific way. This actually works really great. And a lot of people have a lot of success using scope styles. But scope styles isn't perfect because if we went ahead and I don't know, did something a little bit more specific like this, I think well that I think that didn't quite do it. It's fine. I'll just do this. I'll just go the lazy route. <laughs> if someone somewhere in your enterprise app decided to bang important the button, scope styles are not going to save you by any means. Uh, you are still going to have to be stuck with the cascade effect. And there's something to be said about being disciplined about writing your CSS. So that could be something your team does. But what if there was a better way? So we talked about scoped. What about CSS modules? You might not have heard a lot about it, but, and this is a feature that's not talked about a lot about, but what you can do is you can actually go ahead and tell your module, or your CSS styles, to take on the module mode. Now, what this will do, though, is a little bit tricky, though, on the other hand. So let me show you what's happening. So right now, we'll notice that nothing's happening to the button right now. Because CSS modules works really well in Vue, or I think, honestly, I think in JavaScript scenarios, when there's an actual class associated with it. So just to switch this up to show that it's equivalent, let me start by reverting this real quick. So we'll use a class of button rather than just a generic button selector. And we'll show that this, uh, let's see, on the button count, uh, the base counter, let's make sure everything is equivalent. So all the buttons here, one, two, three, are going to get a class of button. So there we go. There's that red showing up, as we would expect. And on the user card, we'll get a class of button. All right, so now everything is equal. We're talking about CSS classes here now. OK. When we add the module here, what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to do something that might seem a little weird at first, but trust me on this one. 
what we're going to do is we're going to vbind our class attribute. And so I'm going to do the shorthand now. And rather than just bind it to button directly, because right now it'll be like, what do you mean button? There's no variable called button. We're going to do dollar sign style dot button. That's what we're going to do. And so what you'll notice here, actually I realized I only updated in one place. We didn't update it in all three. So one, two, three, just like that. OK. So you might at first think, oh, that looks kind of ugly. I don't like the JavaScript. But let me show you what's actually happening underneath the hood. If we take a look here, what you'll notice is that the class has actually now been recompiled to actually have a unique hash at the end. And this is, like, this is really powerful, because what you end up getting is the ability to actually truly scope your styles to the, basically that particular component. Because the odds of this getting overridden by something else randomly is very, very low. And if you want it to be even more like specific, there are actually ways to configure your compiler to actually basically spit out a specific pattern of how you want the modules to be spit out. So in this case, for example, like you'll notice it tells you that the class of button is being used, right? So that way you can at least search for a class button. And then after that, of course, this is a ran randomly generated hash. At the bare minimum, this is to me the minimum that uh, minimum style of DX that I think I recommend when it comes to CSS modules across frameworks is because I've noticed that some CSS modules will actually just hash the entire class. And you could argue, oh, that's super unique. But I'd also argue that is super hard to debug. In fact, that's like almost near difficult impossible to debug because you're like, now I have to figure out the HTML where that happens to apply. And so what I typically recommend when it comes to CSS modules is to also go ahead and prefix the component name to it. Now granted, if your component names are super long, then there might end up being a performance issue. But that way, you know exactly which component file to drop into and where the CSS class is. But this is a really great way to protect your CSS for components. Now, once again, I know that not everyone is in love with this style syntax. So what I tell people is this. Remember that when you're using stuff in Vue, you can do stuff where it makes sense. Just because you want to use CSS modules doesn't mean you have to CSS modularize your entire code base. You can just do it in the places where it makes sense. And that way, you don't feel like you have to, one, do it for across the entire code base. But two, you can be selective about the techniques that you use. Because as we saw earlier, scoped works really well when it's written well. But then otherwise, in times you need to be very prote protective, go ahead and try out CSS modules on it. And again, this is something that's just built right into the library. So the moment you want to use it, it's there for you. We won't show you this uh, at this point, because this will be like additional configuration. But just know that for these blocks as well, a lot of us also use like preprocessors when it comes to using our styles. And so what you should know is that you can actually add attributes on here, like lang CSS, for example. And you'll need to actually configure like your builder to actually make sure it has like the SAS loader. But once you do that, you can write your SAS files in here, just like you normally would. Use all your SAS sy syntax as you would expect. Is there Question? a way to, to avoid the class bind style button? Is there a way to use SAS and bind to like the parent element in the in the component, and then oh. master C your, C your SAS? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is around trying to, instead of using the style, to use SAS to like check out what the class is of the parent and like use that to generate the CSS, everything. to wrap nest everything. I've never actually done that particular approach. Um, I would imagine that if you were to approach that, it, would be, it might be kind of hard to do. So I don't have a, I'll say that it sounds possible, but it might be tricky to do. OK. The one other thing I want to tell you about styling, which most people don't know about when it comes to Vue 3, is that this is great. We have the ability to global styles. We have scope styles. We have CSS modules. For me, one of the things that it, when it comes to extending on the functionality of the web is how we can bring the technology together in a better way. And so JavaScript is really good at interactivity, managing state, and dynamic pieces of information. CSS is very good at what it does, styling. And so what if you could find a way to actually merge the two together in a way that allows for just crazy possibility? To show you what I mean, let's go ahead and I'm just going to save this right now. And on the app.view, what if we wanted the ability for the user to choose what the background color is? Typically, the approach for that is you probably would come to your designers and you would say, OK, these are like the seven classes we'll support. And so we'll try our best to just support it this way. And so you're, you're limited. But there are plenty of 
cases where you might actually want to give the user infinite configuration. But the reason why we can't do that is because, frankly, managing the CSS for that can be quite difficult. So let's say, for instance, we have that property. So I'm going to import a ref from view, and I'm going to call it color preference. It'll be a ref. It'll be an empty. Actually, we'll just we'll say black for now. OK? And so what we'll do here is what you ideally want to do is you'd like your CSS to be able to read from your JavaScript. That would be a perfect world, wouldn't it? You know, right now, what you probably have to do is like some convoluted like onload the document element, then insert your own style tag, and manipulate the inline styles of the HTML. Like, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Well, what if I said instead that what we could do is, let's say, on the app itself, this time we're going to do a background color. But this time, I'm going to actually, let's see. Let's try to just do this. Will color preference work? No, nothing's happening. Well, let's make sure it's working first. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's actually render out the color preference. So color preference, uh, where is it? It is, oh, it's all the way down here. Let's bump it up so it's easier to read. OK, great. It is showing up. Let's make sure it actually can get changed, that it's reactive. Let's do an import. Um, if you didn't know, there's a type called color on your inputs that actually built into HTML. And we can just vmodel this to our color preference. So let's see if this works. Let's see. Let's go this. OK, great. So now we have this infinite color loop. Well, view 3 was like, you know what? I think we can make this happen. What if we just wrap this in vbind? And so what we get, ah, uh, shoot. Do I need to, maybe app is too far of a context? There we go. OK, that context was too high. All right, it's fine. I'll just do the, uh, let me do this. Let me wrap this real quick. OK, so I'll explain why that's not working real quick. It actually does make sense. Um, but for the sake of showing this, there we go. OK. What we can see here now is you have this infinite loop of JavaScript updating the CSS. Now, if you're skeptical, you're like, this looks like black magic. What's happening here? All right, let me show you. Let me show you. I promise you, when we think about things, we try to think of things in terms of extending the web. Look at actually what's happening here. What Vue does, what JavaScript does well, is it says, OK, I'm going to create a custom variable. But we're going to use CSS variables, because guess what? That is browser technology that is actively supported. And why would we try to reinvent the wheel? And so all JavaScript's doing is it's actually just tracking this variable and just making sure to update that value. But the rest of it is CSS. So you get the power of CSS and cascades and everything in its native form, but you also get the power of getting reactive data that can impact those things. So you can imagine, like, oh, the number of times I've been on apps where I wanted to customize the, the font size or the padding, like, those are hard to do because to create a class for every single one of those scenarios or to manage that at one point was nigh impossible. But with things like vbind on your styles now, like, oh, so many possibilities now exist with this. And so if you're wondering, though, why did I have a little bit of trouble with the HTML and, I think, and the app, it's because I think it view, once it takes over the div, is unable to go outside of it. So that's what it is. It's just not in control. Like, view is not in control of that area. So if you're going to do this, obviously make sure that you're within the context of your app. Otherwise, the CSS won't apply. But otherwise, at this point, you can imagine just infinite user preference configuration that's possible with this. Your challenge for this section is to take a look at Sela View. I've intentionally left a lot of the styling in there very generic. In fact, there's a lot of duplication. And so you can try actually seeing if you can refactor it in a way that makes more sense to you. Uh, maybe you want to do it in a global file. Who knows? And then you can play one with vbind. All right, hopefully people had a chance to play around with some styles. Like I said, honestly, CSS has its, its own skill set. There are plenty of great uh, workshops here on Front of Masters, so be sure to check those out if you want to learn more about CSS architecture. But I hope that was useful in terms of like a way to sort of learn what kind of techniques are, are available to you out of the gate when it comes to using Vue so that you can use that to augment our like, best practices with CSS. Because to be very clear, again, as someone who loves CSS, I'm not advocating for you to kind of work around the cascade. The cascade is extremely powerful. 
But like a lot of things, you got to know when to use it in the right scenarios. And sometimes when it comes to certain components, it makes sense to just keep it scoped to ignore the cascade. And so know that Vue provides you those options. And also, as we saw uh, with the vBind as well, when it comes to customization and being able to easily connect your JavaScript with your CSS, like, you know, um, Vue tries to do its best to make that as easy as possible for you when it comes to uh, using compiler-based optimizations. So I'll just go ahead and just, once again, let's demo some of that inside of Sela View so that you can have that as a solution branch. And then we will go from there. So switching on over, CD Sela View. Great. Perfect. All right. So first thing first, when I think of Sela View, as we can see here, the user card actually is something that sticks out to me as something that we honestly are not going to share these styles at this moment. And so when I look at this, honestly, I do think this is probably a good case for just having the wrapper or th these particular styles be scoped to this particular component. So we can go ahead and scope it like this. And then, however, though, if you're thinking about it and you're like, well, there are a lot of other cards out there, so what if I want to be really specific about this card? then you know what, on second thought, let's just make this a CSS module. Since, again, the styles here are fairly innocuous. Uh, not a lot of reusability at the moment. So we can just do style. And then because it's the dash, though, this is where, unfortunately, the style syntax is a little bit on the uglier side comparatively. We can see now that it still works because we look at here. And we can see there's our user card that's actually being rendered out as anticipated. OK, what about other opportunities for style refactoring? Well. If we take a look at the home page, we have a bunch of stuff here that's actually fairly generic. We have stuff in the login page that's being refactored. So what we could do really is we can just actually delete the stuff on the st login page. And then if we refresh and take a look, home, login, everything still looks good. So that refactor was pretty easy. And then finally, let's find an opportunity for some scope styles. Well, if we're looking at the user page, actually it looks like we're using a lot of stuff here as well. So let's go ahead and just wipe this out to finish the refactor. And if we take a look at home page, we do have that button green right here. So OK, that's good. Um, in this case, to be honest, I'm not sure I'd want to scope the styles at this point because, because we're inside of home page. And home page, we know, is being shared across multiple files. So at this point, what I would probably do is I'd say, you know what? Home page's styles are not just being shared like for its own. It's being shared across the entire app. So Let's actually just drop that inside of here. So at the bare minimum, it feels a little bit more proper in terms of cascade. App.view controls these things that are being shared everywhere. So boom, it's now being shared. And there are certainly opportunities here to refactor things like, like for example, we're seeing the navigation here. So you can imagine as this you know, application grows, you can totally see an opportunity for us to actually refactor our header component into its own file which then that might be a good use case for scope, for example. Anyhow, just wanted to talk to you some high-level refactoring, and that's how I might approach it. It's time for us to talk about routing with Vue Router. OK, routing with Vue Router. Let's do this. All right. When we take a look at our code and we look back at our Sela V app, you can see here that we're currently faking navigation not actually working. And so navigation is a real thing, though. We want to actually be able to track URLs, even if it is only a single page application. So how do we do this? Well, again, we could always home, like any developer, we certainly write our own solution for it. But libraries are there to provide us some conventions, and more importantly, make it easier for us to debug things in the future, because they provide standards for us. So the library you're going to want to bookmark for this is Vue Router. So if you go to router.vuejs.org, this is the page you're going to need for your exercise because one of the things I'd like you all to do going forward is to start getting more familiar with the docs that the team has written for these libraries. This is the official router for Vue.js, so it actually is officially maintained by the team. And so inside of here, we'll provide a lot of the explanatory like code snippets and stuff. And don't worry, we're not going to read and walk through this. But I just want you to have this ready so that if you have a specific question you want to read about it, it's there for you. But what we're going to go ahead and do is let's go ahead and get that set up, shall we? So as we can see here, I'm going to go inside of my playground to sort of demo this first. So let's clear out all these tabs. And if I open up, right, go here, CD playground. Now we're good. Delete that one. Great. NPM run dev. 
And if we're good, we should be back. We are back. Oh my gosh, the black though. <laughs> I need to change that so it's actually readable. Okay, so we have this. Let's go ahead and do some installation, shall we? npm install view router, and then the at4 uh, specifies which version it is because view router 3, unfortunately, the versions cannot line up. 3 is for view 2, 4 is for view 3. Okay, so to verify that this has actually worked, we can check that inside of package.json now. You will see that. Wait, um, this is Cella View. Here's Playground. You can see View Router right here, 4.1.6. OK, now that we have this, let's go ahead and keep going. We want to go ahead and actually get that set up. So the way routing works inside of View, um, out of the box, is that what we get is the ability to define a route. right? So there's going to be a router controller that controls everything. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to create a new file at our source called router.js. And so router.js here will follow the syntax that we're going to see right down here. And basically what it allows you to do, it allows you to define a set of routes. That, that's an array that I'll explain in just a moment. And then what we, want, we need to be able to do then is to then take those routes and actually apply them to the view app. And so inside of our main.ts app, remember here when I was saying that like we can actually do things like chain functionality on top of this, uh, this train of like creating an app and mounting it. So this is where I typically would actually go const app equals create app, because we've now created the app, app.mount app. But then what this allows us to do is inside of here, we can now, we need to initialize the router from view router. So we get to import what? Create view, oh, is it define view router? View router. Hold on, from view router, then create. There you go. Now the autocomplete is showing up. Create router. Because why? We need the router to run everything. So we can say const router equals create router, just like that. And so you can see that on this line right here, const out, create router. And then what you can do is then we can say app.use router. And so let me make sure this works. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. OK, this is still missing some stuff, but I wanted to at least show this in its simplest form. So this is where I like the declarative nature of it going step by step, in that we import what we have from the top. We create an app that's based on this app right here from our app.view. Then we initialize our router. And then the app can then use the router, and then it's mounted to the page. It's step by step, uh, as opposed to the alternative, just to show you visually what that would look like is to then say create app, app, dot use router, assuming you've declared it already, dot mount app. And you can imagine once you start to chain multiple uses together and you're using multiple libraries, the git diff on that isn't very pleasant, right? We want to make things easy for people to review. And again, declarative code is typically easier code to understand. So I prefer the multi-line approach that we have here. OK, but we're not quite done yet. It's still yelling at us because Create router does take an object that we need to configure. The first thing we need to configure are the routes that we want to actually define for our application. So in other words, what URLs go to what pages. So right now, we have all of our stuff existing inside of this components folder. But when we're thinking about it at a larger scale in terms of like our app, we want to think of things like pages or views. And so the standard folder that is typically named at this point are views. And so what you might do instead is we might actually then switch over the Pokedex component over to the views, because you can imag imagine that you probably want your app to have something like slash Pokedex will show you the Pokedex. That would make sense. And so how would we actually define that, though, right? Because just because we put it in the folder, it doesn't do much for us. What we need to do is inside of this router.js that I had you create, uh, that you will have practice creating later, is that we'll have this array of routes that we will get to define. Every route is defined by a couple of properties. One is the, the desired path that you want it to be. So in this case, we have something for Pokedex. And then you can define what the component is that it's going to be. So in this case, we want the Pokedex page component. So what we're going to do is we're going to import, and I'm, this time I'm going to rename this, though. I usually prefer to try to name them like Pokedex page, just to give it a little bit of a differentiator from the rest of the components. And so it would be like Pokedex page from view slash 
Pokedex page dot view. And then we can just do Pokedex page. So we can save that. There's our routes. Now, the only thing, though, is that we do need to export this const, because why? While it's being defined here, and the reason why I like to define it over here is because what this allows us to do is then import it. Set, like Basically, it allows us to scope the data. Easier to manage. Otherwise, your main.js main or ts file is going to get massively large. So we're going to go ahead and import uh, import routes, I believe is what I called it. Yep, I did call it routes. Routes from the router.js file. And what we can say is basically these are the routes that we're going to pass into it. And that's it. That should be good. OK. Um, the other thing we need to do, though, I realize, is that we haven't defined a home page yet. So the app needs somewhere to go. We have the path. This is the base route. And then what we want to do is we want it to actually go to like a home page component. So we don't have that at the moment. And that's totally fine. We'll just create a standard one to use real quick. So we'll go ahead and do that, homepage.view. I'm going to use my uh, template block to really create a quick home page. There we go. And now we can just import home page here at the top. And there we go. So you see here we have our routes that go to these specific components. Any questions so far? Feeling good? OK, well, I'll, I'll keep going through this, and then uh, questions, as always, are welcome. OK, so these routes are being passed into here, right? Because the router needs to know what routes are being passed. OK, so we'll save that. Again, I'm not sure why some of this stuff is yelling at me. It looks like some ESLint stuff. So now that we have all this stuff, let's actually try to run it. So when we run it, you'll notice, OK, does this file exist? Well, let's see. We'll go inside of Pokedex page. It's yelling at us because, well, the stuff we're importing now is in a completely different folder. So base button dot view, does this file exist? Go back, go to components, go to base button. Yeah, it does exist. What are you talking about? There we go. Refresh. OK. Error. Provide a history option when calling create router. So what is this history mode that it's yelling at us about? History mode is a way to basically define how you want your URLs to be displayed. Traditionally speaking, when you're looking at the view router docs, and we check it out here. So just so you know, traditionally, single page applications, because they're just the index.html file when they're served the web page, they're no, what's known as web hash history. So typically, what you would find is you would basically see like the root page, and then it would say like router.vjs.org, and then it'll do like this hashtag symbol, and then it will basically do the routing from there. The problem with that is that it's not a true URL, and then there are SEO issues. And so what most of us are used to instead is what is uh, termed HTML5 mode or web history. And that is, in other words, how you would expect your URLs to normally look. And so uh, basically, you need to define which one it is. So for us, we're going to go ahead and just use the web hash history right now, because there are some things you need to configure for the HTML5 mode that I'm not sure we'll have time to cover. OK. So do, 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 do. Um, inside of our router, we have the history. And we'll say the create web hash history function. And that can be imported from here. OK. Now that we have this, this should start to feel a little bit better for the app. Oh, look, already something is showing up. So let me go back to app.view uh, for our playground. And this time, let me go ahead and swap the color out, though, to white so that it's actually easier to read. And there we go. OK, now we're good. Now, you might notice, though, if we're looking here, that this is where the hash uh, history is actually showing up. You see that? It's already starting to do that. But you might realize, wait, but didn't we define a home page? Like, why isn't that showing up? And the reason is because View Router provides us some new built in components that's going to make all the difference when it comes to helping us manage the routing. So remember how in the Sela view I was doing the, I was manually switching the view on stuff. So if we go to app.view for Sela view. Inside of here I had this component is that was dynamically swapping it out. Well, basically, view router gives us a supercharged version of that where we can actually just say, OK, inside of my app.view, I'm going to drop a thing called router view. And if you notice, my home page has now showed up. 
And if I switch over to Pokedex, OK, so we see some errors here regarding the Pokedex. And that is because it looks like it has to do with the fact that there is an asynchronous oper operation happening. So again, for the sake of demoing this real quick, because we want to focus on the routing part and not that, I'm just going to switch the H1 over to Pokedex real quick. And then we should see here, there we go. We have that here. And we go back home. That switches to the home page. And that, at its core, is how this all works, right? if we build it up from scratch. And so now with the router view, you might be thinking, well, OK, that's nice, but I don't have to memorize the links. That's not, that's not practical. I want actual links so I can switch it. And so you might think, OK, well, my natural instinct then is to create like a nav item where I have an a href, and I'm going to go to slash Pokedex, and then Pokedex, and then I'll have one for the home, just like that. So that might be your first instinct. Um, but if we do this and click on it, you'll notice that nothing's happening. Because if we look up here, it's actually changing the URL to something that's not actually with the hash. You see this, what I mean? It's like blinking out. What you want it to do is actually be able to say, oh, it's actually on this side. Because why? Because view router is the one responsible for managing that, not the browser. So don't worry. It's actually pretty easy to do. This is actually pretty easy to do. Rather than using the native anchor tag, what you end up getting instead is just like you have router view, you have a router link component. And so that is view router's way of helping you to manage things like history. There's a lot of stuff it can do for you. But the main thing, though, that's different is that there is a two property rather than an href. Because again, it's not truly an anchor tag. It is doing some programmatic stuff underneath the hood to help you move to the desired pages. So I'll save that. And this time, when we swap over, you can see that, that it's actually doing it correctly. And so if we think about the router view, it really is just like the, the dynamic component. It's just swapping in and out components. And then we have that really nice user experience of having it already be basically automatically configured for us. The one thing I will note, in, um, in case you're wondering, is that you're probably thinking, like, that was a decent amount of setup. Well, I want you to know, so I'm going to go ahead and show you this real quick. This won't be committed as part of the code. If we go ahead and run the npm create view 3, whoop, that was the wrong version. OK. You might remember that there's actually the opportunity to actually add view router as part of your configuration. We explicitly, we explicitly ignored it because it does a few things which I'm about to show you. So I'm going to say yes this time. And I'll show you what that looks like. So if we look at the view project now, you'll notice that it actually looks a bit different. It comes with more boilerplate now. So you can see inside of main.js, the router is already being used. There already is a router.js basically already created with all this base stuff already waiting for you regarding like a home view. It has some basically some prefix stuff. It's even generated a views directory with some sample pages. And so your app.view out of the gate is actually configured to already use, you can see the router link here. You can see the router view here. So just know that like, what I did is to show you how you might do that from scratch. Most of the time, you're not going to be doing that. It'll already be configured for you. You're going to go in there and make some changes. And so again, if you ever want a reference on like a clean way of how they did it, you can always just scaffold the new project with it, and you'll get everything you need. So for this particular exercise, I want you to try practicing configuring it from scratch. Because I want you to kind of get familiar with the files that are critical to how view router works. So as a general guidance, use the view router docs for reference. I do not expect you to memorize all this. And in fact, if you do a lot of copy and paste from the sample code, that's totally fine. The goal is for you to here to like configure, get a feel for how things are being basically configured at a raw directory. And then other than that, you can move any page components that you think is relevant inside of your Sela view app. And then after that, we'll go ahead and upgrade the app.view to use router link and router view so that everything renders correctly. All right. Welcome back. How was that experience? Was it a little bit harrowing from like just all the configuration? Yeah, I completely understand. Uh, so we're just gonna we're gonna do a run through just again, just to reiterate those steps and then well share some tips and tricks along the way. So how this will work is we're going to go over to Cellaview. Uh, let me go ahead and 
do say la view. Great. And then let's play around with this. First thing first is we need to install uh, view router uh, version, oh, not version R, version 4. <laughs> there we go. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and configure our app. Actually, let me go ahead and run it as well so we can see the changes happening. There we go. We're in it. OK. So inside of our main.js app, we'll see that we don't have a router right now. So let's go ahead and fix that. Import create router from, I usually prefer when I have the autocomplete, but I'm fairly confident in this one. Great, yep, it's right. So what we can do now is your const app is your create app. And then to make it more declarative, we'll do app.use a router, uh, which I need to define it in a second, and then app.mount. Whoops, not a port controller. And then we can just define our router this way to create router. We need to pass some options to it. So the history on this is going to be create web has history. And again, the reason we're doing this is because uh, it does require some server configurations in order to get it to work on the uh, normal HTML5 mode. And so again, I'll leave it to you and the docs, uh, depending on how you're deploying it, to do that. But generally speaking, what you're doing is you want it to redirect always to index.html. And again, plenty of docs to support probably wherever you're deploying it to. In the meantime, web has history is what we're going to use, because that is the most universal one in terms of like ensuring that things don't break. And that is a function that we need to run. And then we need to be able to define the routes. And so just to do this slightly differently so you can actually see what's actually going on here, uh, we can actually just define the routes in here as well. I just I separate them out into a file normally to make it a little bit easier for management. But again, for, to sort of help seal the mental model a little bit more, we're going to do it this way. So inside of the components, we can see what kind of pages do we already have. Well, we already got three actually aptly named pages. So let's go ahead and create that folder for views. And let's just move them over. Uh, yep, OK, what does Volar want to do? Oh, it knows I want to change it. Great, please do that for me. I'm going to move that as well. I'm going to trust it to do its thing. Great. All right, so now we should have a bunch of things moved over. But there was a good question that was asked earlier regarding it's nice for us to be explicit about where the file path is, but anyone who's worked on a large app before will know that when it comes to moving files, that can be a bit of a pain when you're moving up directories, down directories, and isn't there an easier way to do this, that it always refers to the root directory. So that way, no matter where you, as long as you're not doing a ton of nested folders, it should make life a lot easier. And so the secret to this, actually, is that we actually do have that already built in, and that's the at symbol. And so when you do the at symbol, what that does is it says, please go to the source folder and then do start your file path from there. And it's a really nice alias to have. Now, I'm telling you this, and you might be like, ooh, that sounds like black magic. It's not. If we look inside of our Vite config, in fact, this is the default, to be honest, but I'll just stick it to say la vie, view. You'll see here that there actually is an alias being defined from Vite that says, hey, this is the at symbol. And what I want you to do is automatically put the file URL path to this dot slash source directory. And so what this means is you can configure it to whatever you want. It doesn't have to be at, but that does happen to be that happens to be a convention for a lot of applications. So the at symbol is there for you if you want to simplify the fact that you don't have to navigate now. Wait, what folder am I in and what's going on? Now that we have that, let's keep on going. So first thing first, what kind of routes do we have? Well, we're going to want to have a path for the home page. And so what component is that? We're going to want to do the component for home page. All right. So here we have home page, but we need to import that. So we have home page from, let's use our handy alias, components slash homepage dot view. And that's super convenient because I don't have to think where am I inside of the directory. It's super, super nice. Great. There was a comment in the audience that we moved it to views. It's not in components anymore. And that's correct. So that would break. But um, from the not having to think about what directory I'm in, that is helpful. There we go. Look, everything's showing up. OK. Then we have a path here. And let's just go ahead and copy this block real quick, just to make this a little bit easier. So we have login, and then we have user. OK, user page, great. And then we have user page, login page. And this is how most of us would probably do this part. Log oh, login is an L, and then P or U for user page. There we go. Save. Great. And then what we can do now is go inside of our app.view, for say la view. And rather than having this all be managed now with the current page and whatnot, we can actually make this a lot simpler. So what we're going to do here 
is we're going to go ahead and rather than put the component here, we're just going to do, uh, let me delete it first to show you that everything was working. Okay, great, it's gone. Now we're just going to put router view. And just like that, we have our pages. Your routes are all defined to go to home page. Yes, they are all defined to go to home page. Good catch. So we don't, we no longer need to track any of these things because this is being now managed at the router level. So in case you've seen duplicates, you should not have duplicates. So there you go. Don't need that component. In fact, we don't need any of this because all of this is doing is trying to do all the programmatic things that View Router will do for us out of the gate. So I can actually just wipe out this whole thing. And then we can no longer reference any of these things. Let's comment that out real quick. And then I think we're good as far as that goes. Now we need to actually have the ability to switch it out. So rather than use the A tags, we're going to go ahead and use our anchors, uh, use our router links. Sorry, one, two, router link. Then we have this right here, one, two, router link. Then we no longer have to worry about the click and handling that and preventing that. So all that can be deleted. Clean that up. And then instead of the href, what we're going to do is we're going to move that and then just do two. And then to what? And then we can go ahead correctly, then go login, user, home. Once we have that, there you go. Everything works just as you would expect. Okay. So before I wrap up this exercise, though, the one thing I do want to show you, if you go back to the boilerplate that we created with View 3, um, and this time adding the fact that we have to do, here's the router. Okay. You might notice something right here, which is kind of interesting, in that you can actually write a function where the component is in order to dynamically import that view. And the reason this is a powerful technique, while relatively simple, is that it will then automatically generate a separate build chunk that will lazy load when it's being loaded. Because the problem right now, if we look at how we're actually loading the route right now in main.js, in say la view, we're importing every single component that the app might possibly need to route to. And if that app gets pretty large, that's a lot to break apart. So generally speaking, it's considered best practice to go ahead and just like we see inside of this router.js, not this one, we're looking at this one, to go ahead and just import the path directly. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for us so that we can actually have that as a record of that. So again, rather than have these two up here, because we don't know when users are going to log into that, we know that home page needs to be imported. So that cannot be dynamically imported. But everything else, that has potential. So we can go ahead and drop the imports here. And the way it works is it's a function that returns this path. And that's what that looks like. Delete that, delete that. I think I had that right. Let me just make sure one more time. Oop, that one's not easy to read. Import, yeah. So, oh, I mistakenly did that the other way. It is a function that does the import here and imports the specific path, just like that. And so again, we can see user experience wise, as far as development goes, you probably wouldn't really know the difference, but this optimization can help a lot when it comes to your apps going forward. So for this next other part that I want to cover with View Router, which is a very common scenario, is we want to talk about programmatic navigation. Because it's one thing to just click a link, but programmatically speaking, we need to be able to say, hey, when a user does this thing, check these things and then send them off to a specific page. Very common. So I wanted to make sure we actually covered that as well as dynamic route with params. So if we take a look back inside of our playground, and then let's go ahead and run that now. Great. This is good. OK. Home to hide that. Playground's good. Hide this so we don't get confused. Great. OK. So at this point, what if we wanted to do something like when local count is greater than 200, it will go ahead and migrate them to Pokedex. That's like a basic chain that we could do. 
So how might that work? Well, if we look at our basic counter app, base counter, there you go, here we go. Inside of here, oh, this one's not using script setup just yet. Do we have one that's already using script setup? OK, that's totally fine. Here's what we'll do. We will basically then do it inside of here, just so that it's easier for people to read. OK, so inside of here, we're going to import that count, that local count from our uh, composable that we did earlier. So let me go ahead and grab this use count. And we're going to drop it over here for our app. And then we say const count store equals use count. And then we can say do, do, do. We can render out underneath here the h2 that says count store dot local count. So what did it not like this time? Do, do, do. Ah, does the composable? All right, hold up. Let me just make sure we'll switch all this to the alias to make our lives easier. There we go, 50. See, file names, no longer routes. You don't have to worry about it anymore with the at symbol. Great. OK, so what we want to do is we want to be able to say, when the count goes to 50, or we increment it, right? Let's go ahead and actually check. And if we want, we're going to go ahead and navigate the user. So what we're going to do is we're going to import the watch helper method from view. And so we're going to watch what? We're going to watch count store dot local count. And then what we get from this is a function where we get the value of it. And I believe I can just do it like this. And so now to show that this works, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and increment it. Uh, oh, I need to increment count because this is a local one. So actually, let's do global count just to make our lives a little bit easier here. So global count. Save. There you go. There's your 200. We can increment global count here. It goes to 1,200. And then there you go, 1,200 up top. And you'll notice that our value is being printed out at the bottom, as we would expect. So that's nice. So it's being watched. So what we want to say is that, well, if value is greater than 1,200, what do we want to do? We want to navigate user to Pokedex. That's the pseudocode. How do we do that? Well, because we're inside of Composition API, and to be honest, I think this is tends to be the easier way going forward to use with view libraries, and this is why we're going to do it this way, we're going to go ahead and import something from view router. And so if you're in the options API, for those from view 2, you might re remember something like this dot router dot push. That should look pretty familiar. But there's no this context inside of Composition API. But what we do get, though, is we get helper methods. Helper methods are basically the name of the game when it comes to view 3. So from view, view router, what do you think we called it? Well, it is use router. Because what are we doing? We're basically going to call the router. So how do we do that? Const router equals use router. So we're very explicit in what we're calling. And then here, we can go router.push what slash Pokedex. And so then we refresh this now, and we go ahead and go global, global, swapped to Pokedex. That's it. That's programmatic navigation. Um, main thing being that what do you do? You make sure you get the router from view router that you can basically, just like we did from the composable. It's a little helper method that says, hey, we're going to help you do some stuff with the route. You instantiate it here on line 10. And then inside of either a watch or wherever you need to use it, it really is just router.push. And the push uh, semantics are, uh, come from as well from, I think, the web history MDN. So again, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. This should feel familiar. There's a router not replace. Yeah, there's replace as well. So if you go into the view router docs, um, which again, I highly recommend checking out when you start to dive into that stuff, there's a ton of things that you can do in terms of programmatic navigation. So we see there's push, uh, do, 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 do. You can replace the location. You can even use traversing history with the go. Again, we're not going to play around with all this, because this is something you can dive into as it makes sense. What happens when you want to look at a dynamic value? In other words, when you, when you can't predict the route that you're going to. So take, for instance, when we go into Pokedex, and Pokedex has different Pokemon, right? That is the way the Pokedex works. What if we wanted to actually render out the different Pokemon, but we wanted to do things based on the parameter in the URL? So an example of this might be if we're looking at the Pokedex page, and you say, OK, theoretically, what I'd like to be able to do is also then go to a page that goes to like, go to slash Pokedex slash 1. And that should call the first Pokemon. In other words, this part is dynamic, because what we don't want to do is define 1.view, 2.view, and et cetera. 
And so how might that actually work? Well, when it comes to that, what we're actually looking at is around the idea of dynamic param IDs. So the way this works is we go inside of our router, uh, inside of Playground. And what we have here is we have a path here that's slash Pokedex slash with the colon ID. And this is what tells it that it's going to be dynamic. And then from here, we can then say, let's create a Pokemon page, because this would fetch a specific Pokemon in this particular case. Let me ask us see this, and then let's just say Pokemon. And for now, we'll just say number 100 to show that it'll, it's, it's wrong as far as the URL is concerned. And then we'll just do a component, and this time we'll just import the path at views slash Pokemon page dot view. Save. OK. So to prove that this works, we're going to go ahead and on the Pokemon Pokedex page right here, we will have a router link that goes to slash Pokedex, and this time we'll do slash 20, just to show something different. Go to Pokemon number 20. OK, we see that here. And if we click on this, you'll see that it does correctly jump us over to the page. But what we need is we need to be able to pull in the dynamic data. right? How does that work? Well, when you used to do it in Vue 2, the way you would do it in Options API, and you could still could, is you do this.route.params. That's usually what you would reach out for. But in an effort to get you all practicing with Composition API and seeing what an alternative form might look like, what might you reach for? Probably a helper method, right? So we have something called use route, because it's from view router. Then we can say const route equals use route. And then before we do anything, let's just log that out real quick and show you what we get. Uh, oh, this is the Pokedex page. I need to go back. So on the Pokedex page, you'll see now that if we expand this out to the target, it has a bunch of stuff, actually. Params, name, meta. And then if you broke it down to like query stuff, there's a whole ton of stuff under there that you can unpack. But the one we care about is going to be the parameters. So let me go ahead and actually move this use route, because the where we need it is not the Pokedex page. We need it on the Pokemon page. So let me drop this over here instead. And so now let's go ahead and go to Pokemon 20. And now we'll notice, actually, if we refresh, there we go. We have our route being rendered. And we look at our params, you'll see that we have an ID of 20 in here. And where does this ID come from? This ID comes from what we named right here inside of our path. That's where it's actually being defined. So what we get, if we want, we say route.params.id. And if we do that and refresh the page, you'll see there it is, 20. That's all it takes. And so now you can, your, imagining and, your, your imagination can go from here. You could go to the Pokemon API. And then when you load the page, you can go ahead and fetch the right Pokemon, get its attributes, render it to the page. But for the sake of conciseness, we're just going to go ahead and show that here, just like this, route.params.id. And then just like that, you now have a dynamic page that can take any argument. And then however you see fit, you can programmatically set up else conditions, uh, if else, whatever not, to render the right stuff to your users. What about params for parent routes? OK, so the question here is around params for parent routes. So what you're saying is that like, if it's like with, so basically, let, let's sketch this out real quick. Are you saying something like, if Pokedex had then, like, on top of ID for the Pokemon, there was like an additional thing for like element? So then you might be on like an element page and you want to look at your ID params? Potentially. Yeah. So I believe the moment you do the, the route, basically, um, you should basically get everything that comes as a part of that route. And so this goes beyond the scope of like the fundamentals for view router. But there's even things like nested views and all those things that we can play around with. So you should be able to get the parent from that path without any problem. And that's why it would be a good practice, for example, not in your router.js to say, to define another route that uses the same parameter like name. Like you wouldn't want to be like ID ID. So I think that would actually probably, I'm almost certain that would break view, view router because it would be confused. And so in that particular case, that's where it's important to be just specific about what that parameter name is. And then the route should contain all of those parameters correctly um, appended into that object. So you said nested routes. Could you have like, Region was the thing you were saying. Yeah. So like region slash na region ID or region name. And yep. then underneath that, have the Pokedex for that region and then have a Poke Pokemon page that yeah. has the parameter on that. 
We can. And so it's not part of this exercise, but it, since this is a question, I do want to show this for the nested. If we look at the docs right here and we look at nested routes, the thing about nested routes is it's easy to think of it like what we just did, because you see here, user Johnny profile, right? You're like, didn't we just do this? Polkadoc, Polkadex slash Pokemon. This is different, because a nested view means that you have a router view inside of a router view, meaning the rest of the page stays the same, and just that one section of the page changes based on the URL. So as you can see here, inside of this example, let me blow it up a lot, is that the user page out here, which is the shell, which is slash user, is currently bringing in the Johnny child, right? So it'd be user Johnny. But the nested view here is for the profile and the post. And so you can almost think of it like tabs, where you don't want the whole page to re-render if you click on post for Johnny. You want everything else to stay the same. You just want to switch the tab that's inside of it. And so nested views are basically this concept that without having to re-render the entire page, you can just render a portion of it and have that update based on the URL. And so that can be highly performant as well when it comes to doing things for your app. So I know that it's funny that nested views have be, like, sort of had a resurgence lately in the discussion, but this has been in view for quite a while. But I do want to make you all aware of it so that if you ever find that you're like, oh, everything else needs to change, or sorry, everything needs to stay the same except for this one part when the URL swaps, nested views or nested routes, check this out. This will solve your problems. What I want you to do is on Sela View, go ahead and the user page, we had a bunch of users. Go ahead and just make those things links that you can click so you can go to their specific ID and then show that user's basically data. And uh, don't worry about the nested routes bonus, but I mean, if you happen to have the time, feel free to check that out. The other part of the exercise I totally forgot is that you know how there's a login page? Basically, what I want you to do is just check to make sure that the user types an email in there, just something basic. You don't need a full regex thing. Maybe check like that the characters are greater than three and include an at symbol. And if, it, if that happens, then when they click Login, allow the user to navigate over to another page. So whether you want to navigate to the user's page, practice that pro programmatic navigation. So the way this is going to work is we're going to go inside of our C'est la vie. C'est la vie. I keep messing that up, actually. Uh, CD C'est la vie, and then run dev. Looks like we're good. And then inside of Chrome, boom, there we are. Uh, we're, oh, 74. I just realized, because I have two running. Great. OK. So the exercise here was to go into the login, and let's start by programmatically navigating it somewhere. So inside of our source, inside of our views, we're going to look at our login page. And all right, we're just basically going to do a quick check to make sure we actually have an email. So again, we're not doing anything too fancy here. We're just going to V model to something called, let's say, user, or let's say, email input is what I'll call it. And so I'll import a ref from view, because this is something we want to track. And so we'll say const email input equals ref. That is an empty string by default. So to show that this works, though, I'll do one, two, three. You'll notice that it does populate up. So that's fine. We know that it's working. The thing we need to check, though, is that when the user clicks here, and we'll call this login, so const login, we need to actually make sure that email input actually has the thing, right? So log test. Whoops, not test. So we'll log email input dot value. And so to show what I mean by this is we can see here if I go Ben at Ben, then we can continue with email. You'll see that that is actually being rendered out as expected. OK, great. So now all we need to do is just do a simple check to say if email dot input dot value, let's say, so this is a string, right? So I think we actually can do that includes an at symbol and the email input dot value dot length is greater than three. We'll just keep the logic simple here. Then we'll say valid user, else log invalid user. OK, let's see if that works. We have test, nothing's working, at, huh, nothing is working. Why? Because, well, we didn't click on anything. There you go. That's a valid user. If we just do test, invalid user, because there's no at symbol. But then we just do at by itself, also invalid user. OK, easy enough as an email test. Again, just so you know, this is not production grade quality uh, email validation. Just know that this is just for demo purposes. We have our valid user. So what do we want to do? We want to navigate it. We want to navigate our users to a page. How do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and import our use router from view router. Then we will go ahead and construct it by calling it our router using useRouter. 
And then all we need to do is inside of here, we'll just leave the console log, because that's nice to have for now, is do router.push and let's go to user, just like that. And so, whoops, something's not happy. What's going on? Well, I have typos up here at the top. That's what's wrong. So let's save here. Much better. OK, so we do the T, and then we continue with email. Nothing's happening. Great. Test at email.com. Continue with email. Look at that. Programmatic navigation, easy peasy with the composition API in that we imported it, used the router to set it up, and then we just push the user once we had fulfilled our logic um, for the app. OK. The final thing that we need to do is that we need the user to be able to actually look at different things. So when we click on it, they'll actually be able to at least see user one, user two. Or in this case, we actually might even just want to show their name. Let's just do that. So the way we might do that is we'll go inside of our routes. So I think it's in, oh, currently we're managing it inside of here. That's totally fine. So we'll, we'll basically create a user page. Uh, oof, looks like I didn't use name that quite well. So what I'm going to do for now, just to make it a little bit easier, is I'm going to call it user detail page. But you should note that user page is slightly semantically inaccurate. So the H1 here will be our user. Um, so I'll just say username so that's easy to see that we switched pages. And then we have our path to slash user slash. And then this time we'll, we'll call the variable name instead of ID to show you how that works. Component will import what? We'll import slash views slash user detail page dot view. Save. OK, to show that this works, we'll go inside of our user page. And inside of each of these loops, rather than just having the card here, what we're going to do is we're going to actually wrap it here inside of a, of a router link to. And so the router card will just go inside of our router link. And where we're going to route it to is going to be a JavaScript. We're going to dynamically bind this one, because we need to dynamically create it, which is going to be slash user slash. And then we'll do the uh, basically user.name. This might be a little bit tricky, though, because I know there's spaces in here. OK, so if we refresh this, ooh, did not like that. Uh, user, oh, right, because the loop is in here. So my mistake, we actually cannot do it at this level. Uh, at least the way it's currently architected, I would need to actually go inside of user card in order to actually do this. So inside of here is where then we would actually then say, OK, wrap this in a router link. And inside of here is where we can say to ES6 template slash user slash uh, user dot name. Just like that. There you go. We see our link showing up now. Wonderful. So if we inspect all of these, we'll see that we can see slash Leanne Graham. Great. So if we click on it, we should see, oh, we are correctly being navigated to username. So that's good. But we need to actually make sure this shows up in a way that actually takes into account the actual user's name. So how do we do that? Well, we need to get info on the route. So where are we going to reach for? Reaching for use route from view, uh, view router. And then we'll initialize the route by calling use route. And then we can basically log the route.params to show you what's happening here. And you'll notice that inside of here, we have a name because that's what we named it inside of our uh, routes. So now that we have that, great. All we need to do now is just swap it out to go route.params.name. Save. And there we have it. So we go to user again, Irvin Clementine. It works. Question. What if you wanted to pass that user object to the profile page and have additional information that is not on that user's list page? That is a great question. So what I want you to check out for this, so the question here is around the fact that what if you actually want to pass that user information to the route, right? Some sort of uh, props passing, that kind of stuff. Uh, I believe it's in, I believe it's actually in the program. Oh, passing props to route components, literally this page. So this will allow you to do kind of some interesting stuff regarding how you pass parameters. But what's interesting, too, is that if you turn certain routes as props true, 
it'll actually drop the parameters and certain things as props to the page. So you don't even need to use use route. It'll actually be passed as a prop to the component, which again takes a little um, wrapping your mind around. So it's one of those kind of call it intermediate to advanced techniques that if it's something you're looking for, take a read of this document, see if it fits your scenario. But generally speaking, what we've been doing thus far regarding just grabbing the route.params ID, that fulfills, I would say, a good 70 to 80% of the use cases out there, which is what I wanted to make sure that we covered. Are you going to get burnt by deep linking to that page? Deep linking to the page. Passing in props, an yeah. object to, in the, uh, through the link. Yep. And you deep link to it yep. without having visited the page before that. Yeah. Does that burn you? That, that act, yep, so that's where the state management can be very tricky. So that's why it, you have to be careful when you're passing that kind of stuff around, what stuff is already accessible. Because earlier during the exercise, um, if you all notice, when I loaded the home page for Sailor View, the five users actually don't show up. Um, so if I refresh this page, you'll notice it's gone. And the reason for that, it's not a bug, actually. It's how it's intended, because user page is what's actually loading the data. And so unless you visit the user page, Homepage has no idea what these five things are. And so as far as the state's concerned, the composable is concerned, it doesn't exist. So um, knowing where to import, how to make sure they stay in sync, that's part of the puzzle that, uh, of the game that we play. So we're going to talk about global state management with Pina. Pina, if you don't know, I believe is French for pineapple. And basically, it is a successor to Vuex. So if you've heard from the React community about Redux patterns and those kind of things, Pinia is the evolution of that because Vue did take inspiration from like the Redux pattern, so we had Vuex for a very long time. But there were some ergonomics with it that made it kind of tricky to work with over the long period of time. And so Pinia with the Composition API has basically been the evolution of Vuex. OK, so in terms of Pinia, let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, Because global state management typically is a fairly complicated topic. So first of all, be sure to pin their docs, pinya.vuejs.org. Once again, this is an officially supported view library. And it's got this cute little mascot, which I need to get some stickers of. And basically, uh, Pinya, funny enough, was started out as just like an experiment that Eduardo, uh, also known as Postva, who actually wrote View Router, um, was kind of experimenting with how we might reinvent Vuex. And so he kind of came up with this idea, and it's gained a lot of popularity. And, so that is, and thus, it is now the official one. OK, so to show it in action, what we're going to go ahead and do is on the playground, I'm going to go ahead and just install it right now. So install npm install pina. And so once again, let's go and see how we know that we're using it. We can go ahead and look inside of the package.json. And as we see here, we'll see view router and we see pina now. Now, the only thing we need to do before we need to continue using it, though, is just like the router, we need to tell Vue that we're using this plugin basically. And so inside of our main.ts, we get the opportunity to now create, basically, a Pina instance. How does that work? It's just like view router, actually. So we can import create Pina from Pina. And so just to show you that ag again, this time it'll actually autocomplete. There you go. Now that's right. And so remember that multi-line thing I was telling you about? This is where this is super helpful. Because we can say const Pina equals create Pina. And then after that, after we use the router, we can just say app.usePinia. There you go. And just like that, you have Pinia enabled on your app. So how does Pinia actually work, right? Creating stores and stuff, this is stuff, again, is typically very complicated. But I think I've set you all up to kind of see what it's actually like. What we're going to do is we're going to create a folder called stores. Because what are these, after all, what are we trying to track? We're trying to track stores of data. So what are we creating? We're creating a directory for stores. Why? Because when it comes to global state management, they're typically referred to as stores of the data, of the actions we need to take in order to make changes to those data stores. So let's go ahead and inside of this playground this time, we notice that we have this count store over here. Let's go ahead and recreate this over here. So I'm going to do count store, and I'm just going to do it in Pascal case just to make it look different. And what does that look like now inside of Pinya? Well, let's go ahead and define the store. And so if we look at the docs here, we're going to do things very composition API-like. We're going to import define store from Pinia. And then what we're going to do then is export a const of use whatever the count store or whatever the store name is. So use count store is typically what it's, like, what it's called. So use 
appended to this. And then we call the define store in here. Now the difference is, is one, we first start by defining how we want like the store to be labeled. So I usually just call it count store, like whatever it's already called inside of the file name. And then after that, you get an object that you get to configure. And inside of here, it's going to look kind of familiar. So one, you get a state option to return data. There is a getters option. And there is an actions option. And so you might think, this, this looks familiar. This looks a little bit like options. And it does, in the sense that it's providing you structure at how you manage your state. Because what we saw with Composition API earlier is that you can kind of wrangle together whatever you want. But this, especially when we think about global source, it's actually useful to have a convention for everyone to follow. Because uh, you don't really don't want it to be like the wild, wild west when it came, comes to people managing and accessing data. And something else that you might notice too, though, missing from here, especially for my fellow VUX users, there are no mutations. And that is probably one of the best things about Pinia is that when we have something in here, like count zero, and we want to increment the count, all we got to do is go this.count++, plus plus, and it takes care of everything for you. No more creating this separate thing that's like a mutation that requires you to call an action, and then the mutation is basically redundant of the thing that you're trying to do. That's all gone. And so we think of this another way to alias it, just to provide the mental model, data computed methods. That's what you have. And so if we compare this over now to the counselor that we originally sort of scaffolded ourselves together inside of the composables, you'll see here how different the code is in the sense that this is just kind of however I feel like and however I chose to write it. But you get an additional benefit, actually, that I'll show you in right here. So let's say, let's add that increment amount to 80. And then this one is going to be plus equal this dot increment amount, because this should look familiar to our base counter set that we've done before. And then we'll have a double count here that will be a function that receives the state as an argument. And we can just return state dot count times 2, just like that. And then I mess something up, because I use the comma instead of a period. Boom. OK. How is this any different than what we just did? So we have this right here, and I'm going to leave this to the right so that we have this as a reference. Now, inside of our base counter this time, what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and actually import this store. So import use counter store, or use count store, it looks like. There you go. It actually detected it properly. So we are getting some type auto completion, which is super nice. And this time, we'll do a const new count store which will be the use count store like this, just like that. And then we're going to return new count store, just like that. OK, so what do we get out of this? One, I'm going to show you what it looks like um, when we actually use it. So let me bring that back over. We're here. This is great. OK, so first thing first is that now that you have your count store what you actually end up finding out is that when we look at something like third counter version, so when we look inside of here, you're going to notice that we get auto completion here. It actually can detect properties on that store now. So you get a lot of auto completion out of this. So in other words, if we take a look, increment is actually sitting right here. It actually knows that it's a property now. And so there's a lot of work being done underneath to help with the IntelliSense of what's going on when you're managing your code. And so here, we can do count, for example. And then as you can see, it's 0. But actually, very easily, if we added a button, we can just say new count store dot increment. And then new increment. And then you can see it just works. And the reason why I kind of preface this with how global stores are normally complicated, this should actually remind you of the composable we kind of designed ourselves. You have this thing called count store. Again, it learns from the options API. It takes the advantage of the option API by providing some structure, gives you the chance to manipulate it as you see fit. But then when you call it, it feels just as natural as using any other part of the data. Whereas in a lot of other state management that I've used before, there's usually a lot in terms of like going in to like fetch a certain thing, and then auto-completion becomes a bit of a pain. If you use Vuex, you knew that you had to type the string exactly a certain way to initiate a certain action. There was a lot of like opportunities for mistakes. 
But with this, it's easy for us to understand what's happening. And on top of that, I'm always a big fan of conventions, especially when it comes to debugging. We know that state management is notoriously difficult to do. And so if you take a look right here, you'll notice that another benefit you get by using Pinya is that you get this dev tool right here. And we can actually go ahead and start inspecting it and doing stuff just like you normally would want to do when you're debugging a large application. And the other thing that, again, it feels really natural as we do this right now is that unlike a global state management store like the way Vuex used to be, you used to have to intentionally namespace modules. In other words, you have to be like, from this global piece, only take this small piece and import it here. Only take this small piece and import it here. But then sometimes you still ended up with like importing everything at once, right? So Vuex stores became rather cumbersome and people had trouble with that. But with this new model of like a composable about Pinya, this is actually modular by default. You only import the stores you need where you need them. And so almost without even thinking about it, you've solved the performance bottleneck that might have naturally occurred in an enterprise grade app where you have the single, the singleton tracking global state, everyone just chucking stuff in there because they can, or it's the easiest thing to do. But now it almost is just as easy to go, wait, my functionality is about login. I'm going to create a login store. I'm not going to toss it in the global state. I'm going to actually think of it modular first. And the fact that it's namespace modular first, I think that's wonderful because it encourages us to use best practices without even realizing it. I think that's some of the best uh, sort of advancements that we can have when it comes to developer tooling. So for this exercise, what I'd like you to do is also get some hands-on experience just like you did with Vue Router. Go ahead and open up the Pinya docs for reference because once again, the docs are a great resource for helping to debug and learn more things about the library as you continue using it. Then go ahead and install Pinya onto the Cela Vue app and configure Vue to use it. Again, it should feel familiar based on what we just did with Vue Router. Go ahead and then create a stores folder and then go ahead and just create any kind of data store that you think makes sense for Cela Vue. Then once you create your first store, try to add some state, uh, getters or actions, and then finally, go ahead and call those things inside of your components. All right, so as always, if you have questions uh, for those watching online, please, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Let's go ahead and run through that. So the way we're going to do this is let's go ahead and restart. And this time, we're going to go ahead to the Cela view. And then we're going to install Pinia. That's the first thing we're going to do. Once we have that, then I can go ahead and run dev. So we can have that over here, which is great. OK, that's working now. So once you have Pinia installed, what you got to do is you got to configure it. So inside of, whoop, I'm in the wrong folder. Inside of Cela view for main.js, we have here, uh, this is where we're creating the view router. Let's then go ahead and find create Pinia app uh, functionality from Pinya. And so once again, to verify that, you can always check the autocomplete. I, I usually do like autocomplete because it just prevents the one-off typing errors, that I off, which you've seen me do uh, on this workshop. So once we have that, great. We can then, uh, OK, we have a bunch of router stuff here. Let me just collapse that. And then const Pinya equals create Pinya. And what are we going to do? App.use Pinya. All right. So now that we have that enabled, we can go ahead and create our first store. So what we're going to do here, inside of our components, it looks like, honestly, the user store makes the most sense. So we can go ahead and do user store.js. And so we're going to go ahead and import define Pinia from Pinia. And then we're going to export our store, which is going to be a const of use user store. And we'll call the define, uh, oh, not define Pinia, my mistake, define store. We've already defined Pinia at the app level. Now we're defining a specific store. The store gets what? It gets two arguments. One, what are we going to call the store? Again, keep it simple. I like to keep it whatever the file name is. So it's user store. And then we get an option of what? We get the state, which is a function that returns an object. We get the getters. And we have the actions. OK. So what we can do if we take a look at our code is inside of our views, inside of user page, you can see that we're doing quite a bit here as far as uh, the data goes. Now, we're importing it currently from Composables. So let's migrate that over. That's what we're going to do in this particular one. So inside of Composables, you'll see that user list is just a ref. Well, if that's the case, all we got to do here is to show you side by side. In our user store, is add a user list and then just make it an array. 
And when we save that, now when we go inside of our user page, boop, rather than importing the user list like this, what we're going to do is we're going to import the use user store from, and then this should be from stores slash user store, just like that. And so again, let's just double check. I did get the right. I did get the right one. Wait, nope. Export cons use user store. That should be the right one. We'll find out just momentarily. Okay. So then we will set up the store by what? By calling our function. So cons user store equals use user store, and then we'll go ahead and save that. And that looks good. Okay, good. Now it's actually being fetched correctly. That's good. So now that we have the user store. We can get rid of this dot value, no longer that. It's just user store dot user list, just like that. So let's see if that actually worked. If we refresh, go to the user page, we'll see something is not working. OK, why? Because guess what? We're looking at user store dot user list, but inside of our template, you'll see that we're only referring to user list directly. So again, um, one of the things I like about the modular way is that it's very clear about where things are coming from. Now, for those who really care about destructuring, making your code shorter, there are ways to do it. We're not going to cover it right now because I do think using it out of the box like this has its advantages for being declarative and easy to understand. So now that we save this, go ahead and take a look at how that looks. And there we go. Everything is showing up as expected. Now, the other things we can possibly do with this is we want to go ahead and practice getting the getters, right? So we were doing that on the home page right here. So we go in the app page. We had the ability to, oh wait, no, home page is here. We were looking at something called short user list. Well, what we can do instead is actually take this part and we can shorten the code by saying, OK, we're going to take this calculation that we've done and we're going to go to the user store. And inside of our getters, we're going to get a short user list. Short user list. And we can use an arrow function for this where we'll get the state and it'll return state.userList, and we don't need the value. And this is the equivalent of our computed property. Now that we have this in here, we can go back over to our home page, which is right here. And we can actually now just remove this in its entirety. And we can then say, instead of import user list, we're actually going to import use user store. There you go. It's auto completed. Fantastic. Const user store equal use user store. We were calling that. And now that this is available to us, we can then say user store dot short user list save. So now we go back to the home. Oh, there we go. User home. There we go. We have our short list. It's all kept in one place. Now, one last thing before we wrap this up is that we need to actually verify how do we do actions, right? And so there was a great question earlier regarding the fact that if we look at user store, you might be tempted to actually make this part some sort of asynchronous functionality, right? Like, I want to fetch this, return it into this value. But when it comes to setting up state and managing that with composables, my recommendation for doing that is to always start with the initial empty state. That's where that should start. And then later on, when you're writing code, you'll have that oh, go ahead and overwrite and populate it. But for now, always try to avoid the async stuff in here. Keep that just to the standard data types. However, what we can do, though, is inside of our actions, this is where we can write that fetch functionality. So where is that currently living right now? My guess is it's on user page. And sure enough, look at this, async function fetch users. Let's just steal that entire thing away, because it doesn't, it doesn't need to be here. So let's grab that over into our user store and drop that in. Now, this current syntax won't work. Why? Because this is async function when you're defining it outside of an object. So what we need to do is actually make fetch users an async function like this. And then let me try to save it. It'll format itself a little bit better, which is great. And then there we go. And then you can see we get the fetch here. We get this response, and then we get the response. But rather than just return it in this particular case, because in this scenario we're saying that this function is specific to the store, uh, actually, you know what? Take that back. We're going to leave it like this. I'll show you the two ways on why. So now we have the fetch users here. How are we going to use it? Well, inside of our user page, we've gone ahead and we said, OK, we have the user store. So what can we do? We can do uh, user store do, 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 dot fetch users. So that should do the trick. User.userList equals await user store dot 
do user stores, fetch users, great. So now if we come here and refresh, you'll see now that when we come over and refresh, everything is working still. Now, there's also value in case that you're like, oh, well, that's, I don't want to have to manually fetch it. I want to just like, whenever this is called, go ahead and update this. So an alternative model, there's no right or wrong, it just depends on what your use case is. If you go inside of our user page, rather than having to call user list and assign it, what we could do, theoretically, is we just want to call user store that fetch users. That's all we want to do. But if we do that, nothing's going to happen. Why? Because currently, inside of our function, all we're doing is actually running the, oh, not that one, do, 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 do. user store, great. You see here, we're only returning the response. We're actually not doing much with it. So what we need to do instead is we need to refer to the user list. And so unlike the getters, which gets the state in an arrow function, because the actions really do require the entire context of the app, this is where the this context comes back into play. So that we can go this.userList equals response. And so now once we refresh that, you'll see everything appears as we expect. And this is now, again, it's tightly coupled, but at the same time, this might be okay in this particular instance because this is the global store. So that's actually probably what we want to do. When we fetch users, we want the entire global state to update. So at basically, I would say if you're writing your or composing your functionality in this way, I think it does make sense to tightly couple. In the event that fetch users has nothing to do with this, unless for, for whatever reason it's a separate type of functionality, that's where it might make sense as just a composable that you import into your store that does something entirely separate that then you can you know, better break up and compose your code. So we're at the tail end of all this. Obviously, there's a lot more to cover as there's an entire world and ecosystem out there. So some of the questions that have come up during this uh, include things like, what about things like design systems, component libraries? Well, you're just in luck because recently, Vuetify, which is the official library for doing view components with material design, that has actually been released. Um, so if you go to Vuetify.js, I want to say it's .org. Nope. Vuetify. Oh, .com. I messed up. Uh, this is, I think, the most popular component library that the Vue ecosystem has when it comes to a really well-maintained team that helps to make sure everything's kept up to date. As you can see here, they have wonderful documentation that if you come in here, you can actually take a look at the different components. So you know, earlier, I was showing someone the tables down here. So you could take a look at something like a simple data table that automatically takes in data. It, all, it looks beautiful. You can sort it without doing any additional work. This is the kind of thing that you might want to check out if you don't have time to build your own design library and that kind of thing. So Vuetify, highly recommend it, checking that out. The other library I just want to do a quick show and tell demo on is if you haven't heard of this, this library, ViewUse, is a phenomenal library. It is a bunch of wrappers around basically browser APIs. So things that you might commonly want to do, say, I don't know, you want to be able to do something with a clipboard? This should look familiar. It says, oh, this is a use clipboard function that we can import. And when you import it, it'll actually basically copy over whatever it is as like a V model and whatnot, and just it just works. And so to show you just as a, a sort of show and tell on this, something that we often want to do when it comes to apps is use local storage. And if you've never done that from scratch, it's a pretty good API to use, but there is a bit to do as far as like manually configuring that in addition to managing reactive state. So one of my favorite functions is the use storage here with Pinia. So if we look at Pinia use storage with view use, you can see that, uh, let's see, view use. OK, here we go. This is a blog post that actually shows how it would work. So basically, if I scroll down here, you'll notice that inside of this to-do list, you have this one line right here that allows you to import from use storage. And what it does is basically creates that local storage key. And then every time it's being updated, when Pinia loads, it will know with view uses help to check the local storage first to see if there's new data. If there's already existing data, it'll actually start from the local storage and not from this initialized value. And so what you end up getting is this really elegant coming together of your view use functionality with your reactive data inside of your view app. And so other ones that are really fun that you might want to check out as well is the color preference, like color mode. And so what you see here is that what this is doing is that it's basically a reactive property that allows you to easily toggle the state of the theme of your app. 
And then all this, there's so much stuff in here because basically what they've done is taken a bunch of browser APIs and made it really easy to integrate inside of your view app. So definitely highly recommended as one to check out. The other final thing that I want to shout out is regarding transitions in Vue. So as we know, creating good user experiences, that's a really important part of you know, making things easier for users to follow. And so we don't have time to go into detail on this, but basically there are built-in components called transition and transition group that help you manage how things are being attached as they exit. So the most common example that I'll show right now, because you can check out the docs, but the one that I love to show is the one for transition group, because this is the one that I think we do a lot. So if I go down into transition, transition group, a lot of us render lists. Rather than have them blink in like this, you can also have them move in a way that's even smoother. So you see here, this actually allows you to shuffle stuff. And all that is being done, how? It's being done by wrapping your, basically your component inside of this transition group. And there's a little bit of CSS that happens there, but I'll leave you to check out the docs to get inspiration from that. But just know that this is built into the library so that if you want to try playing around with it, making the users easier to like, track things, this is also where the keys are very important. Because as you can see, when we're doing things like shuffling here, Vue needs to be able to know where the, which element it is, where it needs to go as it's moving stuff around. So this is another uh, bit that you know, if you all are developing for your apps, definitely check out the transition group and transition for ways to enhance your user experience. OK, with that, I think the final thing we want to end on is deploying your app. So we're going to take a whole couple minutes to take a look at that. So when it comes to deploying your app, if you do it the standard way, you usually have to do like an FTP server, and you've got to build this thing, right? Because after all, if we take a look at our Sela View app, this is not something that we can just drop on a server and it would just work. We need to actually build the thing. So the way this works, if you take a look at your package.json inside of Sela View, you'll see that there's actually a build command that we can run. So let's go ahead and do that, shall we? So it, inside of here, we go to say love you, and npm run build. And oh, right now there's a bunch of stuff in there, so let me clean that up real quick. Dun, 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 dun. OK, npm run build. There we go. OK, and what that will build for you is a dist folder, which stands for basically to distributed folder. And inside of here, now this should look like something you can actually deploy where you have your index.html. You can see that there's generated hashes for your different assets for CSS, JavaScript, managing those things. And you might notice that, look, those, HTML, those chunks that we did when we did the routes, here they are. They're already parsed out for us it, because the bundler already did that for us. Now, of course, deploying this can be done a number of ways, but I'll just be showing you uh, how to do this in sort of a Git-based format rather than just dropping it on the server. And so all this will take, uh, so this is, I guess, a shout out for the company I work for, Netlify. So if you have a free account, this will work fairly easily. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go ahead and log in to my account. And what we're going to do is just we're going to create a new site. And so the reason this is really nice is because what you're doing here is you're creating a pipeline that connects your GitHub repo that you're basically committing all your code to to your deployments. So basically, similar to the way you want it to watch for reactive things in Vue to do things, this will watch your repo, and when you make changes to it, it will then run new deployments. And so here, if we go complete intro, that should show up. Do, do, do. Once we give it a little bit. There we go, complete intro to Vue 3. And then we have a branch to deploy. And so since my currently, my Sela Vue really does need to be 16, uh, so I'm going to be deploying the 16 solution branch, but normally you'll be deploying your main branch. And then the base directory is, for me, going to be Sela View because we have multiple apps running inside of the project right now. So that's the specific one I want to build. And then we're going to run the command npm run build. And the directory, though, we have to remember is what's actually being outputted. It's a dist directory. And so that's what's being configured. And so, so once we run that, we get something that's pretty great. So for anyone who's used to do things in the old days where you did FTP servers, you had to manage a lot of caching, right? If you uploaded a CSS file, you had to manage like, oh, is the user going to get the right thing? Like, are they looking at the same version? And so oftentimes when you're debugging things, it's hard to figure out what's going on because what your user's seeing might not be what you're seeing. And so in the effort of like Git, uh, having Git deployments, basically, 
One of the things that Netlify does for you, and there are other companies that do this as well, so this is not the only one, is that you'll see here that it automatically generated for me a random URL that I could share with people. And so you can see here that all my functionality is in here, actually. So if I can continue with emails, it's live, which is great. That happened in a matter of seconds. And then the other thing, too, is that with the domain settings, it's pretty easy for us to then say, uh, let's go ahead and swap this out. And I'm going to call this Say La View. Granted, this is whoever gets to it first. But now that I've swapped it out, we can see now that when I open it up, there we go, saylaview.netlify.app, and it just works. And the beautiful part about this is not so much that it deploys, because again, there are many ways to deploy. It's the fact that it'll watch your GitHub repository. So in other words, if you go inside of the app.view right now for saylaview, and then instead, at the very top, we'll say something, let's see, from here, we'll say, this is a new message. And then I think I did a triple S on that. Let me fix that. And then if we commit this to our branch, so say la view here, and then ignore this stuff for now. One, two, three, four, five. Git commit feature add new message. And then I push on this branch. One of the things you'll see is that in the deploy, it'll actually, basically, there's a hook to watch GitHub repo. And it knows, hey, it's time to make another build. And so you can see here, it's going off, it's running, it's building the thing. That's fine. And so what's really cool about this, though, is that when it's running this build, it's basically doing an atomic deploy. So what that means is that it's completely separate from the previous deploy. Because that was a problem with a lot of enterprise systems, is that once you push a deploy, you weren't sure what the assets were. And so especially if you're having users with issues, it was hard to debug. And then let alone rollbacks, like it was kind of a nightmare to deal with all of that. That's OK. Our site is live. So we can see now, if I go over to my over here, you see, hey, look, this is a new message. It's right here. But again, in the effort of the atomic deploy model, what if your product manager is like, whoa, 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 we don't want this message. That is a bug. Well, typically, what you'd have to do is you have to get your engineers. You have to be like, hurry up. We got to figure out what's going on. And you got to push the right code, right? But no, what you can do because of the atomic deploy is we can come in here. If we can actually just say, you know what? We're going to go ahead and do, 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 do inside of here. We can publish this deploy instead. Whoop, not this one. There you go. Click Publish Deploy. And we publish it. And what you'll see now is that it's switched now from the latest commit. And what we have here, when we go back to our URL, voila. Users, everything's fixed. And so this is a kind of a, a this is basically, I would say, the modern way when it comes to thinking of deployment, in that, especially because we use a lot of Git versioning, why should our deploys also be versioned in a way that allows us to go ahead and whether it's split testing or ensure that we deliver the same things to our users, uh, this is just something that I wanted to show you all and how you could deploy your app with Vue.